into Control Hub that's going to be available for every WebEx user. How dope is that? I like that. All right, so, so G2, right. We're, we're, we're a little bit off on time here. Oh, okay. I, I know you maybe have a few other things, but you know, is there anything you want to bring up that we haven't talked about? Well, what I'd say is contact center is one area that is a huge area where we've actually made a ton of innovation as well, which is also built on the same platform as, as WebEx. And so we have made... We have built a product from the ground up called WebEx Contact Center, which is now on fire. It's growing at a very healthy rate. We've actually seen all of the AI innovation that we did in our core product that actually also works in Contact Center. And you now are able to go out and give agents AI tools so that they can have better answers. And you will never have to stay on hold and repeat yourself again is what the goal is. The, the, that's, that's the problem we want to solve. By the way, here's a stat that will completely blow your mind. On average, how long do you think people stay on hold in their lifetime? I think it's like two weeks. People two, stay on hold. Two in the Two weeks of your life is spent staying on hold, waiting for the contact center person to come in. We're going to try to solve that problem for you so we can give you back two weeks of your life. Hey, so where can they learn more, G2? Go to the Solution Center. You'll actually be able to see all these demos. Um, and uh, we are... So proud of the work that we've done. I think you're going to love it. We're going to make sure that we give you the best products in the market so that you folks can solve really important problems that are board-level initiatives in ways that are very elegant. I promise you, we're not stopping the work. This is the an innovation has only now started accelerating. We've got a great pipeline coming this year and the year after. Thank you again for taking the time. Let's give it up for G2 Patel. Awesome, G2. Thank you so much. I think they're going to move the chairs, but I now want to welcome up on stage our SVP for AppD and observability. Ronak, come on up on stage. The stage is yours, my friend. One day, a thriving e-commerce giant faced a nightmare. Their flagship application crashed during a major sale, leaving customers stranded. Panic ensued as the IT team dove into a sea of disconnected logs and metrics. Without a unified observability solution, they stumbled through the dark, struggling to pinpoint the problem. As the clock ticked, the damage spread. Customers vented their frustration on social media, tarnishing the brand's reputation. Departments pointed fingers, each blaming the other for the catastrophe. It could have gone worse. Who could have helped this customer? Cisco's full-stack observability comes to their rescue. All right, good morning. Great to be here with you all. A great set of announcements, G2, on Gen AI. So we'll, of course, talk about Gen AI and observability as well. But as you saw it in the video, the life of our IT administrator is really, really difficult. The way the applications are built are quite complex and very distributed across public and private crowds. And as an industry, we've not done a, such a great job in making sure we give you a unified understanding. In fact, what we've done it is we've given you a tool for every particular domain, creating the tool sprawls, which I'm sure you all are familiar with it. What does it do? It actually increases your total cost of ownership because you have more tools. But more importantly, you have ops team managing those tools. More importantly, what ends up happening is there is a finger pointing, friction in the team, and when outages like that happen, potentially it could affect your brand reputation, of course your revenue, and customer acquisition in some of those cases. In fact, some of you are already across this. When we surveyed, 80% of the participants said they really struggle in delivering that flawless digital experience, which your end users are expecting you to deliver. In fact, the participants also said, 56% of them, that they have 10 or more tools just for observability. G2 spoke about security. I'm not even including security tools for all you have it. And two-thirds of you are already across that you need a unified way to bring right set of telemetry and not a data dump so that you can make quick decisions 
when issues happen like that. This is where we strongly believe that observability is coming to us. You all have been a very long time Cisco customers. You do understand we have a great set of capabilities in a reach when it comes to networking, security, application, multi-cloud, and infrastructure. Our goal at Cisco is to bring that insight which we have it so that we can help you deliver that flawless digital experience which your end users are expecting us to do. Someone will ask me saying, where should our journey start on the full stack observability? I strongly believe that it needs to start from application first. Because once you understand the applications, it's easy to figure it out what segment of network, what security telemetry, what cloud telemetry you need it. And this is where we are focused on it with App Dynamics. In fact, what we've done it is we started with App Dynamics, we brought in the telemetry from Thousand Eyes when it comes to network insights. We've brought telemetry from some of our security capabilities like Kena and Panoptica and Telos and really got insights in a unified experience way. In fact, the place where we really differentiate is ability to tie the performance with the business KPIs. What are those business KPIs? It could be revenue, could be the inventory sitting in the checkout card because your end users are not able to check out. It could be a security because a lot of times security issue and may end up showing as a performance issues. So really tying it together, the performance issues with their business KPI is what we are going to be able to differentiate here. So as I was telling you, right, doing a just big data lake and a data dump is not the right approach. We're really looking at this as problems to be solved, jobs to be done, and really looking at the use case based approach. In fact, we've sort of thought about seven different use cases which we are shipping it today. Of course, we'll continue to expand as we go to the market with you all. But if you're an existing App Dynamics customer, you're still able to start your full stack observability journey from App Dynamics and able to exercise and leverage all those seven use cases. If you're on a modern application journey, you can start from Cisco observability platform and get to leverage all of these use cases. So I'm going to spend time talking about three use cases. The first one is the digital experience monitoring. So if you look at it, your end user's digital experience, what are those components it depends upon? Of course, it's the mobile applications or a browser where they're coming from. Is the big internet in the middle before they hit your application stack in your private or public data center? And those applications are doing access to the SaaS APIs. And there is the internet there as well. So this is where bringing in an intentional way the right set of the telemetry from all of the segments. We're able to give you that insights, which has helped some of our customers to triage issues in order of minutes instead of hours and days. Really, really powerful capability. And so this is the first incarnation where we've done it with App Dynamics and Thousand Eyes. App Dynamics has a great set of capability when it comes to understanding the business transactions, your database performance, your end users monitoring, bringing the networking latency jitter from thousand eyes into it. We're able to give you that insights, which really helps you deliver that flawless digital experience. But we are not stopping there. I talked about mobile application and the browser. We are actually building the capability which is referred as session recording or session replay. It's almost like you watching a Netflix movie about your end user's experience on your mobile application or a browser. And we are able to actually identify problematic sessions across millions of your users' sessions and really help you triage it out. Think about looking million movies, right? You'll be here forever but ability to identify what matters and where you should pay attention is where we're bringing this capability. The second use case is my favorite use case. This is around business risk observability. Remember I talked about business transactions. Bringing that insight from application perspective and bringing the security insights, we come up with a single score for you to watch your application's security posture. And that's what we call it business risk. 
This is where we are able to not only help you identify the vulnerabilities which exist in your applications, but what is important for you to prioritize it. So you can have your developers focus on things which they love to do and things which it helps your business to grow. So if you look at it, I talked about detecting the vulnerabilities and helping you prioritize based on the data access, PII information, that particular tier of your application has it. We also give you API security and a posture of it and catalog of API. G2 spoke about millions of ACL rules. It is true even with APIs, people who use those SaaS APIs, they may not be part of the company, and you may not even know what API and what's the security posture. So getting that catalog runtime is very, very important. We've also added capability around data security, where now we are able to figure it out, data lineage and data security leaks, especially if you're using Snowflake or Databricks. All of this, if you wanted to deliver it, or if you wanted to get insights, you probably needed a whole bunch of tools. What we've done it is, we've got that all as a single console where you can get that insights. And that's basically what is business observability. They have talked about sustainability. Extremely important initiative for all of us. But cost of the cloud is also another deep care about for our customers and our CIOs. We are able to give you insights in terms of the cost of running your application in the cloud from the most granular level to the course level, side by side with sustainability data. Really powerful capability here. But as I was talking about it, my session would not be complete if we didn't talk about what we are doing around LLMs and how we are making use of it. So of course we'll build the natural language interface for APIs or what we call it query language so that it's your ops teams have easier time to interact with the tool. But the really exciting thing is to build the AI assistance where it can help you autonomous way in a reasoning, and it's almost like having a human expert who's sitting next to you helping you troubleshoot. The capability of monitoring LLM and usage of those LLM APIs by your application. So this is in a case where your mobile applications or your banking application already uses LLMs, whether it's OpenAI or Anthropic models. Those APIs, think of it as a SaaS APIs. They do have outages. You do need to monitor it. They do cost a lot of money. So ability to get get the visualization of the performance of those APIs and the cost implication of it is available since summer of uh, this year. We don't charge for you that. But exciting thing is about the AI assistance. So let's look at a quick demo here, and I'm going to go really fast, but please do come to our booth to see a lot of these capabilities. So I'm going to ask the question to our favorite AI assistant. If you could play the video here. All right, there it is. So I'm going to ask the question saying, how is my Finn application doing? This application, the Gen AI assistant is going to figure it out. Actually, there were 6,000 plus users who were saying 10 second uh, latency or so. Not only that, it actually found out that there were crashes happening around in your applications around that time. It also figured it out that those applications were CPU bound. So, and, and it's saying, do you want to check on that? So once you say yes, it's going to actually check and saying, yes, it is a CPU bound. And unfortunately, there is no CPU limit set for that. What ends up happening is we don't have a CPU limit. It's going to exceed and crash the particular process. So now it's asking, saying, do you want to set the CPU limit? Once you say yes, it's actually going to say, look for it, saying, what's the average CPU usage for this particular application? Should you be using five-day baseline or one-day baseline? It says, looks like one-day baseline is a good choice. You say yes. It's actually going to set that baseline for that particular tier of application which was crashing. But more importantly, it's also going to figure it out, are there other instances like that? At this point, it's going to set up those health rules, so not only you can fix the problem you had it, but also proactively avoid other application hitting the same issue. So if I just take a step back and summarize it, it found out where the problem was, it found out where the root causes, and it helped you put the action on top of it so you can be predictive, proactive. That's the power of Gen AI. We are looking at to deliver this functionality 
in the mid of 2024. So stay tuned. We will start doing POC early next year. But a lot of this capability, which I talked about it around businesses observability, digital expense monitoring, some of our customers are already leveraging it and seeing a great set of benefits. So our goal at Cisco by building all of this capability around observability is to help you make you predictive proactive so you can solve some of the problems which you saw it at the beginning of the video, help you innovate faster, reduce the friction in your organizations, and really focus on things which matter most to you. So just with me, close your eyes for a few seconds and just imagine the possibility, what it can do for you with Cisco Full Stack Observability. With that, I would like to invite my friend Jackie who runs our customer success for APJC region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ronak. And thank you to all the customers and partners in the room and live for investing time to come to, to see us here today. You are shaping industries, and I couldn't be more excited to be here. Now, I've been in the APJC customer experience role for just over a year, and as some of you know, before that, I spent 20 years as a CIO, CTO, more recently CIO at Cisco, so I've been in your shoes. One thing I have learned in the last 12 months is that everyone in the CX organization is completely obsessed with making you successful. Now, let's talk about customer success for a second, and Dave talked about this earlier. What was happening behind the scenes? Well, the dream team, just like soccer, the dream team and Cisco had FIFA's back. They were actually cabling all of the stadiums across ANZ, and their job working with CX, customer experience, our services teams, was to make sure the hardware and software worked seamlessly as we broadcasted live to millions. Now, that's what I call customer success. It happens behind the scenes. It happens with all of you. Now, having been a customer of Cisco for a good 20 plus years, I can tell you that the portfolio that the entire team earlier took you through, be it G2, Ronak, Lawrence, I can tell you that it is the best one I've seen. But you're probably wondering, you're probably wondering, how do I make this best portfolio ever? How do I make it come to life? And if you're like me, with my CIO hat on, you're probably thinking, on the one hand, how do I get all of this to work? And on the other hand, it's gonna be complex. Is it gonna add more complexity? Do I have the right people? Do I have the skills? How do I get from where I am today to where I need to get to? Because we know, I know, all of you know, we run complex platforms and technology. So implementing new tech change is difficult. Well, there's one message I want to leave you with today, which is a really critical one. It's that CX can help you. We can help you. We've got a very large team across APJC. We can help you get to those business outcomes faster. Whatever your journey is, be it hybrid work, be it security, any of the above, we in CX, by the way, together with our partners, we can help you get there. Now, can you raise your hand if you are in the audience and you're a partner? There's lo lots of you here today. Now, I know and I want to thank you for helping us, Cisco, help our customers bring those technologies to life because without you, we can't make it happen. We can't scale. So, what, what is this telling us? A couple of things. If you, if you put it in what I call English IT words, we can help you architect, we can help you adopt, we can help you optimize, we can even run it for you with our partners. We can also support your adoption. When you buy software, the hardest thing to do is integrate it, to bring it to life, to add the value, to show your, your business, your board, your execs that the money you've spent is actually showing value and it's turning up in your operation. So we can help you do that. And by the way, the most important thing also is learning and certification. 
It sounds simple, but every single day we are learning. And the only way to stay on the top of your game and your teams to have the best skills they can is to leverage that, and we've got that for you as well. So how do we bring this to life? How do we do it? Well, through a simplified CX portfolio. We have 8,000 people in CX across APJC, 8,000 people that you can leverage. They do these projects every single day. Network, observability, security, sustainability, you name it, we do it every day. And we've been doing it for 35 years. We have the playbook. And if you haven't been to the world of solutions, if you haven't been to the CX stand, it's awesome. It's the biggest one we've had. I really want you to go because the team is waiting for you to show you what we've got and how we can support your journey. So you heard from me. You heard about the, what I, my views are on the portfolio, how we can help you implement that, and how we can help you drive business outcomes faster. But I'm a big believer of real examples. So today I'm excited and delighted to talk to you about the Customer Hero Awards. We've been driving those for a number of years. And as Dave said earlier, it's really important that you know from us, we want to securely connect everything to make anything possible. But I also know that every customer, every IT department, every IT architecture is different. But you are the change makers. You're the innovators. You're the people that are driving the transformation in your company. And we are there for you. Now, I'm very, very delighted and excited to welcome our customer hero stories to the stage. In fact, I presented all of them with their gifts and trophies uh, yesterday evening. We had a great time. But let me start by sharing a couple of security examples. This is the first category, security. So if security is your, your number one concern, then we have your back. Let me talk about two customer heroes who are here in the audience. The first one is Hero. He's, chain, he's in charge of security at Cognizant, and we implemented a robust network access and end user monitoring for 300,000 employees, and he's happy. Glenn at MYOB, while transitioning to the cloud, he wanted to make sure his employees, his engineers, had a secure, frictionless experience with end-to-end -end security, and we did that too. Now let's move to connectivity. Another three heroes who, in my opinion, they really seized the opportunity that was in front of them. So Raj, ANZ Bank, amazing. We helped modernize his branch network for faster access to applications while providing a great Wi-Fi experience for his customers. For Joseph at ASB Bank, he chose Cisco Success Tracks to connect engineers with insights and unified visibility to ensure the engineers had a great experience. And we know how important it is to keep our engineers happy. And then finally, for Mr. Scott Koo, he improved operational capability, efficiencies, to boost the confidence of thousands of businesses that rely on Samsung's cloud services. And these are all true stories, by the way, amazing true stories. Two final heroes that I want to go to in the next category is innovation. Chrissy at Coles. She manages 21 million customer transactions every week. She wanted the best Wi-Fi experience across 1,400 stores, and she got it. And then finally, our last hero is redefining the future of autonomous driving. And with success tracks, what he did was he drove efficiencies, cost savings to reinvest into his innovation engine. And just to give you two stats, 20% reduction in network deployment time and 18% reduction in network operations. I think all of us want some of that. Well done. So I'd like to actually thank you for the encouragement. I'm going to get the customer heroes to stand up. Where are you? There you are, right here. Thank you for everything that you do. Glenn, Glenn Raj, Hiru, Joseph, Mr. Scott Koo, Chrissy, and Yuchita san. Thank you for leading the way in the industry and showing everyone in this room that we can actually make it happen. And I know some of you only started on this journey last year at the booth. 
So anyone who wants to start the journey this year at the booth, we're waiting for you. Okay, now let's talk about what successful CIOs do, in my opinion. They do two things extremely well. The first one is they articulate the value of IT in terms of business outcomes, and then they move at speed, leveraging partners. And Gartner tells us that CIOs that communicate the value of IT will maintain 60% higher funding levels compared to their peers. I'm sure we all want more funding. So, and I know that that is the reason why we launched Cisco Lifecycle Services, because you wanted, you wanted to be able to do that too. So let's watch a quick video. Technology is advancing fast, like lightning fast. And without a skilled crew who's got your back, keeping up can feel like or but what if it wasn't just you what if you had a whole team of well use the best experts by your side supercharged with ai ml insights and what if you could measure and report outcomes driving more value cisco lifecycle services is here to electrify and boost your journey to better business results fast yeah that fast all right, that was fast. How many of you want 8,000 more U's? Anyone? Come on, you guys are awesome. You want more U's? You want more U's? Of course you want more U's. Well, these offers are simple, they're flexible, they're business outcome focused. Whether you want to reduce risk, enhance your security, any of the, of the above, we are ready to support you. So please, please take advantage of that. Now, one announcement from me today more on business outcomes, we are launching sustainability services which help you either assess and prioritize, reduce energy consumption, or transform to smart buildings. And we can do that for you. It's out now, it's live today. We want to help you because I know we can collectively build a better future for everyone that's connected and it's also good for the planet. So sustainability has to be a priority. We're ready when you are. In closing, as I said, we have the best technology portfolio ever. CX and our partners are here to help you. So please ask and we will be there. Let's keep driving business outcomes. Remember that my passion, the reason why I'm in this role and I moved out of the CIO CTO role is because I wanna help our customers, I wanna help you. I'm passionate about it. My team is ready. We've been getting ready for the last 12 months and we're here to help you. So thank you for listening and let me hand over to Dave West. Thank you. Yeah, Jackie has your back, guaranteed. Hey, so just let's give it up for all the speakers. I think they did a fantastic job. So in closing this session, enjoy Cisco Live. Learn, grow, challenge us, ask questions. The world of solutions is now open. Go to the breakouts, give us your feedback, and have a great week. Thank you, everybody. That was amazing. So much to unpack, and I'm sure you all have incredible takeaways from what Jitu said, from Jackie, and so much more. So we're at our first interview. So I have Larissa with me, the Senior Vice President, General Manager of Collaboration. Welcome, Larissa. Thank you for having me. Amazing. So Larissa, we had WebEx One recently, and there were so many AI announcements. And then, again, AI, the hot topic in our keynote as well. So. What are kind of some key takeaways for WebEx in terms of AI? Uh, first off, we are putting it absolutely everywhere. Uh, we are baking it into the fabric of the platform, which really allows us to turn on a lot of AI experiences for all of the different users, different workloads, whether that is calling, meetings, messaging, contact center, devices. Uh, so I think that approach has been really interesting. I think the focus on not just large language models, because everyone has been talking about that, but all the other stuff, like you nodded your head, like that would never show up in a transcript because it's not a spoken word. Um, being able to capture that with our real-time media models. And then the other big piece that I am super excited about, we're in a very noisy environment, so this is actually a perfect example, is all of the work we're doing around the uh, new codec. 
the AI codec because I think there's just so many times where you can't control what access you have and you can't control what noise you have and this is where AI comes into play. We're gonna make sure that you'll always be heard regardless of the noise around you, regardless of your connectivity. I think those to me are pretty exciting. Yeah, agree 100%. I think with the AI and then again, the new codec that you mentioned. So would you say that is your favorite feature or out of all these innovations, which one stands out for you the most? My favorite feature we announced is probably agent burnout. Uh, we introduced this in the contact center and the reason it's so exciting for me is we have paid a lot of attention to knowledge workers and burnout for those types of workers. And yet when we look at the contact center, these people are turning over about 40% per year. And it's just you know one task after the other, another phone call of probably a customer yelling at you. And now we're paying attention to their well-being and making sure that we can help them so that us as consumers actually get a better experience as well, not having to deal with an employee that is very burnt out. I think that for me is the humanity of that one. It's taking it outside of just technology and really looking at how do we impact the lives of everyone around us. Yeah, and I think it's it's quite interesting because we're talking about AI, but then we're talking about adding the human touch. And I think Cisco does that really, really well. I think that's a great call out. And I think from all the features, and I was reading through your bio, you were look, looking at WebEx calling earlier, now you're like looking after the entire portfolio, future strategy. Must take an army to actually deploy all of these features with the new, the burnout feature for example. So what was sort of the journey like for you and your team and what do you, do you want to talk about that? Sure, um, I mean, we could always use more people. I think everyone feels that <laughs> yeah. way all the time. Um, luckily, I got to work on AI and natural language in my past life at Microsoft. And I think we learned a lot uh, during that time of how AI comes into products and being able to really leverage our customers and getting feedback from people. You have to deliver AI differently than other features. It's not just a button that is appearing and it just works. You need to learn if you're you know, ensuring that there's no bias and what happens when it could be wrong because we know it can be wrong. We hear a lot about hallucinations in the world of ChatGPT and other AI. You have to account for that because if people are trusting you, you need to make sure that that trust is actually not going to be leading them into trouble. And so the team, I think, is all up-leveling in AI. I think it's going to be something that everyone across the team will need to learn and work on. But we actually started with a pretty small core group uh, to really understand what's available, what should we use, where do we actually put this in terms of which users, which personas, which workflows. And then from there, we've really shared that knowledge across the entirety of the collaboration business. Yeah, and I think what's what you said and about your team as well, that we want to make it the best, but we just don't want to like roll out features just because because AI talk of the town and you don't want it to be Correct. you want it to be secure and then again, so that's great. That's a great call out again. And can you talk a bit more about the AI audio codec? Because I think that's an industry first and WebX sure. One there was a big focus on that as well. So if you could just quickly touch on that. Yeah, I mean the the problem we're trying to solve is at the end of the day we can only hear each other if we have good connectivity. And there are many codecs that have been, you know, that have come out, and the best codec, the one that's most used, we are 16 times better than that. Wow. And so when we think about what does that mean, it means that when you're going through a tunnel, when you're driving between buildings, when you're in a remote location, you can still be heard clearly and in real time. I think one of the biggest disadvantages of working remotely in the past was that you're not there real time, you're not heard in real time. And so it's very hard to interject into a conversation. It's very hard to you know, debate your point if you're a couple seconds behind. Yeah. And now you're heard by everyone clearly, you can jump in clearly. I think that's such an important way of bringing you know, the equivalent of real time communication in person, but to in a more distributed fashion of working. Yeah, I agree, because I think Cisco has preached the message of hybrid work for a long time now, and I think especially the example that you gave, driving through tunnels, because everyone's like on the calls when they're driving, and I think the tunnel or like remote location sometimes, because obviously, at least in Australia, a lot of people like moved a bit further out just because yep. they could work from home, and that's the flexibility, but sometimes yep. the internet's not as good. Yep. This is really good. Um, I think contact center is another example. Yeah. You're taking calls either on the highway because you just had a little fender bender, yeah. or in an airport because your flight is delayed, all of these environments are incredibly noisy. Yes. And now you're able to make sure that with the AI for both the sound removal and the, the, the new codec, that you're actually heard by the people you need help from and you know, you're know you able to go through that process very quickly. Ideally, minimize your frustration because I do think at yeah. the end of the day, like we're human beings and 
when problems happen like the fender bender, like it is incredibly frustrating. Yeah. So that that being something that we can now affect positively and even remove, I think is just another great way to apply all of our technology into you know across industries. And I think you must be one of the prime use cases for this one. You being an exec traveling all around, you might have to take calls from anywhere and everywhere. So definitely that's something, you know, we practice what we preach, right? For so sure. yeah. For sure. um, I, I want to talk about a bit about UCAS, Unified Comms as a service, and CCAS, Contact Center as a service, and how it positions into our customers, and how should we, like, what can customers expect, and how does it fit really well into their WebEx portfolio or collaboration portfolio? Yeah, so on the UCAS side, it's typically calling meetings and messaging and we are still seeing a lot of customers who are moving from on-prem calling into the cloud. This has already happened for meetings, but it hasn't quite happened for calling. As they're doing that, they're having to evaluate, what do I do with my contact center? What do I do with all of these um, workflows where there's multiple people sharing a line? Um, so we're really excited. Our cloud calling has been doing really well in the market. We recently announced 13 million users, um, as many as some of our competitors combined. So that was very exciting uh, for us. And I mean, we grew, I think, almost a whole competitor's worth last year. So it's, it's been great to see that progress. Uh, and the reason that progress is happening there is we have this long history with calling. Obviously, we were an on-prem calling vendor. We're doing eight billion phone calls a month. Um, you know, when you're thinking about what kind of calls are these, this is everything from 911 to government calls of how to resolve world issues, um, all the way to hospitals, right? And so we have that DNA, we know what it takes, we know how important it is, how reliable it needs to be. Now we've taken that and we've combined that with our contact center history. Uh, we have an on-prem contact center, we've brought a brand new cloud contact center to the market, that's actually one of the talks that we'll be doing today. And uh, when you start to bring these two together, there's a lot of reimagining of the experiences that happen. Um, and those reimagining is not just about bringing a product from prem to cloud, it's actually how do we make every user's lives better? And we're leveraging a lot of the technology in UCAS and the CCAS side. So for example, I talked about background noise removal, we have transcription, um, we have all of that now com coming into calling into the contact center, so that we're aiding all of those workflows as well. Uh, so I think this is where the platform strategy comes into play, and then the better together of taking two assets in industries we've been you know, pretty dominant in in the past, and bringing that now to the forefront of the cloud. One of the biggest things that I really like to see is how do we take technology we build once, but utilize all over the place so that more and more people get value out of it, and it's really helping our contact center transformation see that while it is very concerning for some to move a contact center to the cloud, because yeah. these are your customers, these are your patients, these are your citizens, um, you don't want to disrupt them, you don't want to create any challenges for them. When they see the value they get by understanding how many more people they can help, understanding what are all the challenges that this particular person has, not just this one time, but all the times that they've talked to you, and hearing them clearly and being able to empathize with them in a way that you couldn't in the past, because you, know, you might have been working in a noisy, loud contact center, or you might have been a remote agent and you didn't have the great connectivity. We're solving for all those problems yeah. by bringing together everything we've done in the UCAS space with the CCAS space on the common platform with AI. Yeah, and I think what you mentioned about a lot of our customers which were on-prem, because obviously in terms of security and then for example like banks or hospitals, yep. and I think it does resolve a big use case for them and so much more than what they had in terms of configuration control hub is so easy to navigate and so so much more in the newer contact center. Okay, we're going to close and one last question before we go. So this is your second Melbourne Cisco Live. What's your favorite thing so far? Have you tried the Melbourne coffee yet? I have tried the Melbourne coffee. Okay. I am um, always impressed with the flat whites out here. Oh, yes. I feel like I don't normally get those and I come out here and I'm like really good, but the food in general has been really yeah. amazing. Um, I am really excited. We're going to go see some animals this week. Oh. That's amazing. Um, I'm going to take my children to see the penguins in Phillip Island, so I'm, I'm super excited about that. I went there that. last week, and you will, the kids will love it. They're like yeah. tiny, but amazing. That's a great, um, and also you have your eye talk tomorrow. So I do. Uh, hopefully everyone will tune in to Larissa's eye talk where she will talk more about AI. Now back to M in the main studio. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Larissa. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shika and Larissa. It's actually great to hear how much AI has already been embedded in, into our WebEx technology. And I for sure definitely use that every single day, especially around that um, Babel Labs noise reduction. I live in the city, so obviously it's very, very crowded there. Um, 
As before we move on into the next segment, I'd love to revisit some housekeeping. So remember, talking about languages in the WebEx space, we actually are broadcasting in seven different languages. So when you check out our broadcast, you can click the drop-down menu and select a new language, especially if you'd like some more of your friends and your family or others in your organization to hear more about what we're doing in that AI space. As well as that, we'd love to hear your thoughts about what Larissa and Sheikha talked about, especially around what you're experiencing in the WebEx platform. So catch us on our different socials and hashtag Cisco Live APJC. We've got lots of innovations and I'm so glad that Larissa actually talked about their motivations for in, uh, optimizing that user experience and is actually focusing on how we use our technology every single day and what we can do to make sure that our hybrid work experience is a lot better um, and is actually making sure that we are giving the best value to ourselves and to our business in particular. So we're going to that innovation talks at the, uh, the World of Solutions with Richard. Let's head over and see what he's doing there now. Hello and welcome to the 2023 edition of the World of Solutions here at Cisco Live in Melbourne, Australia. My name is Richard Dodsworth and I will be your host over the next two days as we tour all the different stands here on the World of Solutions. So the themes for this year's Cisco Live are centered around four things, connected, security, observability, and sustainability. And as we go to the different booths, you will see those different elements coming to life in the demonstrations that we show you. Before we do that though, I thought it might be interesting to go and find the person responsible for building out the world of solutions each year. Paul Johnson, who is one of the staff members here in Melbourne, spends a lot of his time thinking and designing this world of solutions for us to see. So let's go find Paul and see what it takes to build out the world of solutions each year. And I'm here with Paul Johnson. Paul, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you very much. So perhaps we'll start with, with your role here at the world of solutions. Yep. What what are you yeah. uh, so, yeah, so I look after the Cisco stand, which is basically the demo demonstration area, and we uh, oversee the process of getting all the demos onto the stand and so forth. So, yeah. Okay. And then, of course, the big question is, what goes into building a stand like this? Well, it, yeah, it's a, it's a big process. Yeah, so we start um, thinking about Cisco Live in about um, April, and we really start thinking about the Cisco stand in, in June. So the process is we've got about... Oh, 200 staffers. Wow. Uh, we've got about eight people that really come together uh, and work with across Cisco to think about what's going to be relevant, what are the relevant demos um, in our available space. Yeah, and so yeah. how many demos do you end up sort of pulling together this time? A lot. So it just keeps growing because the portfolio keeps growing. So this time we've got about 77 demos, which is huge. Um, and the process or the time it takes to actually come together and build all those demos and think about um, how we're going to show them. Mm -hmm. We worked out the other day, we were having a bit of a think about it. It's about 5,200 staff hours to build that. That's 1.7 years. That's a lot of time. Yes. It certainly is. Yep. Okay. Is there a philosophy really behind how you put this together? Is there some underlying sort of idea that you work out about what sort of demos are the right sort of demos to, to put together? There definitely is. We, we, people come to Cisco Live for you know, multiple different reasons and a lot of people are coming to have a look at technologies that are um, they're in play and others are looking for some guidance or some ideas about what's coming out. So they're the two, um, they're, they're, all, they're not competing, but they're competing for space. So we, we want to make sure there's something for people to see that is there and also demos that are emerging. Yeah. And there's a lot of really new ones. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and I guess over time that's really changed in terms of the, the complexity in bringing these demos to life because I remember you know, maybe five, oh. ten years ago mm. before we had a lot of software in the cloud did you have to bring stuff on site in those days? Oh, you're 100% correct, yeah. So the cloud has been a real gift to us, to be yeah. honest. So, yeah, in the old days, we were rolling a whole data center into Cisco Live. Mm -hmm. And so we will go and build a, build a demo and then replicate the demo in the data center. And it might work. It might take a while to work. Yeah. SAS, we're very confident that the demos are working straight away and our demonstration environment. So yeah. that makes it a lot easier. And I guess that's how you can scale to the 77 demos that we, we have around the booth these days. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I guess on a lighter note, any, any funny stories, any things that come along to sort of surprise you when you're building such a large sort of demonstration area? Um, yeah, good question. I think the, probably the biggest thing is wireless around here. There's so much wireless, and we've got a massive team called the NOC team that puts together the whole lot of IT for Cisco Live, not just the stand, but everything else. But as you can see out in the foyer in World of Solutions, there's so many uh, sponsors and so forth that everybody's got wanting to stand up a wireless 
everything oh, else. How are we going to deal with all this, right? Um, cabling, networking, the whole lot is is um, intricate behind here. We've got 1.7, 1.8 uh, kilometres of cable um, just going under here, in addition to the wireless, partly to run the wireless. Oh, so, right. yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. So, yeah, a lot, lot, lot going on, a lot to look yeah. after, I'm sure. Yeah. So, before we wrap up, mm -hmm. any must-see demos that you, you think that... If people would love to see down here. Absolutely. Firstly, I'd say you should go and watch the time lapse around how we built it. But from the demos, we did go and ask what are the demos you should see for each of the demo areas. And of mm -hmm. course, it's like choosing your favourite child. They're, you know, they're all the, they're all the best demo. Um, but um, I would say there's a lot of focus on AI. So whether it's a couple of demos on AI ops, but certainly in the security area, um, um, AI firewall policy management. We know that's a massive bug there for um, the SOC teams. Managing firewalls has adds a lot of delay in deployment. That's a really big one. Contrasting with things like EQX, new room systems in um, the collaboration area, uh, and adaptive policy, uh, Catalyst Center. You should. But I would say go and have a look at the walls. Tells the whole story end to end. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think over the course of the, the next two days, we're going to get around to a lot of those different booths and. Yep talk to the experts um, in those booths. Absolutely. So Paul, thank you so much for sort of giving us a little bit of a look behind the scenes on yep. what it takes to create uh, the world of solutions. And um, I'll probably let you go. Thanks very much. Enjoy. Okay, thanks yep. so much. Cheers. All right, everyone. <laughs> so when we come back, we'll actually go and dive into some of those um, booths and demonstrations that Paul mentioned, <laughs> uh, and we'll see what's happening uh, within the, the different parts of the Cisco portfolio. Wow, that is absolutely incredible to see uh, what goes on behind the scenes in the in the world of solutions. Um, all that, what, 200, 200 staff members, I'm not even going to begin to repeat the amount of ca metres of cabling that went into that, but incredible to see. So don't forget, uh, we'll, be checking, uh, we'll be checking back into the world of solutions throughout the day, so stick around, we'll cross back and forth. We've got plenty of more iTalks to come as well, so tune. make sure you stick around and tune in for those as well. Um, can always, uh, can always catch up and watch us, Cisco, uh, ciscolive.com, seven different languages there. Anything you miss, on demand from 20th of December, everything will be available for you. But keeping in line with uh, World of Solutions when we're crossing back, there will be um, a big part of uh, Cisco's motivation at the moment is a long-standing commitment to sustainability and the key pillar for Cisco's success in the future with our own uh, net zero goals. So... To hear more, we actually have M in our next studio. M has with her uh, Denise Lee, our Vice President of Cisco Engineering Sustainability Office. M, over to you. Thanks, Dave. I'm really excited to be sitting here with Denise. I think sustainability is a really key function of Cisco Live, and we have a fantastic sustainability store at the um, World of Solutions as well. So, Denise, I'd love to hand this over to you to introduce yourself and what you do for Cisco. Absolutely. Uh, my name's Denise Lee. I lead our Engineering Sustainability Office. Um, we've been around almost two years, it's so hard mm -hmm. to believe, but um, the progress is, is amazing and it's great to be back in region. Fantastic, and I believe you've been in Australia for a little while as well, so very happy to welcome you back into Melbourne and you were here with us last year as well. Absolutely, yeah, I actually had a chance to go over to um, Western Australia as well before, before this Melbourne stint. It's been oh, great. Fantastic. They have the wonderful little quokkas there as well, so <laughs> I hope you had the chance yes. to have a view. Actually, yeah. I'd really love to get into it because I think sustainability is such a key, key topic, mm -hmm. and we've obviously heard a lot within the keynotes. So recently, Cisco shared its next-gen environment sustainability strategy. Could yeah. you briefly share the reason behind this new strategy and what the priorities are? Absolutely. So the strategy is broken into three different parts. And the first is the transition to clean energy. And as we think about getting to net zero and what it means to, to get to net zero, that transition to clean energy is so fundamentally important. And what we're doing, everything from how we're designing our chips to be more energy efficient, to the materials going into our products, um, to transitioning to actual renewable and clean energy in our own mm -hmm. operations. We're doing so much across the board to make sure that that transition to clean energy, we're leading by example. Um, and that's a really hard thing. We're going to have to digitize the, the grid, right? There's a lot of transition that's going to have to happen. Uh, the second strategy is designing circularity into it. So as we think about, yes, we're using a lot of things, but we also want to make sure that how we're designing, how we're packaging our products, and how we're taking our products back we recently uh, announced that 100% of our product take back, we can responsibly recycle, remanufacture, reuse, right? 99.98, so really 100% of our product. Now it's a matter of getting that product back. It's a matter of designing into the solutions themselves that they're designed for circularity so that we can, we can effectively reuse what comes back. Uh, and it's, what's so in, in exciting is 
even in how we're packaging, whether it's more uh, water versus air, right? Even how we transport it, all of those things are coming into play with the circular design. And then the third one uh, is, is in building these resilient ecosystems. Um, in, in, within engineering, that, that means so many different things because we know that our products, when they go out into the wild and they're racked and they're stacked and they're connected, they work with an entire resilient ecosystem that's more than just you know, Cisco as a vendor. So within engineering, we are working with industry alliances and consortiums and we are building standards. Like we're writing standards that are going to kind of make us future proof and like look far into the future at new architectures, whether it's around things like um, getting ready for AI, mm -hmm. right, and doing the ultra uh, ethernet consortia, or things around power distribution with Emerge Alliance. Um, Linux Foundation Project has, um, has a, a, a project that we're involved with for sustainable and scalable infrastructure in data centers. So all of these things are coming together to build these resilient ecosystems uh, inside our portfolio and, the, and, and where our products reside. No, that's, that's great. And it's interesting to hear, we were talking <laughs> earlier about how a strategy within a larger organization is really important to make sure that we hit those sustainability goals. And so for a lot of our listeners at home and for our T teams out there, what metrics or statistics should they be using when they're embarking on the sustainability journey? You know, metrics and data is like my core platform from yeah. even before sustainability because you can't fix, you can't change what you can't measure. So one of the things that our customers consistently ask is where do we start? How do we get started? And most, most often the, question, the answer is do you have a baseline? Right, where are the metrics and the, the measurement? So understanding the greenhouse gas emissions, right, your carbon of footprint emissions, that's where you start. And for most of our customers, with the intersection with technology really comes down to energy usage and energy consumption. And then the, the, we talked about circularity, like how much is actually being taken back and recycled? How much of the product is, is being used with non-virgin materials? So the data plays such a big role and the metrics that are being used come down to new metrics when it comes to that carbon footprint space. We're now measuring overall um, energy consumption. We're measuring the rack density in a data center. We're measuring power density of, of that's going into those racks and into those boxes. And there's all these new metrics that are coming out, you know, uh, watts per bit in port. So, so there, there's a new language almost that's coming out with sustainability that's going to underpin every part of our portfolio, even how we measure power. We are fundamentally writing new standards to get more accuracy in how we measure power and then how we give that information and make that available to our customers so they can put some automation to it, right? So they can do some things that eventually will get to you know, AI and, and, and more intelligence so that we humans can step away and we can let the machines do the work to optimize. Yeah, absolutely, and I think it's really important to understand where your business is going, especially on that particular baseline, and I guess that's something that Cisco has done as well for all of its products, and which is why we're also committed to a particular strategy. Absolutely, in fact, uh, we're really excited later this evening, Cisco's 2003 Purpose Report is coming out. So if you think about how Cisco is leading with transparency, all of those reporting standards are constantly evolving, and Cisco is really trying to stay at that forefront of complete transparency and monitoring and governance and, and compliance with these standards. That's fantastic, and it's, and it's also worldwide, isn't it, as well as um, our sustainability image and what we're reporting on, so it's not mm -hmm. specific but for each region. So That's we can right. actually see what we're doing on a global scale. I think G2 said that we hit one, we have impacted one billion people yes. positively. So That's right, that's <laughs> right. Uh, in fact, globally, the Climate of Parties uh, 2028 is meeting in Dubai right now, mm -hmm. right? So when, we, when you think about everyone playing this role across the across board, I'm here meeting with customers and partners and talking about our engineering roadmaps in our portfolio. My counterparts are in, are in, um, in Dubai at COP. We're meeting with you know, government dignitaries around the world looking at policy and what's coming next. Fantastic. Yeah. And so, um, also in the keynote, I know we mentioned AI previously, and that's just a little two, bit. Just a little <laughs> bit. And this wouldn't be a Cisco interview without that's the mention right. of AI. Yeah. Um, how does AI fit in with sustainability? Are there any particular use cases that you could share? Yeah, there's a couple that come to mind. Uh, the first, and actually there was a recent stat from um, an analyst group called Del Oral that, that mentioned the physical data center infrastructure is projected to, companies are projected to spend something like 500 billion dollars in the next handful of years, like 2027. Right? And if you think about what goes into that, it would be irresponsible to not consider sustainability when thinking about 
AI ready data center infrastructure because we know that AI is generating more and more you know, hot chips and connected GPUs and compute's going through the roof. So if we don't look after the capacity to do it more responsibly and more with more energy efficiency, we're going to have to build for the future. If we don't do that, we're not going to be able to keep up with the demand and the needs for the technology and the performance of compute and, and networking. So that's one, right? It's in the actual sustainable AI infrastructure that's going to go into data centers and the next generation of data centers. Uh, the second is actually using generative AI itself and all the automation that comes with energy proportionality, making sure you're moving workloads around in an energy efficient way. Even something as simple as where do I retrofit versus build a new data center? AI will help tell you where the grid is using more renewable energy, where the weather conditions are more prime for you know, putting a new data center. And so we're looking at all of the uses for generative AI inside of the workloads, inside of the data center, connecting everything from networking and compute and storage, and the more, you know, the more efficient use of moving those workloads around and connecting it to, to the rest of those you know, ecosystems and environments. And AI, honestly, is, is, um, is, is a really exciting proposition. We just need to make sure we're doing it responsibly. And, and that's why planning is so important and having these yes. conversations early, especially with our customers and partners, is also part of our sustainability journey. Yes. So one of the, and, and around the AI piece as well, we're obviously yeah. transitioning as well to a software company. Mm -hmm. And we're embedding software as a part of um, our strategy. How does sustainability fit into that space? Yeah, you know, software for sustainability is, is actually a really exciting proposition because when you consider the energy usage everywhere you go, things are, you know, you might turn a light switch on. It's always off or on. You maybe leave the room and maybe you forget to turn the light switch off. But there, when you think about the sensor technology that's available and you think about software sitting on the platform for all of this, you can actually make things always ready but not necessarily always on. So the buildings around the world make up almost 40% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. 40%. That's a lot. That's a lot, <laughs> That's a lot. Right? So if you consider all of the things that we're connecting, we're constantly connecting, and how many more things you're connecting at home, think about building software in a way that is making it available to you when you need it, not necessarily always on. So something as simple as somebody might come through after hours to clean and, and wrap up and get ready for the next day, you don't necessarily need all the wireless access points on and all the switching on. How do you tell and put, put policy management in place? How do you put automation in place? So software is going to allow us the platform visibility to do that. And if you think about how Cisco has spent so long moving packets around and moving data, imagine being able to do that with energy. Can we network energy the same way we've been networking data for many decades? And that concept of networking energy or energy networking, I think is really going to open up a lot of opportunity for software to help with just curb the inefficiencies that are out there and then really optimize the power that we have. So when we move to more clean energy transitions, we're doing so with the energy we really need and it's not a lot of you know, waste. And that's important, especially as we're moving to hybrid work and office spaces. Yes. Spaces that we're using are not necessarily exactly. utilized at 100% all the time. This is where we can really... I mean, heating and cooling <laughs> of buildings with no one in them, you know, that's, that's a lot of wasted energy. Yeah. yeah. So this, this is my last question, um, Denise. Yeah. Uh, what can you do to get started on your sustainability journey? Or what tips do you have for someone who's just looking at it for the first time? You know, I think the, the, the primary thing um, I've seen from customers around the world is just an education. Sustainability is a new topic. So how do you get educated with the facts? And all the facts come down to measurement. So how are you measuring your energy usage? How are you measuring your greenhouse gas uh, emissions or your footprint? And that's the first step, so measurement. And the second is setting these targets and goals with plans that are kind of real, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, Again, once you have the measurement and the data, you should be able to make goals and commitments that are, that are a little bit more uh, practical. And then from there, bring in the right partners and the trusted advisors in that journey so that you have a chance of getting to those goals. And it's not just, you know, not just the headline, but you can bring all the right people around the table to guide you in that journey because it really is a journey and we're all in it together. That's a great way to end the uh, discussion and the interview, I think. Because, you know, sustainability is something that we all have to take responsibility for as well and that we can actually put into everyday lives. Yes. Awesome. So in saying that, um, you should definitely check out what we're doing in terms of sustainability at Cisco. You can, we've actually partnered with WWF, so you can adopt a koala. So head online if you want to see more about what we're doing in that space. Now back to you, Dave, in the studio.
Yeah, thank you, Em. That was uh, that was amazing. Uh, thank you, Em and Denise. I uh, actually feel quite quite proud to hear all of that, and uh, I think it's amazing when you put some metrics and numbers behind uh, behind the backing of it all. It is really incredible to see the the power of what Cisco is doing and to help to help our to help our customers in all that as well. Um, as Em said, partnered with sustainability partner WWF, where you can uh, adopt a partner, um, and all the other bits and pieces we've made around this entire event from. Uh, uh, sustainable uh, boards, signage, everything that is good to go. However, don't let me tell you all this. To hear more, we're going to go actually go over to World of Solutions, back with Richard. He has four of our colleagues from Cisco over there, and they're going to tell you all about how sustainability is, well, what else we're doing at Cisco in this space. So over to you, Richard, please. Okay, welcome back, everybody. And here we are at the Cisco Sustainability Stand, which is actually something very new for this year. Uh, I don't think we've had a sustainability stand before. And I'm joined by Cassandra Carruthers, who's the executive sponsor for sustainability here in ANZ. Thanks very much, Richard. Cassandra, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you. So why sustainability with Cisco? Look, sustainability is really important in empowering an inclusive future for all. And at Cisco, we've set a goal to, to reach net zero across our value chain by 2040, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. And Cisco has had a really long-standing focus around sustainability because it's not just about any individual business or government. We have to all do this together. And Cisco's focus has really been around three things. It is how we're improving our product energy efficiency, how we're transitioning to clean energy, and also how we're designing circular design principles into all of our products going forward. And it's also a really important part of why Cisco has joined the Sustainability Tech Council here in Australia, partnering across the industry to really make a difference and increase awareness. Oh, that, that, that's fantastic. And I guess that's something very new for all of us. Mm. And so what role do you see Cisco playing with organisations in helping them on their journey, and in particular for our, I guess, our audience who are very, very technology focused, what they can be doing to start their sustainability journeys. Yeah, well, I think it's really important. We recently did a survey with IDC, and 62% of organisations have identified that investments in technology are going to help them reach their sustainability goals. And over 55% of them believe that energy management is critical in them achieving their goals. So Cisco can help you provide visibility into your network and actually how you're consuming energy, and that you can have a real influence on making change going forward. Fantastic. And I'm sure Cisco, we're a company of solution builders. I'm sure there are many solutions that we have that um, impact sustainability. Perhaps you could outline some of those for us. Sure. Well, there's actually probably too many to mention, but let me just start with a couple. First around data centres, and I think that's a really key area for us. Having visibility and insight is critical, and leveraging the Cisco Nexus dashboard together with Intersight can give you a really early on information around how you're consuming energy in the network. And you might want to consider also modernising some of your infrastructure. I see huge energy savings with this. So if we look at UCSX, for example, mm -hmm. that's consuming 40% less power. And also the Nexus 9800 is, is about 59 times more energy efficient than the previous generations. Wow. So if you're looking at how you can have an influence on your organisation's sustainability goals, there's some great places to start. Mm -hmm. And I actually think if we look at smart buildings and workspaces, we have a great example um, in Cisco's or, um, building in New York City, Pen One. And we're actually going to show some video from that now. Designing that with smart building principles in mind, we've been able to leverage some key innovations. Firstly, around Cisco Catalyst and how we're converging power and data networks through power over Ethernet, coming together to reduce some of the steel conduit that you need to build into buildings. It's incredible innovation. But also, it's incredibly important how we do um, using Cisco Meraki dashboard as well as IoT sensors and smart spaces to leverage automation in your building and unlock occupancy insights. Because we know that not everyone's coming to work today. We need to work in a hybrid world. And what we've found by leveraging these insights for heating, cooling, lighting, and air conditioning is we've been able to save 39% of the power in Cisco Pen One from 2019 to 2022. And I think that's some incredible innovation and that's what's really achievable for you as a technologist driving forward. Well, that's, that's some fantastic savings there, I'm sure. And I'm sure the environment is one that everyone wants to come to work can have a great experience when yes. they're in the office as well. So how can people get started? I guess that's the question that everyone's got in their mind now is 
I want to do this, how do I yeah. get started? I think there's so many places to get started. Just while we're here at Cisco Live, there are seven different sessions you can look at that have sustainable solutions built into it. So start there. You can also come past the sustainability stand and we're also going to have a link up for an IDC survey. It tells you where you are on the sustainability maturity matrix as well So and what good companies are doing that you can leverage off them as well. And CX Sustainability Services are a great place. If you need some advice on where to get started, you can leverage that as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for taking us through what's happening here on the sustainability stand. Cassandra. And with that, let's go and delve into some of the technology around the, the campus and then on into the data centre as part of the, the next bit of this session. All right, here we are in the networking stand now, and I'm joined by Ash Burton. Hi, Richard. Ash, how are you? Very good. Welcome to the broadcast, Ash. Thank you. Now, networking isn't just about networking these days. You know, networking and security is really starting to come together more and more, and customers are thinking more about how they secure their networks more than they ever have in the past. So perhaps you could sort of talk to us about how networking is influencing their cyber security strategy. Yeah, I can. Thanks, Richard. Absolutely. More, now more than ever, the network's playing a pivotal role in security. Uh, if you think about it, all users and devices and everything on the network, the first thing it touches is the network. So why don't we use the network to form part of our cyber strategy? Um, when we look at zero trust and zero trust network access, what does the network do? It authenticates users. It authorises users, can put them on a policy, then it can actually establish trust. And once we have trust, we can then look at verifying that trust, making sure the device or the, the thing is doing what it should be doing. And from there, we can actually start to really use the network as a pivotal part of that security strategy. So SE access sounds like something that can really simplify and automate the network. Um, Sometimes seeing it in action is, is better than words. So is yeah. that something you could show us perhaps? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to, Richard. In fact, once you see how simple it is to define network segmentation uh, via the Catalyst Centre, you'll be amazed at how simple it is. So let me show you. All right, so what I'm doing here, Richard, is I've jumped onto Catalyst Centre, um, going into the provision page, and the first thing I'm going to show you is the uh, macro segments or the VRFs on the network. You can see here that we have four VRFs, and I'm in particular created two an employee VRF and an IOT VRF. If I was to click on the create layer three network, so I'd follow that workflow right through. Then I'm gonna look at the actual micro segmentation where we're looking at the SGTs or the security group tags. In this deployment, I've got 27 security group tags. So if I click on this tab, you'll actually see all the traffic flows that are going on inside my network right now. I've got, um, if I hover over, I can see the source and what destination that traffic is talking to. And if I click on one of those SGTs, the guest one, I can see all the traffic flows for that one individual user or, or SGT. I can then go in further, dive an extra pit from a visibility perspective and see that my guests have got communications with my HVAC system, which I don't really want. I could choose to view the contract right here and modify it, but I'm gonna show you how to set the policy up individually. The first thing I wanna do is I'm gonna put my SGTs into their macro segments. So let's look at the doctor's SGT. I wanna put that into the employee's uh, virtual network. And I do that by just clicking the virtual network there, save. Now I'm gonna put my employees into the same virtual network. So I click on employees, click the edit button, move over here into the employee's virtual network and save that. Now what I wanna do is put my HVAC and lighting system into the IoT virtual network. So if I move over here, I'm going to select HVAC, I'm going to hit edit, and I'm going to push this into the IoT network. Now what I'm doing here is I'm just putting my groups into my virtual networks. That's all I've done so far. I haven't created any policies. And the last one is the lighting one. And the lighting one, it belongs also in my IoT virtual network. So now I've divided up where my groups of users go. I now want to create a policy. How easy is it to create this policy? I'm actually going to go over to the Policies tab and I get this nice matrix. And on this matrix, I, down the vertical side, I have my source SGT groups and across the horizontal, I've got my destinations. And I simply find the intersection of my two. So what I want to do is I want to do HVAC talking to the light system. Now the HVAC system doesn't need to talk to the light system, obviously, so I want to create a policy right here. I click on that little button, uh, which was just the square, change contract, click on deny, because I don't want those two systems to talk to each other. And what I'm gonna do is click the change button, then the save button, 
and all of a sudden I've just created a policy between two groups of users that I put into the IoT virtual network and I'm denying that traffic. And that's how simple it was. Wow, that is so easy. Um, even I think I could do that, I think. Yeah, now you look at how hard that would be on a traditional network with access control lists, IP addresses, and all of that you know, complex mess that we have in the traditional network. I fully automated here on DNAC, so it's a lot easier. Well, wow. thank you, Ash, for demonstrating how easy it is to build policies and apply security to a network these days um, and, and make it so much easier than in the past. No worries, Richard. Sure. All right, so we've had a look at what's happening in the campus. Let's move over and see what's happening in the data center um, in driving simplicity in the data center. Okay, here we are in the data center area now, and I'm joined by Greg Scarlett from the data center team. Greg, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you. Okay, so we saw in the campus um, arena with Ash the importance of security from a segmentation point of view, but there's another area that's really changing from a network perspective, which is you know, the pace of change is occurring faster than ever before. And especially in the application space, the app developers are expecting the network just to be available and to work uh, all the time for, for when they need access to it. So my question to you, Greg, is so what are we doing to facilitate the network being continuously available, but at the same time addressing any security concerns that, um, that we might have. Yep. And look, you just nailed it, Richard, that application owners are demanding change faster and faster than ever before. You know, when have you ever heard of an application owner saying, yep, I'm happy to wait for the network, I've got some time to kill, you know, don't worry about that for a couple of weeks. The fact is that they want things faster and they want it increasingly more complex. Now, what we need to achieve here is agility, but consistency. Now, what we've seen is that the more times you have to touch an individual device, the likelihood of increasing risk and making mistakes just goes up. So what we want is policy-driven deployment. We want to be able to take a policy, define that once, and push that out everywhere across our network environment for those changes. So policy deployment sounds a lot like ACI. We, we still do ACI, right? Yep, absolutely. ACI has not gone away. It is still a policy-driven deployment platform. What we now want to do is bring those benefits to our more traditional Nexus-type environments. And the way that we're going to achieve that is through a platform called Nexus Dashboard Fabric Controller. And what I'll show you now is how we can take a network of standalone Nexus switches and deploy a best practice configuration out across a full fabric in just a couple of minutes. Okay, so what we see here is Nexus Dashboard Fabric Controller. Now the first thing that we see is an overview of the whole environment. We get the, all the switches, we get the health information, all the different models, we get the software versions that they're running. What we're going to do is deploy a brand new fabric. So we go to our fabrics and we start stepping through a pretty basic sort of wizard. We go in and create a fabric, give it a name, and then we choose what type of fabric that we want to deploy. Now you can see here, we've got a wide range of choices of networks, and these are all built against Cisco best practices. We go all the way from a VXLAN EVPN fabric to a classic LAN, as well as all the way out to multi-site EVPN fabrics. Here we're going to choose a traditional VXLAN EVPN. We select that, and then we start to configure all the different parameters for this network. So all the information, like the BGP information, um, any sort of parameters that we need to configure and customize for this environment, to build the network. We can go all the way through to VPC protocols, different routing information that we need within the environment, all these sort of manual configurations that usually you would be configuring each individual switch and trying to configure this on a per switch basis. We roll all this information into a single template and once we're happy with the configuration of that template, we save that and then we can take that configuration and apply that to our physical switches. So the configuration saves, we've now got that available as a fabric to us in the environment, and we go to our physical hardware. We select the physical hardware that we want in the environment, and from that templated configuration, we then select and apply a role down onto the switch. The platform will then reconcile what that role needs to provide and push that individual config down to that individual switch, and hey presto, within a few minutes, we've got a fabric that's fully configured, up and running, ready for applications to run. So Greg, that may, you made things look so easy with that, that configuration change. And I know, you know configuration is one part of the operational aspects of, of building networks like this. Um, you know, and many networks don't change very often once they're deployed, of course. But occasionally there is something comes along that, that facilitates a change, maybe an, an end of life of some hardware. So what can we do to sort of help with that sort of process as yep. part of this? Yep. And look, this is the ongoing operations. And let's face it, that is the bulk of what networks do. 
you configure them once, they stand up, you might change a few things here and there, but for the lifetime operations, this is where we really need to do the most work. Now, the classic example is, yeah, we've got devices that are coming up end of life, or best practices have changed, and we need to be able to see that and make the appropriate changes for the environment. So let's take a look at how Nexus Dashboard can help us with this by consolidating all that information into one place. Okay, so what we see here is again Nexus Dashboards, but this time we're in the Insights application. Now Insights starts to give us all the operational activities that give us the health of the environment. So we can see here in this environment that there's some alerts, there's some things that we need to address. What we're going to focus on are the advisories. So the advisories are things that are present in the environment that normally I'd have to go to different websites and monitor different serial numbers and things to understand. What we can see here are there's some hardware in the environment that while it's not a problem yet, it's coming up to end of life. So these are the things that we probably need to get on top of, start to have a conversation with how we're going to replace those, what they're going to look like in the future, and give me those dates. Now, some of the other things that we need to look at are best practices. So we can also see here that there's some advisories around disabling different features, disable IP source routing. Again, what it shows us are the devices in the environment that are affected by this advisory, and more importantly, what the recommended solution in order to fix this particular advisory. So we get a configuration code, we get a link to why it's best practice, and we understand exactly what is going on in the environment and how to remediate it. Okay, thanks for that, Greg. And so as we've seen there, you know, you can take that the information from the whole fleet and just consolidate that down and, and get a really consolidated picture of what's going on uh, within the network. Now, just going back to something you said earlier um, around configuration and using templates. Now, obviously, that was being used for an initial configuration, right? So, I guess the question is, what do we do for so, sort of ongoing changes um, as part of using templates? Yep. And look, the best network in the world would be one that doesn't run any applications. Now, the reality is networks don't operate in silos. They talk to other networks. They do require change. Now, often those changes may not be things that were done in our own environment, but rather from external sources. So routing table updates or changes in protocols and things that you know change in the environment that may not have been done by our team ourselves, but by external entities. So what we want to understand is when the network gets to blame, which it, invariably it does, how do we track this? How can we pinpoint if a change elsewhere in the environment or in our environment did affect an application? And if it did, how do we remediate it? So again, using Nexus Dashboard Insights, let's take a look at how we can understand these changes that may occur in the environment outside of our control. Okay, so once again, we're in Nexus Dashboard Insights. Here we're looking at some of the different analysis that the platform can do to help us with understanding our environment. We're going to do a delta analysis of the configuration. Now, this is not just config in terms of a running configuration. This is the state of the network as it existed at two different snapshots. So we can see here we've got two dates, an earlier date and the later date, and we can see and understand really quickly the changes that occurred in the environment between those two particular dates. So we get a bit of a summary of all the different major, critical, warning level faults and all the different resources within the environment that these changes have affected. Now, what we then do is we can start to look at anomalies in the environment. So anomalies are things that we know as Cisco can really affect applications. So again, we show what triggered that anomaly, what config changes led to this you know, anomaly being raised, but more importantly, again, what is the impact of that? What applications are being affected and what is the recommended remediation or solution in order to clear this anomaly? So what we've seen is how do we understand changes in the environment that may or may not have been triggered by the IT team, but from external sources and how they've affected our applications. So Richard, what we've seen here is how we can take an environment from a clean slate, a greenfield environment, deploy a best practice and known configuration, but then continue to operate that. Understanding what changes are occurring in the environment, how they're going to affect my applications, so that if something does happen, we can really quickly identify was the change a network issue or was it outside our control? And more importantly, if it is an issue on a network, how do we remediate it? And this is the life cycle of a network. It's not just a config and a stand-up, but running this network for five years or however long you want these devices in the environment. So I hope this has been useful, and I hope it's given you a great uh, snapshot of what we can do in the Nexus world. Greg, thank you so much for taking us through that. So 
we've looked at the campus network and what's happening there. We've just seen some great innovation that's happening around the data centre. Let's head over to the IoT team and see what's happening in the IoT world with connectivity in that space. Welcome to the last stop on our tour for this section. Uh, we're here in the industrial IoT zone, um, probably the zone that's got the most equipment on display, so it's a, it's a fantastic demonstration of the breadth of the Cisco portfolio in this space. So I'm joined with Wee Jay, who's, Hi, uh, who's part of our industrial IoT team. Welcome to the broadcast. Thank you. Um, so, you know, IT clearly has become a lot more popular and the breadth of our solutions in this space has grown exponentially over yep. the years. But I guess the question now that many customers have is not just around connectivity, but what should they be doing to secure their yep. IoT network? So perhaps we'd love to get your thoughts around the, the security question and, and how customers can start to address that. Yeah, so basically for the IoT security, it's always a long journey. But from our point of view, this journey always starts with uh, visibility. Luckily, Cisco has a very powerful visibility tool for our industrial customers. This tool was called the CyberVision. CyberVision basically can help our customer to gain the visibility inside of the industrial network, as well as all the OT device security postures. We do have a very good demos. Maybe I can show you about this product. Fantastic, yes. Demos are always a great way of showing what, what's possible. Okay, let's do it. Okay, here's the tool we call Separation. After you log into the system, you will see a dashboard with all the information about this system. The most important and powerful tool is the preset. After you enter the preset menu, there are lots of different types of preset. Some of the preset actually is uh, defined by the system, and our customer can define his own preset. This preset uh, actually is a combination of all the products they are interested about. In this demonstration, actually, we have a preset named Plant. We simulate the manufacturing environment. After you log into this preset, you see a small dashboard with all the information about this preset and uh, such as a global risk of scores and the device, how many devices they have and how many vulnerabilities we have. And the most interesting menu actually is the map. Once you log into the map, this is a logic representing of your actual industrial network. You see we have uh, different type of groups. They call line one, line two, line three. This can be represent the actual production line. So which means our customers through this UI, they can understand what's exactly they are talking about. Uh, between each of the industrial uh, product. Let's take a look about uh, the details of an uh, uh, example of the one product. It's a Rockwell product. You can see the icon. Once you click the icon, and you can see more details about this industrial assets. We have a technical sheet. After you click this technical sheet, you can see a lot of details, such as a product model. What's a brand is Rockwell, and it's a PLC and with a firmware version, IP address, MAC address, as well as all the other industrial information as well. And if you go to the activity menu, this activity menu gives you a visibility about how exactly you know, other devices access uh, uh, industrial assets or talk with, uh, how they talk with the other rest of the uh, device in the network as well. And we also have the other information related about this product. And for example, the security. After you click the security tab, now you can see what vulnerabilities you have on this OT device. This is very critical. We are not only give you how many vulnerabilities you have, as well we will uh, show you some of the links and give you the resolution how to fix this vulnerability. If you go back to the, the menu called risk scores, we will give a risk score for each of the OT device. This is very powerful. This can help other customers very easily to identify which OT device has the highest risk in our environment. And of course, CyberVision also can understand the industrial protocols. And if you lo log into the automation menu, and here you are not only see which product is access is OT device, but you can even see what kind of variable they write or read this product. So that's very powerful, give a very full visibility about uh, uh, the OT device to our customer. Well, I mean, CyberVision sounds like a really powerful tool. Um, perhaps you could sort of describe how it works behind the scenes, just so people can get a bit of an idea of how it pulls together. Yeah, of course. Actually, CyberVision is a two-layer architecture. There are two components. One is center, and another one is sensor. So the sensor can be installed in a physical server, or even a virtual machine in our customer uh, data center environment, or even in the cloud service. 
Another part is about the sensor. The sensor can be built in, embedded into our industrial networking device, just like what you see here with the IE switch or IR switch. So this provides a very unique value to our customer, which means customers don't need to spend money to build another dedicated uh, span traffic networking. And uh, also we will not generate too much additional traffic in the network. That may be cause a problem about the network performance for our industrial customers. So that's a very unique value of uh, CyberVision to our customer. Okay. CyberVision, sounds like it's a fantastic product and something that, that people should investigate. Now, how does it integrate with the rest of the Cisco security portfolio? I mean, we've got a lot of products in our portfolio that focus on different elements of security like ICE, XDR and then other, other solutions. So the big question I'm sure that everybody has is, does it integrate with those products as well? That's a great question. Definitely CyberVision can be integrated with the rest of the Cisco other security product and solutions. Mm -hmm. So ICE is just one of the example. Actually, I got a very nice demo to show how CyberVision working together with ICE. So let's take a look at that, that, that demo. Sure, let's do it now. Okay, once you log into the CyberVision, we get a configuration about the integrations. So here we got a lot of different type of integration configurations. Here is the example is uh, uh, we can use a PIX grid protocol to integrate with ICE. If you look at my system, this integration has been configured already. And let's log into the ICE and the endpoint menu. And we can see in our lab environment, we got a lot of product already detected by the ICE. And let's take a look of one specific product, that's an OT product. I click this product, I saw lots of different type of uh, attribute, but some of the attribute, it's come directly from CyberVision. It's not just IP address, MAC address, but now you get the full visibility about the OT information, so just like a Rockwell PLC or some of the firmware of the Rockwell device. All this device uh, information uh, comes from the CyberVision directly. Okay, we're well, not only just import all the OT device information into ICE, but remember that we still have the security group access policy in ICE. Now we can fully uh, mapping all these policies together with the CyberVision. Remember we saw the logic map in CyberVision? We have a production line one, two, three. Each of the production line, we can assign a security group tag. And once all this information populated into the ICE, we can mapping them exactly into the ICE system, which means we can very easily control the access policy between each of the production line in the manufacturing environment. That's very powerful. Hi, Richard, I hope you enjoyed the demo. For all the audience, I really recommend everyone start to think about industrial security, especially for your critical infrastructures. No matter you are working for the mining, manufacturing, or transportation, that becomes more and more important. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, VJ. So that brings us to an end for the, the IoT stand uh, and the demo here. It also brings to end this section of the World of Solutions Tour. So next time when we come back, we'll be going deep into securing the enterprise and seeing what's happen happening with security across all of an enterprise uh, and, and what we can offer there. Thank you so much, Richard. It's great to see and actually hear directly from our engineers about what they're doing in their particular business unit. And, and you know, this is the power of the world of solutions. You actually get to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. And we're so happy to have Richard to actually take us through all of those different segments, especially around, you know, IoT in that last space. So we're coming up and towards the afternoon part of our um, broadcast. And I really want to say we've had such great conversations around sustainability. Um, sustainability is actually really close to my heart and I have the absolute pleasure of shadowing someone from Denise Lee's team in the engineering space. And it's great to see what we do as an organization. Um, we've actually got net zero challenges that are coming up, which actually encourages internal employees to pitch forward their ideas for what we can do around the sustainability piece. Um, and that's actually happening next week. So I'm really excited to see what we've come up with there. But Dave, what do you think about sustainability? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely think it's incredible what Cisco is doing. As a, I think I said earlier, it, you feel quite proud to be mm. working for a company like this and the, the, the strides that they're taking. Um, I think most importantly for our, for our customers, though, as well. So I think I will definitely be trying to encourage my customers that are here to go over to the sustainability stand and um, visit them because there seems to be just so much they get talking about. And, yeah, tying that in, whole, all that uh, whole messaging across the circular economy, reuse, recycle and restore, essentially. So... 
No, that's um, it's a it's a very very exciting space at the moment. What about you, Shiga? Yeah, I think the one of the videos initially that we looked at when Richard was interviewing uh, at the sustainable. It's I love how they've set up different product that Cisco offers and how it ties in with the sustainability on the sustainability stand. So that was incredible. And I think what Denise mentioned with, in the interview with you about the about ANZ joining the Sustainability Tech Council. I think that's incredible, and how Cisco can actually make a difference in. Australia and New Zealand space as well. So, and I think another thing I wanted to call out was how much difference we've already seen from last year. I've been in Cisco for like almost two years now, and now as I'm part of collaboration, so maybe calling out a bit of collab piece that all our devices now have, we can get a report on their power consumption, and you can set them into quiet hours, so that way they would be in power saving mode towards the end, because obviously offices close around seven, hopefully, and if people are working from home, so we can actually have some energy consumption in that space already. So all the moves that we've made, and I think um, what Denise's interview mentioned, I think sustainability, top of mind for Cisco, because uh, it's important for our customers and the difference that we want to make in general. To it's actually, I think, prompting us to make our technology smarter as well. So on that piece around the WebEx and a particular product suite actually shutting down when they're not in use, I think implementing that across you know, an office in a hybrid yeah. work strategy is really important. Because why do you need lights um, or you know, different devices on in areas where there are no people? Yeah. And so I think it's fantastic that we're actually taking that view and that we're seeing really good positive benefits um, throughout and you know especially with that AI piece and that, I think that's another dollar in dollar the jar. In the <laughs> <laughs> but I think on that office space as well that's where the uh, Cisco smart spaces is coming into everything mm -hmm. as well really coming to play so yeah it is a it's yeah, very, I think very cool space. The more we talk about it it's just incredible how every piece of technology within Cisco ties down to e ties with each other and then with sustainability and AI like we heard in the keynote as well and every speaker and then probably all the interviews we have coming up later we'll hear more interesting things that everyone has to say. Yeah, and if, if you're just joining us for the first time and you've missed a couple of the sessions earlier in the morning, you're also um, free to actually watch all these videos as a playback on demand on ciscolive.com slash APJC. So in saying that, we're going to start moving into our next innovation talk. I'm really excited to be the fact that we're talking to Vish Iyer, who will be talking about turbocharging transformation with purposeful innovation. So again, that innovation piece is really coming yeah. into that space. So this is your opportunity to fill up your water bottle, get ready, and let's head over to that iTalk. Let's go. In, yeah, let's go. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> Welcome, my friends. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you can figure out, it's day three, and you've got to forgive me for my voice. I think it'll keep getting better as we go along, hopefully. Uh, so look, I'm really excited uh, to be here in front of you to be talking about our purposeful innovation approach and also feature our top innovation examples that can help you turbocharge your transformation journeys. I know this is a small and comfy crowd, but we have a number of people uh, who join us online. So I was thinking, let's make this interactive. So I have one request for all of you to pull your phone and join us on this Slido. I'll just give you a couple of minutes for all of you to log into the Slido. All right. So. Cool, so we're all set now. So look, I think uh, the, each of you uh, are probably working in different verticals from manufacturing to education, and you're on different stages of your own transformation journeys. And I think out here I've plotted what are the five transformation journeys that any digital organization uh, is on. I think during the pandemic, uh, a lot of organizations pivoted to the cloud. And now, given uh, the world economic environment, many organizations are looking at re-optimizing, redefining their cloud strategy. 
to adhere to the data localization and data privacy needs in different countries. So you're seeing a repivot there, especially around the cloud strategy. I think the next area is many of you have a lot of infrastructure around your own network, on-prem, connecting to the cloud. You're really trying to see how do you transform that with software-defined technology, modernize your infrastructure. I think that's the other journey that many of you, many of our customers are on, whether it's from a campus perspective, data center perspective, wide area network perspective, and how do they all work together. I think it will be, I think in a conference like this, I think you will hear the word AI maybe a hundred or thousand times, but I think every organization, including yours, is really looking at the role of AI to improve your customer experience, or how would you use AI uh, to get better insights to run your operations? So I think every customer is on this AI journey, and I think we are just scratched the surface on the art of the possible here. And then I think a front and center theme is around cyber and threats. I think the threat landscape is evolving dramatically, and how do you cope with that? And even there, AI is very, very critical. And I think the last one uh, is, is a very fascinating and an interesting one. I think we were in a pre-pandemic world where everyone worked in the office to everyone working from home to now a very hybrid environment. And one of the real challenges we are seeing is as people come back to work, uh, they expect the same quality of experience they have at home, whether it's around Wi-Fi. Uh, and that entire future of work paradigm is being re-evaluated by organizations to encourage people to come to work and collaborate better. So if you really look at these five journeys from your lens, you'll realize that there is no one platform. There is no one vendor to make all of these things work in the context of your own organization. And it's here that we believe at Cisco that we have a number of technologies, platforms, capabilities to help you manage this. And that's what I really want to talk about. So let's get to the next question, which just to get your sense of, I wanted to put this question uh, from a Slido perspective, uh, just to, an answer on which of those five journeys and you could prioritize the way you want. Okay, I can see 100% of them are on cybersecurity and, and trust. Some of you are on cloud, very good. Network transformation, okay, future of work, AI-driven experiences, awesome. Wow, that's fascinating for me. I think future of work is at the top. I thought cyber would be at the top, but it doesn't matter. So I think the top three or f five themes uh, uh, would vary depending on the organization, the industry, the vertical, and the maturity levels. But I think it's kind of each of you are, I think, on each of these different journeys at different levels of maturity, and that's something that's coming out very clearly. So let me keep moving on. So I think we in Cisco believe that this digital transformation requires a new, modern, and bold approach. Uh, and it requires different stakeholders, technology, the NetOps team, the SecOps team, the DevOps team, the AIOps team, the CTO, the CIO, the CSO, the CFO, the CEO, all of them to come together and work together and break the silos to really deliver on this digital transformation promise. And that's how they rewire their organizations at scale and deploy technology. So given this outside in perspective, I think we in Cisco have also done a rethink on our innovation approach. And this is why I want to look at Cisco. If you look at Cisco for the last 40 years, we built products that delivered the needs and feeds in different industries, and we just depending on the market environment, we dial the features up or down, and we designed it for quality. And that approach worked where we developed a lot of features across a variety of products. But it was during the pandemic that we really made a pivot on should we have a 
hundreds and thousands of features in our boxes for different needs? Or should we really focus on what features our customers are using? And we realize that only 20% of features are used by 80% of our customers. And that's what we really wanted to change and move to a more purposeful innovation approach that was focused on feature adoption, but was based on five core principles. And it's here that I want to table those five core principles. The five core principles are around making our products sustainable from the get-go. How we design our products to the way we retire our products from an, from an energy usage perspective, from a price perspective, performance perspective, packaging perspective. So that's one design principle. The second design principle is around sovereignty. You know, we make a lot of products which are hardware, software, uh, are allowed to work on virtual machines, containers. So how can we make these products as they are cloud delivered, cloud managed, sovereign, be available as local instances in different countries? So that's the second area or a core principle that we have built into every product and every platform that we ship now. The third area is around artificial intelligence is how do we make our products and platforms leverage the data and provide insights for you to take action. So that's the third core principle. The fourth one is what Jitu and Dave spoke about, is about security being incorporated from the get-go into our platforms and leveraging that to improve your posture. And the last one is as we are building products and platforms, we realize that these platforms will be leveraged by cloud providers, service providers, managed service providers. So we need to make them extensible. We need to have APIs to make our infrastructure programmable so that they can talk using that language. So these are the five core principles that we built in building our products. And with that, we are able to deliver these attributes for each of you. We are able to provide products and platforms that are sustainable, that are scalable, that provide you the insights that you need, that are secure from the get-go. And the last one is a very critical one, which is what I call effortless, is actually operating model innovation. How can you operate these platforms uh, and do that in a very simplistic way and connect the different silos in your organization, whether it's NetOps, SecOps, DevOps, and have personas in these platforms to help you deliver the value you need to realize from these platforms. So this is how Cisco is moving from an innovation perspective. So I want to now show you 10 examples of innovation. We have a lot more, but I am going to pick the top 10 of Cisco's purposeful innovation for you to understand how each of them can help you in those five transformation journeys that you spoke about. Each of you had different ones that are important to you. So I'll pick the first one. And this was around AI and ML. I know this seems like a complicated slide, but I think in a very fundamental way, the point I'm trying to make is AI is a compute workload that runs on GPUs. And we continue to be the network platform provider of choice, leveraging Ethernet technology to help you connect to any GPUs, whether it's from NVIDIA, whether it's from AMD, whether it's from Intel, whether you're using memory from Samsung, Micron, SK, Hynix, we can provide you a high-speed, low-latency Ethernet infrastructure to connect your workloads. And we are beginning to see customers in different geographies embrace this architecture at 100 gig level, 400 gig level, and even at 800 gig level for ultra-high-speed ultra converged uh, infrastructure that they are building. So this is how you evolve your AI and ML networks with this Cisco validated design. The next one that I wanted to spend some time was around networking cloud. You know, many of you are big networking franchises of ours. Either you're using the Catalyst Center or you're using Meraki. What we've really done with the Cisco networking cloud is we have a unified networking strategy where we meet you where you are, whether you're on-prem, you're on the cloud, or you are going to be hybrid, and take you on this journey. And the way we have abstracted the journey is we have first provided common hardware 
So all the hardware, whether it's switches, routers, wireless access points, now support either of these oper either three of these operating models. And then we have the same set of capabilities, whether it's around AI, ML, across all of these different domains. And we've enabled a number of capabilities around identity, policy, visibility, across both our security and networking domains, across these platforms. So the point we are trying to make here is, regardless of which product or platform you use, we are protecting your investment and taking you on this journey to the operating model of your choice. And that's what the networking cloud will allow you to do. So it's the ability to deliver simplified experiences based on the operating model of your choice. So it's an integrated platform for on-prem cloud or hybrid. So you, whether you're running a campus infrastructure, a wireless infrastructure, an IT infrastructure, an OT infrastructure, you can choose to leverage the Cisco networking cloud to operate it in the way you desire. Changing gears, I think security is a top of mind theme for every customer. And what we've done here is I know you, you heard Jitu and Dave in the keynote talk about the AI security cloud. Think of this as a platform that delivers sets of capabilities for you from regardless of where you are. So essentially the point we are trying to make here with the security cloud is there are three different elements of the security cloud. So in today's context, I spoke about a hybrid world that we live in. The whole context is distributed. Hybrid users from their home, from their office, from their cafes, connecting to apps which are again distributed in a very hybrid environment. So the real challenge for organizations is how do you implement a zero trust policy that follows the user, regardless from where he accesses those applications. And that's what the AI security cloud will allow you to do by having these three modules around user protection. So when a user connects to an app or a user connects to another user, you can have common identity, you can have common policy. When an app talks to another app, it talks on VPCs in this cloud-first world. So we can have a cloud protection suite to meet that requirement. And then I think the underlying area, the third area, is around breach protection, is how do you detect your threats? How can you detect anomalous behavior, malicious behavior, and figure out whether it's from a network detected response to your extended threat detection response, which Ambika will speak about. These are the capabilities that we bring to you. We are also infusing AI into this platform to simplify the SecOps experience, whether it's around firewall use cases and a variety of others that we will develop as we go along. So the key point I want to make here is we will be able to deliver a zero trust outcome for you. And it's one experience, regardless of how, from where the user accesses it. Changing gears, I think I've spoken a number of domains, whether it's the networking domain, the, the AI workload domain, the security domain, really want to talk about how security and networking are coming together. And this is where Cisco's core value proposition as a vendor arises because we believe the network is the enforcer for policy and it is the bridge between different worlds. So what we've really done here with the secure networking approach is we are connecting the security cloud and the networking cloud across these five parameters. So what we're really doing is Take identity and policy. We, we have, and many of you would be customers here in Australia for our identity services engine, which, which is the policy engine to define which user accesses what, when, where, and how. ICE will natively integrate with SSE to provide you a, a policy 
that works across the breadth of your enterprise. Just to give you an example, we have a large financial customer uh, in Asia where we are now able to define a policy that the folks who run the payment system and they do billions of transactions on a per day basis will only access those apps from three floors in three offices across the country where they run a 24 by 7 operation. These are the kind of capabilities we can enable with identity and policy. The next one is around secure branch, whether it's a leveraging Viptela or whether it's leveraging Meraki, we can have a secure branch use case that talks to the cloud security components and the networking components to deliver that experience for the end user, whether he's working from the office or whether he's working from the home. We have the cloud protection suite. This is a wonderful new capability for app-to-app -app communication where we can design policies without having to use IP addresses. I think we have migrated our threat response stealth watch to an XDR framework. And I think the last area where we are really innovating a lot is in the MSP platform. I think many customers want to abstract this or consume these services through managed service providers. And it's here that we are able to connect the better together of the security cloud and the networking cloud together. And I think one of the biggest differences here is we are able to do this across all the three operating models, whether it's on-prem, whether it's on the cloud, or combinations thereof. And this is our unique differentiation to deliver a secure networking strategy in a hybrid world. We reduce risk, we enhance your experience, and we are able to provide that end-to-end -end visibility that you absolutely need. I think... I know Ambika will talk more about our XDR strategy, but this is our innovation to tackle the pressing challenges in the SecOps space. And we have a number of capabilities around AI that we are bringing here. And I think we're really excited about having the telemetry to have a better experience for our customers. So these are the five innovations I spoke about I think it's time for me to slide into a Slido again and to just get your sense on which of these five innovations you think is most relevant to you. Secure networking, interesting. <clears throat> networking cloud, security cloud, XDR. All right, thank you. Okay, changing gears, I'm going to go to a slightly different topic, which is around silicons and optics. You know, a completely different world. So if you really look at the most uh, carrier class infrastructure, whether it's in the service provider world, whether it's in the data center world, whether it's in the high-end enterprise world, you had two domains. You had a routing domain and you had an optical domain. And what Cisco has done with the acquisition of various companies here from Acacia to Luxterra, uh, to Liba, we are now able to collapse the routing domain and the optical domain into one, one platform. With that, you're able to provide the same set of capabilities that you otherwise needed transponders in optical layers to talk to the IP infrastructure. And because of convergence of the IP and the optical layer, you're able to provide higher speeds and more importantly, we're able to do all of this with significant less power consumption, space consumption, and you're able to have a faster ROI on your investment. So just imagine if you're connecting data centers or you're connecting cities, we can now run this infrastructure at 800 gig and pluggable optics on the router. If you look at the world 10 years back, the router port was a bulk of the cost and the optical port was an SFP, it was maybe 10% of the cost. But if you look at with routed optical networking, you're able to bring the optical capabilities right inside the router port with pluggable optics and coherent optics. And you can run this at very long distances. I think just in Australia, we have one provider running over a thousand kilometers 
with a routed optical network. So I think this is an innovation that you're going to see convergence happening around the route, the routing and the optical teams. You'll have one team in service providers as well as customers, and these capabilities over time would come inside even the SD-WAN routers and the that you would deploy in your branches for higher speed. I think the other area where I am really interested and I see a lot of action is around private 5G. This is, to just give you an example, today Cisco powers close to 220 million connected cars. Where it's, if you really look at, if you go and buy a car from a German manufacturer or an American manufacturer like Tesla, it gets comes inbuilt with a, a 5G experience which we manage and operate for these providers. We are beginning to see the same thing getting applied with smart meters, fleets, vehicles, warehouses, distribution. Anything that can be connected needs to be managed and managed securely. And this is our platform of choice for enabling that form of experience uh, so you will see many, we are working closely with different operators here, including Telstra, to offer these capabilities for enterprises to look at their specific use case and abstract them with a 5G managed service capability to deliver the outcome that you need. And I think these are the various components that get applied when you deliver that as a solution. Okay, this is a very different area where Cisco has been focused in the last two to three years, which is around full stack observability. Full stack observability is, we spoke about multi-domain, this is actually cross-domain. So with full stack observability, I want to give you a single pane of glass across your different operations, whether it's cloud operations, network operations, security operations, your AI workloads, and using an open telemetry framework, we want to help you correlate across these different domains. So just to give you an example, like we have a manufacturing organization running SAP. We are now able to integrate SAP with Thousand Eyes to tell you the quality of the experience for users across the organization. So you're beginning to see native integrations between different layers, the SecOps, the DevOps, the NetOps, to give you a business outcome. And that's what we are doing here with full stack observability. And this Splunk acquisition actually fits into this framework. So for, I think as Cisco, we are a great networking company. But for us to be a great networking company, you need to be a great security company. For us to be a great security company, you need to have great AI. For us to have great AI, we need great data. And this is how all of those different pieces come together in our strategy to provide you a platform to think through the different domains of your organization. Changing gears, I'm going to spend a little bit of time because future of work was such an important carabout for you. And it's here that I wanted to sh talk about the innovation. I think it's in this space. When we started in the start of the pandemic, the WebEx platform was behind. But if you really look at where we are today, we are way ahead. Microsoft Teams works best on a WebEx platform. So whether it's from a hardware perspective, we have all of the smarts that you need uh, to interoperate seamlessly with Microsoft, Google, Zoom. We have a number of... of capabilities around audio and video that we have been built in our boards. And it's, I think one of the best decisions that the WebEx team made is to include an NVIDIA chip in every WebEx board because of which we are able to enable so much AI capabilities like facial recognition uh, and a number of other things that we have now launched. And I'm sure you saw a number of AI assistant capabilities like catch me, super resolution, smart lighting, meeting summaries that G2 unveiled on this platform. So the point I'm trying to make here is both from a platform perspective, video experience perspective, audio experience perspective, we have brought a lot of innovations. And I think the one that I'm really happy to see is as people come back to work, we've built a number of sensors inside these WebEx boards to completely differentiate 
the office experience around collaboration. So I think this is an area where I would really urge you to relook what you've been doing, because there are so many meeting rooms that need to have these capabilities in your offices. And when you have that, there will be more people who the office can actually become the magnet for you to come home. The last one that I want to talk about is sustainability. This is a near and dear topic for me. Obviously, we've built products that can provide you higher performance with lower energy consumption, but that's not where it ends. We are now beginning to see organizations redesign their offices, their buildings, like we've seen Telstra here do a wonderful video, which Iskara plays out on how they are leveraging sustainability with Cisco and modernizing their infrastructure. I have wonderful examples of airports where we have completely transformed that industry, which had five parallel networks into one network which is making the airports a smart technology hub with no paper. And we are able to completely run a facial biometric system where check-in times have been reduced for passengers by 10 minutes. And we are able to turn around aircrafts by 15 minutes. And these are airports that support 60 and 100 million people annually. So this, we are seeing industry after industry completely embracing sustainability because it's the right thing from a planet perspective and you will see a number of capabilities that Cisco has done around sustainability. So I'm coming to the last stretch of my presentation. These were top 10 examples I know of all the different innovations across the portfolio that we have brought to life. Uh, look, it's really about bringing all the different teams across these different innovations and I think I want to go to a slido. Now, I know we spoke about a number of them, but which new innovation will you consider implementing with Cisco? Networking cloud, secure networking, private 5G, transforming workspaces. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, with that, I'll come to the last slide of my session. Come back to the same point, that digital transformation requires a new and modern approach across all your stakeholders to deploy this tech at scale. And I think we in Cisco will be very happy to partner with each one of you on your transformation journey of choice and leverage many of these innovations that we are building with you. So thank you so much for your time. Okay, welcome back to the World of Solutions. Uh, for the next section of the tour, we're here in the security stand looking at securing the enterprise. So really, security end-to-end -end, uh, across an organisation and what it takes to create that environment. I'm joined by Jamie Watts. Jamie, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you very much. Um, so, to kick things off, clearly, you know, in this new evolving digital landscape that we're living in, um, you know, the need for a robust cyber security solution, especially for remote work, is more yep. important than, than ever. Um, so how does our Cisco Secure Access uh, solution sort of work in this environment and sort of provide that ability to secure the remote worker of, the, of today? Yeah, sure. So, you know, as, as you know, we at Cisco, we've been um, helping to facilitate secure remote working for, for quite some time, right? Um, but one of the biggest uh, dangers of, you know, establishing a, a, a secure remote work practice for a business is complexity, right? You have so many different security tools in an environment. Each of these need to be configured independently um, to each other. And until kind of now, there hasn't really been a single cloud-delivered solution that provides a lot of these capabilities from a single single dashboard, right? So even from within Cisco, in the past, we've 
We've delivered a lot of these technologies independently with um, technologies like Cisco Umbrella to deliver um, secure internet access and Cisco AnyConnect and um, you know, the Firepower VPN appliances to do private application access. But these have been separate uh, tools to configure and manage for the administrator. So what we're doing with secure access is delivering all of these capabilities to provide security end-to-end -end for those users connecting to applications, no matter where those applications are, um, from a single, single tool and a single technology, right? And this is really the direction that we're seeing the industry going. Um, and so we're really happy to, to deliver this capability with secure access. Um, it's probably best that I show you a demo to, to, to see you know, what, what it really looks like. Absolutely. As we say, demos tell a thousand yeah. words. So take us through a demo. Awesome. All right, so we can see here we've got the, um, the dashboard and one of the, the key driving factors of C Cisco Secure Access is a unified policy engine, right? So I mentioned in the past, we've delivered a lot of these technologies independent of each other. So we have uh, Cisco Umbrella for secure internet access. Um, you know, we have remote access VPN technologies and each of these have to have individual policy sets to define what um, applications or assets in an environment a user can have access to. So it's really, really powerful to have these configured in the same place so you really get um, you know, a nice high level overview of exactly what users can have access to what applications. Because at the end of the day, these users are the same users no matter what application they're accessing. So we can see here that um, we have a specific rule for private application access, right? So we can see that we have um, you know, some source of traffic in our environment. Now these could be um, you know, active directory users or specific assets um, in our environment. We can see here uh, Jonathan Kunda, right? Um, and we're defining a policy that allows him access to a specific grouping of resources within our environment. So a secure access data center resource group um, is what we have here. Now a resource group can be um, any number of things, right? But it is essentially a grouping of uh, applications that you would commonly uh, need to define a policy for a specific group of users. So if we click through here um, and take a look at this resource group, we can see that we have a couple of different applications here. We've got Jira, we've got Portainer, Container Management System, um, and we can actually add in an application and it will take effect um, to all of our existing policies um, in near real time, right? So in this particular use case, um, we want to facilitate access to the Postgres database um, for our kind of uh, IT administrator users, right? And we can see we've clicked that, um, we've added it to the resource group, and when we actually go to the environment here, there's no waiting around for this policy to propagate throughout the environment, right? Um, so it's enforced at the local point of presence for secure access, um, but that user experience is really you know, in near real time. They can access their database um, and they don't have to kind of sit and wait for maybe that you know, ticket to resolve with IT before they can do their work, which is, which is the most important thing that we're trying to um, allow our users to do here, right? And the way that we actually allow this is through the Cisco Secure Client. So once again, it's the same client that provides our traditional um, remote access VPN with our firepower and our ASA firewalls, but we're actually delivering that out of the cloud with secure access. We also have the capability to do what's called zero trust network access. Now, zero trust network access is the more modern approach to facilitating private application access, and it's one of the core features of, uh, of Cisco Secure Access. So, Jamie, that's really interesting. Um, I noticed you talked about zero trust there just at the end. Perhaps you know you could explain more about how that applies to secure access, and really how organisations can use that to sort of provide that secure remote security for their um, employees. Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. So if you, if you kind of think about the traditional method of providing uh, access to private applications for, let's say, users working from home, right? Um, traditionally, that would be done with a, a full tunnel VPN um, from some kind of VPN client, say, AnyConnect. Um, but the, the kind of issue with that approach is that uh, it has a very limited... Um, capability to do things like posture checking and compliance checks of that user's device to, to make sure that they are, you know, who they say they are and that their status hasn't changed um, during the duration that they've connected to that VPN, right? So you really only have the chance to do that, those kinds of checks at authentication time to the VPN client, right? Um, a more zero trust approach is through something called the, the zero trust network access module of AnyConnect. 
And what that actually does is essentially proxies um, every single request for a private application um, over this new architecture that we've designed for Cisco Secure Access. So there's absolutely no VPN tunnels um, involved. The benefit of that is that you can do those um, posture checks and those compliance checks at every single request for a private application. So if a user is sitting at home um, and connects up to say the Postgres database and then changes their location to you know, down at the cafe shop, we have the ability to um, kind of change the level of access because we've detected a change in environment. Awesome. So let me show you what this looks like, right? And we saw a little, this, uh, a little bit uh, of this before when we defined a resource group for our application um, uh, configured, right? But what actually is an application when it comes to private resources, right? And that can be any number of things, and it's really, really flexible how you define this in your environment. So we can see here that when we define a address for our resource, we can put in a single IP address, we can put in an FQDN, we can even put a whole site range to provide essentially subnet level access to applications that may be running on you know, multiple IP addresses, multiple ports, things like that. Now this uh, connectivity backed like resource connectors which provide a inside out connectivity into those environments um, which really aligns well with those zero trust models. Um, and we can kind of see down here, we're actually defining how users are going to access those applications um, at the application layer. So we can enable it for client-based zero trust access with that module I spoke about earlier. We can enable it for VPN access, so this is more for legacy applications that may need additional compatibility um, kind of constraints. And we can also enable it for clientless access um, as well for people like contractors trying to access web-based applications. Um, and once we've defined that application and defined the, the methods of access that are compatible, we can of course group them together into like-minded applications. Um, so in this particular example where I've configured the VS Code server, I can add this to my existing resource group um, for my data center applications. And then all of my existing users and existing policies that use that resource group um, will have access to that application straight away, right? Um, so really, really easy. But in this particular case, um, you know, let's say I want to facilitate access to users that aren't in this uh, subset of users that I've defined here, right? So they're not part of the engineering team, but I want to provide them access to um, this web application, so, so the, the VS Code server web application, um, but I don't want to give them access to the network or some large part of the network, right? And traditionally, this would be quite a difficult task because you'd have to you know, log into your um, remote access appliance, configure some ACLs, some policies, um, and, and define them for specific users or specific groups. But what I can actually do is I can go in here, I can configure a specific rule for access for, say, contractors to that individual application. And then from this configuration, I can actually define how they're going to access it for this specific group of users. So. Um, Obviously here we have kind of contractors that we want to allow uh, web-based zero trust access. So that's um, what we call clientless access. So there's no thick client um, on those users' devices. So we can use things like BYOD as an example. Um, but it's really, really easy to configure this and all of the policies get pushed out for all of the different uh, user groups no matter kind of who they are, right? Here we have the ability to actually define um, IPS rules for this specific policy. Now this is the full Snort3 IPS engine um, in play here. So it's not some you know, watered down version of an IPS engine. It's a full fledged Snort um, IPS engine that we can define there. But we can define different IPS profiles for each individual rule. So if we have um, you know, contractor access, we might want to elevate uh, that security for those contractors, right? And we can see here that um, it's as easy as that to, to enforce that rule. So, Jamie, fantastic demo, very comprehensive. A couple of things I took away from that. How simple it was to, to sort of do some fairly complex tasks of allowing access or not allowing access, and the fact that it was pretty much near real time in terms yeah. of once, once it's set, you don't have to wait for it to sort of deploy across the network and, and you know, spend time wondering whether or not it's active for someone there. Um, the other thing I took away was clearly Cisco Secure Access is more than just security. Yep. Um, you know, it's kind of a, a user experience and a 
productivity tool in, in, in what it can achieve there. So, you know, maybe you can sort of elaborate on that a little bit more, sort of moving away from the security bit into sort of how it impacts the experience of people using secure access in a business environment. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, I mean, one of the, the key driving factors behind, well, I guess the key pushbacks behind any kind of security change in an organization is, okay, well, is this going to affect my, my business at all, right? Is this going to affect the level of access that my employees have to the things that they need um, to access to do their job, right? And inevitably, when you start to lock an environment down more and more, um, as a lot of organizations are doing, um, you're going to encounter times where people can't access maybe tools that they are used to access, right? Or maybe they're experiencing some slowdown in inside of their normal day-to-day -day activities, and because there's been a recent change to the security um, kind of policies of the of the organization, they start, you know, pointing their fingers at IT and saying, you know, something's broken, you know, give me access, et cetera, right? And at the end of the day, it just makes them less productive and, you know, um, the business suffers as a result. So one of the things that Secure Access does is makes it much, much simpler for obviously the IT um, administrator, as I've kind of shown you with that, the, the ease of the policy, but also for that end user to help them self-diagnose and self-remediate any potential issues that they might have um, through the help of Thousand Eyes, right? So we actually have embedded um, a subset of the Thousand Eyes capability into the secure client um, to provide that user digital experience monitoring, right? So um, as an example, if they're trying to access an application and they're experiencing some kind of slowdown, will help them to self-diagnose why exactly that might be happening so that it you know, isn't necessarily IT's fault or the security administrator's fault, right? So I can maybe show you what that looks like. Yeah, again, please do. Yeah, let's have a look at the demo. Cool, so we can see here, um, you know, use case of an individual user going to box.com, right? And we can see that it's, it's a little bit slow to load, um, you know, whether this is just a timeout issue or it's being blocked entirely, um, you know, not quite sure here, but the user actually experiences a pop-up to say, hey, your Wi-Fi signal is low, right? Um, this, the, your experience is going to be degraded because of this. And this could be uh, because of a Wi-Fi signal issue, it could be high CPU utilization, um, memory, et cetera, right? And it will actually give them the steps to self-remediate this issue, so say, um, connect to the 2.4 gigahertz band instead of the 5 gigahertz um, SSID, right? And when they do that, bang, their internet connectivity is, is um, you know, improved, they access box.com and, you know, they don't need to raise that service ticket um, and they can get straight to work, right? And the reason we can do this is because secure access is sitting in the path between the user and the application. So not only is it providing that security of, you know, what can that user access, but um, it's providing that kind of monitoring aspect of, okay, well, is this end user experience what we as an organization expect it should be, right? And help the, the IT administrators um, help to elevate that over time. All right, Richard, so that really brings me to the end of uh, what I wanted to show you today. But, um, you know, I hope you got a few things out of the demos. Uh, if there's probably three things I want you to take away, it's probably simplicity, um, simplicity, and security. So, <laughs> and I hope that you've seen that, you know, we're, we're making this as easy as possible to help deliver end-to-end -end security for the users um, when it comes to accessing applications wherever they are. Fantastic, I would agree with that. You made it look so simple. So thank you, Jamie, for, for spending time with us on the broadcast. No worries. Thanks a lot. All right, so that brings us to the end of the Secure Enterprise segment. Uh, when we come back next time, we'll be moving to a completely different area, looking at reimagining applications. So heading off to the AppDynamics stand to, to see what we can do around uh, application improvement. What I wanted to do with that time is accomplish two things. One, I wanted to give you a really good feel for what we're doing in security, what our vision is, what our strategy is, and some of the products that we've recently released that are really quite powerful. And the other thing I wanted to do is we've had some exciting news that we've brought to the show, and I'm going to invite DJ Sampa to join me in a little bit so that we can dive deep into that and show you, not just tell you about what we're doing in security. So with that, let's get started. For as long as I've been in security, the security industry has pretty much worked the same way. 
every time there's a new threat that comes up, a small cluster of companies pop up to address it. And honestly, if you look at it in a focused way, these solutions are pretty good. They get the job done. But the issue with this really is that it puts the burden on you as a customer to integrate all of these point solutions to get to the security outcomes that you're looking for. And that's quite a burden because when you think about it, you might have 50, 100. It's not unknown for us to speak to customers that might even say they have 150 to 200 security solutions. And this problem actually gets more complex as you go on your multi-cloud journey. Because now you've got cloud service providers that all have native security controls that are built into their infrastructures. And again, it's not really about who's are better, who's are worse. It's really the fact that these controls are all different. And again, the burden is on you to stitch these controls together to get to that uniform security posture that you aspire to. So what is our vision at Cisco? Well, our vision is to fundamentally change that with the Cisco Security Cloud. So what the Cisco Security Cloud is doing is it's abstracting those security controls from the underlying infrastructure, and it's giving you a unified view. So you get one set of policies, one set of controls, a single UI, and perhaps most importantly, common telemetry that cuts across all of these environments. Now, there's one important point that I want to make here, and that is we are not really trying to be all things to everyone in the security area with the Cisco Security Cloud. Our focus is really on where security meets the network. So it's everything from when a user touches the network all the way through to an application accessing data. That's where we are playing. So double-clicking on the Cisco Security Cloud, and you've heard this at the keynote this morning, you've heard it a couple of times, there are really three areas that we are focused on. One is user protection, the other is cloud protection, and then breach protection that touches both. So it gains telemetry from both cloud and user, but also provides intelligence to those. So underneath all of this, then we've got the firewall, and that is foundational to everything we do. Now, let's dive into user protection so I can actually show you what I mean by what we are doing with the cloud uh, protection stuff that we are offering and the security cloud that we put together, because it's really not about individual solutions. It's about a system of systems. It's how do we integrate these piece parts so that we are able to deliver outcomes that are really strong for you. All right, so moving into user protection. Imagine if I wanted a glass of water and I walk up to a water cooler and I'm asked, hey, Ambika, how do you want this water delivered to you? Do you want a PVC pipe? Do you want a copper pipe, an iron pipe, or a steel pipe? That would be completely unthinkable. And yet, this is what we are expecting enterprise users to think about. We need to know whether our application lives behind a VPN or it lives behind a zero trust gateway or there's a different way to connect if it's a SaaS application and perhaps a completely different way if it's direct internet access. That makes no sense. So earlier this year, we released a set of capabilities we call the Cisco Security, uh, sorry, Cisco Secure Access. And what this does is it takes traditional VPN and zero trust and brings it into a single solution that gives seamless access to all applications. It doesn't really matter if you have campus-based access or it's remote access. It doesn't matter whether it's a traditional application or a modern application. The access is completely seamless. And if I were to show you a demo of this, it would probably be the world's most boring demo because what you'd see is Step one, the user boots up their laptop and authenticates. Step two, they're able to connect to the applications that they want to go to, that they are authorized to use, and that's it. Now, underneath the cover, we are doing a lot of work, and we're doing it automatically. What we are doing is we are figuring out 
that this application sits behind a VPN gateway, so we need to set up a VPN connection. Or this other application sits behind a zero trust gateway, and so we need to set up an HTTP connection. But that's plumbing. And at Cisco, we're really good at getting that plumbing right. So we are able to automatically redirect the traffic so it goes and makes the right connection on the right pipe. Now, this is actually really important when you take a look at how things have really developed in the enterprise. A lot of applications that you're using today, in the hundreds, maybe even thousands, were built at a time when things were quite different. They were built at a time where the network had a very clear trust boundary. This is where your DMZ is. This is where firewalls sit in your DMZ. And if you're behind that trust boundary, you can pretty much access all the applications. But the issue that you start to have is now you're moving to zero trust. And with zero trust, the rules are changing a little bit. It's really more about more granular controls so that sales can only access the sales applications and dev can only access dev applications and you can't get sales into dev's area or the other way around. Now, when you start to do this, you need these applications to be able to speak to a gateway or a connector because that's what sits between the user and the application and makes the determination whether it's okay for this user to actually access this application. But a lot of these applications weren't built to do that, and it's not a modification that you can make easily. So when we speak to customers, what we find is everybody's got a zero-trust project, but they still are running VPN. So by blending VPN and zero trust together, we are able to make this experience seamless. And as IT moves applications from one environment to the other, the user experience stays the same. It doesn't change at all. Now, we really care about the user experience. And so we don't just stop here. When it comes to authenticating the user, we're using common sense controls here. So if I'm on campus and I authenticate, I can pretty much access the app I want to, but I can also access all the other apps I'm authorized to without having to authenticate again. If nothing has changed, why would we keep badgering a user to authenticate periodically? Now, if I shut my laptop and I walk across the street and go to a cafe and I boot it up again, we can automatically detect that the network has changed. And we actually do this in a privacy-preserving way, not using things like GPS fragments. And at this point, this would trigger another uh, re-authentication, and that makes sense because I'm on a different network. So again, it's common sense controls that really think about maintaining a great user experience because our purpose is to frustrate the attackers and not the users. Now, taking this to the next step, we also have a global network of points of presence that allow us to bring these controls close to where the users are so we can maintain a great internet experience. And we don't just say that this is something we aspire to. We've taken thousand eyes and integrated it so we can actually measure this user experience. And if there's a problem, we are able to very quickly pinpoint where that problem is and get that remediated. So pulling the lens back on all of this, everything I've described so far as part of secure access belongs within the user protection suite. The user protection suite has capabilities that go beyond what I've described. But again, we are not giving you point solutions. We are doing the integrations to make sure that we're giving you security solutions that allow you to get to the security outcomes that you're looking for. And we hope by doing this, we end up redefining what your expectation should be from the security products that you have. So moving beyond user protection, let's talk a little bit about cloud protection. I just talked about zero trust or least privilege access for a user accessing an application. But the same thing applies when you have app-to-app -app access. So let's talk about this in a bit of detail. If 
a marketing team goes and takes, um, let's say, analytics application and puts it up on AWS. And that application at some point needs to speak to a customer database on-prem. Today, what you're probably doing is opening up a direct connect connection and allowing that access to happen. But here's the rub. If there's a vulnerability in that application that's sitting up on Amazon, you've just created a pathway for the attacker to be able to reach all the way into your private cloud and pretty much have free run. That, that isn't zero trust. That isn't least privilege. In fact, it violates all of those principles. So what you really want is granular controls, but the issue with putting those controls in place is in your private cloud, the currency is really IP addresses, but in the public cloud arena, it's about services. That application is probably using S3 buckets, Redshift, Lambda, and the notion of IP addresses is not really prevalent. So what you need is something that can act as a broker between those two. So we've built a solution called multi-cloud defense that has the ability to understand both sides and help put granular policies in place that can actually give you that zero trust, least privileged access. And I'm sure all of you are using at least one cloud, if not more. And if you're doing that, this is probably something that you want to start considering using almost immediately because there's no way that applications live siloed for a long time only in one cloud. They do need to move from cloud to cloud for different accesses, access that they need, and this is a big security problem. And the other thing I just want to say as I close here is, this is not just on Amazon, right? So these capabilities would work the same if it was Google, it was Azure, it cuts across all of those different environments. So again, the multi-cloud capabilities that I've just talked about, the multi-cloud defense capabilities are part of a cloud protection suite. And in a cloud protection suite, we obviously have many more capabilities. But again, as you can see, we're not talking about point products here. There's several products and capabilities coming into play to deliver these outcomes. All right, so with that, let's go to the third area, which is breach protection. So within breach protection, one of the capabilities we've launched is XDR, Extended Detection and Response. Now, you heard Vish say this earlier, you heard this in the keynote, I'll repeat it. You can have the best AI, you can have the best analytics, but if you don't have the data, those analytics and AI are pretty useless because if you can't see it, you can't stop it. And when it comes to data, the depth of the data, the breadth of the data, and the accuracy of that data really, really matter. Now, at Cisco, we have many control points. So we are able to get telemetry from all of these control points. And a lot of that telemetry for us is native telemetry. So we get it at a level of granularity that it's not just a big clues, but we can even look for the smallest clues and the smallest signals, and then we're able to stitch them across all these control points. A typical attack still starts with phishing or some social engineering on a chat channel. And those phishing attacks are getting better because the generative AI and all those typos are disappearing. They're gonna be targeted more to a population of one increasingly. So, you know, I might get an email that is referencing the barbecue that I was at yesterday. So it's gonna become harder for me to detect them. Most of these emails come with a URL in them. That URL might point to a photo sharing site suggesting that photographs from the barbecue are up there, but it may not even be a real photo sharing site. So I need intelligence on web traffic, on web reputation, on DNS to be able to tell friend from foe. And then that might lead me to download some malware and that malware might spawn a process, it might spawn a PowerShell, and then spawn some processes that lead to the lateral movement where the real danger within the network starts. So our ability to see telemetry from all of these places and stitch it together allows us to provide really strong XDR-based defenses. Now, we don't stop there. 
XTR is extended detection and response. We've tacked on another R there for recovery. And this is really, really powerful because not everyone can do this. You've got to be an infrastructure player. So we get a lot of intelligence from the security events we see, 550 billion events. There's AI in the mix. There are threat researchers in the mix. But once we get that signal, we're able to take action that allows us to contain any damage that might still persist. Because no matter what you do, no matter how strong your defenses are, there is probably a good chance that an attacker might at some point get through. So let's take this scenario for a moment. Something happens on an endpoint that looks suspicious, but it's in the gray zone. I don't know for certain if this is something that is malicious and I don't want to disrupt my infrastructure without having some certainty around it. So what I can do is I can take a just-in-time snapshot of the application that it's trying to connect to and hold that snapshot. If that connection is made and nothing bad happens, I can just toss that snapshot. But if that connection is made and the app gets infected, now I have a snapshot that I took barely seconds ago that I can use to recover from. So in a way, I've managed to contain the damage, contain the threat, and be able to recover from it and ensure business continuity in a really powerful way. Again, it takes a company like Cisco, a company that can control the network, is an infrastructure company to be able to deliver an outcome of this kind. So just to wrap this up, these capabilities are part of a breach protection suite. And breach protection, user protection, and cloud protection are all part of the Cisco Security Cloud. So what I want to do here is switch gears and move into some of the announcements that we're bringing to Cisco Live Melbourne that are actually really compelling, and they're all tied to AI. And for that, I'd like to ask DJ Sampat, who's a VP of Product for Artificial Intelligence, to join me here. Hey, DJ. So good to see you. Good to see you. So, DJ, before we get started here, I just want to start with you introducing yourself so people sort of get a sense of your credentials in AI and what you've been up to in the space till you joined Cisco. All right, awesome. Well, uh, thanks everybody for being here. I'm DJ Sampat. Um, very recently, I was a co-founder and CEO of Armablox, an email security company that was acquired by Cisco. And uh, as part of Armablox, one of the things that we did was we um, used state-of-the-art, you know, uh, generative pre-trained transformers or GPT and chat GPT um, way back in 2018 to be able to analyze 40 billion objects, you know, uh, over 5 billion emails on a monthly basis. So we have a, a team that deeply understands what it means to build an AI product and what it means to use large language models to be able to do it. And a team that's growing really fast right now. Absolutely. Right? Yes. So before we go into announcements, one more thing, DJ. Could we talk a little bit about how we are approaching AI and what a strategy around this is? Absolutely. Uh, and I think you might have heard a little bit of this at the keynote and, um, and, and, and the messaging across the board. Uh, we sort of look at this you know, um, uh, in a, in a, as a three-pronged approach, right? Um, what you're seeing up on the screen here is assist, augment, and automate. Now, when it comes to being able to deliver um, really interesting experiences to the user, there's a fundamental shift that AI is bringing you can now use natural language to be able to interact with complex systems like a security platform. And that's really what's happening with the assist point of view. We're assisting the IT admins and the SOC analysts to be able to perform their jobs a lot easier. With Augment, we're basically bringing in machine-scale intelligence and insights to human capabilities. We're augmenting what an analyst can do from a detection perspective by correlating 550 billion signals that are coming in every single day from the Talos intelligence services. Last but not the least, with Automate, we're able to take those actions, those mundane steps that each and every single analyst has to perform over and over again, we're automating that away. So assist, augment, and automate. Those are our three pillars. So let's start with assist. So one of the big announcements we have here is 
we are introducing the Cisco AI Assistant for security. And with that, I'm actually going to give you control here because you're going to show folks what we're actually doing here. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yes, and this is a big announcement. You know, you heard this at the keynote. We're launching our AI Assistant for security, and we're focusing particularly on firewalls as part of this launch. Now, when we went out and talked to our firewall customers, we learned from them that you know, visibility of policies is incredibly hard. You know, uh, some of these customers have you know, thousands, tens of thousands, and even millions of rules configured inside of the environment. I think um, it was referred to the, uh, the keynote jokingly that you know, uh, some of the policies that were deployed by the IT admins were, was so long ago that you know, their kids have now you know, graduated from college. That's how long it has been since you've made any changes to the policy, because it's hard. Troubleshooting is, again, very hard. If you had to get into the firewall and be able to do any changes, you sort of have to understand how, you know, what are the step-by-step -step instructions that you need to be able to do it. Now, with this AI assistant, we're changing all of that. You will now have a very simple interface, a text-based interface that looks a lot like ChatGPT to be able to go out there and simply say, in English language, that I need to update our firewall policy. What policies are controlling the access to the sales application? What the assistant does is it goes back, looks at the policy store, and comes back with a response in a nice tabular format. It tells you exactly what the policies are and what the policy names are and what um, are they doing. Now, you can come back in here and say, hey, let's say, for instance, that you want to be able to block outbound traffic going from one of these applications. You simply have to go to that same bar at the bottom and say, add a rule to block traffic, outbound traffic from this application. And what the assistant does is it goes out, creates that rule, but one very important thing is it does not deploy it. It actually requires the user to look at that policy and decide if the user wants to create that rule or not. Now, this is a really important step because we want to make sure that there are always humans in the loop before you make any changes to the system. Now, and this is not the capabilities of the system. The system could do it automatically, but as we've worked closely with customers, that's not what they're looking for. They want the efficiencies, yeah. but they still want the hands on the wheel. You're spot on, right? I think that's exactly right. And, I, and this is something that we learned from our customers. We went out and we asked them, hey, what would you, how would you like this? And, and, and we basically built it based off of their feedback. Yep. Now, um, here's where, as soon as you go ahead and say, yes, that's, you, know, you want to go out and deploy it, you will see that it comes back with a prompt that says that, you know, congratulations, it's been successfully deployed. Now, sometimes when you're working with the firewall, you know, we, things can get a little bit complicated. Say, for instance, you want to upgrade the firewall. Um, you know, instead of going and searching and looking for documents across the board and doing a bunch of Google searches, you can now come to this assistant and simply ask that question. Hey, can you give me step-by-step -step instructions to upgrade the firewall? Now, it's going to go ahead and draw from a whole lot of different sources, summarize it for you, and give you detailed step-by-step -step instructions. We've made sure that the large language models that we're using does not hallucinate by employing interesting techniques that prevent that from happening. And let's talk about that, too. It's not just giving you those upgrade instructions. It knows and has context for which release and other things that you're not even asking of it, but it's taking that into consideration. That's exactly right. And, um, you know, because it needs to know, you know, based on what context it is to be able to correspondingly give you the right types of response. So it's not just the uh, old search, you know, um, search bars that you've used before or simple notifications that you've seen. It is a lot more intelligent. Yep. Now, you don't always have to start by asking a question. The AI also prompts you. What you're seeing up over here is that it came up with a notification that said, hey, hang on, I've got a notification here for you. When you click into that, what it's doing is it basically is going inside, figuring out what are the policies and the rules that you've actually deployed. It identifies the duplicate ones, the misconfigured ones, and it gives you a nice summary and a snapshot of recommendations of what you can do. Now, this is really interesting. You know, when we, you know, this is something that our customers, they, they're using it today. It's in the hands of our, you know, some of the largest customers that we have, and they're trying it out, and they've come back with a you know, very interesting feedback. We did the math on this. Um, um, one of the interesting pieces that we learned was if you put a human you know, in one of our largest you know, Fortune 500s that's testing this out today, mm -hmm. uh, for a person to sit down 
analyze all of the rules that they have, and they have over you know, several hundred thousands of rules. For that person to do that, it would take them eight and a half years. Wow. And over a million dollars. I actually didn't know about that statistic, but that's <laughs> like, whoa, it brings it home. Exactly, yeah. right? And it takes um, the AI assistant less than eight and a half seconds to be able to accomplish that. All you have to do is, you, you, once you have that, you go click on that button right there, and then it still prompts you. you it still needs a human in the loop to confirm that you do want to you know, delete all of those rules, and that's it. With one click, you're done. Sounds good. So let's move from there, and we'll briefly touch on two other capabilities at least, because what we're really doing with AI is we're making it pervasive in the Cisco security cloud. So it's not limited to one area. So the next thing I want to touch on is what it's helping us do when traffic is encrypted. And that's an increasingly large problem because more and more traffic is encrypted. You could decrypt it, this TLS decryption, but that's considered man in the middle. It's computationally heavy, and it also violates compliance and privacy issues. So what are we helping um, do with AI here? We're doing something really, really cool. Now, with encrypted visibility engine, one of the things that we're doing is we're, we're using some of the latest and greatest in terms of uh, our AI techniques. We're using something called bi-directional um, you know, long short-term memory or bi-directional LSTMs and naive Bayesian classifiers, two different techniques, to be able to understand the behavior of applications even, you know, even when the packet and the conversations that they're having is over encrypted channels. So here's a quick example, right? You get the TLS client hello, and what we're doing is we're, when that client hello comes up, we're using our Talos database where we're constructing all of these signatures to match it against known malicious processes. And as soon as we detect that it is in fact a malware process trying to send a specific type of traffic, we alert, we create an alert. And here's the best part. We don't just provide the visibility. We also have the ability to block that right at the firewall. We recognize the process, the version, the operating system, the client that we're using, and we're able to successfully do this without needing an enforcement point at the endpoint or the client. And not decrypting the traffic at all, which is exactly the way folks want it to be. That's right. So we have a little bit of time left here. I've already talked about ransomware recovery and what we do here, but I didn't want to steal your thunder, so I didn't go into the role that AI plays in XDR to help all of this come together. So tell us how that works. Absolutely. No, thank you. Thank you for... Uh, you know, saving it up for me, uh, I just clicked through there. Um, with ransomware recovery, it's absolutely important to have a remediation action or a response action that is absolutely real time, right? That happens as soon as you see something changing inside of the network, you want to be able to take a remediation step. Now, to do this, one of the things that we're doing is to be able to use large language models to be able to automatically, you know, um, call the right APIs to be able to take that action, to be able to take that snapshot. It's some of the things that we we're referencing. This is basically, when you think about what a SOC analyst does, a SOC analyst has to determine what the next best action is. Yep. What the AI is able to do is it automatically determines what the next best action is and then takes that step. And that's really incredibly cool because what it does from a value perspective, it reduces the amount of time that it takes for an analyst to be able to respond to an attack. So just closing this out, Everything that you and I have both talked about, whether it's a way we are approaching security, system of systems, a platform approach, delivering outcomes, not point products, to how we are leveraging AI uh, from the assist, augment, and automate modes, it's really about ensuring that we are delivering efficiency, high levels of efficacy, but uniquely, we are also massively focused on the experience. And this is something that in the industry we haven't heard a lot of people really focus on. But we believe security should be transparent. We as users that are being protected and assets that are being protected, it shouldn't create friction in the experience we have. So that's what it comes down to then. It's efficiency, efficacy, and very powerful economics, especially in the way we are looking at the suites that we are putting into the market that's right. around user protection, cloud protection, and breach protection. So thank you, everyone, for listening. DJ, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was so a great much. conversation. Right. Thank you. Thanks so much.
こんにちはシスコの二宮です現代のデジタルな世界では私たちの情報は常に脅威にさらされていますサイバー攻撃、不正アクセス、マルウェアこれらの脅威から守るためには様々なセキュリティ製品のログを相関分析することができる XDR ソリューションが有効ですこれは XDR によりアラートログの集約や一元化その上で優先度をつける機能によって重要なアラートから対処可能となるためです。シスコ XDR では、他社のセキュリティ製品のログも合わせて相関分析することができますので、さまざまなお客様環境にフィットしやすいです。シスコ XDR をご利用いただくことで、発生した問題に迅速に対応、管理、修復することができるようになると思います。A hacker doesn't always look like a hacker. A hacker is at home, everywhere. He's interested in everything. He can work alone. But with a crew. So much better. A hacker is free. With Cisco, protecting your business from cyber attackers is simple. If it's connected, you're protected. How have things been at work? Same. And the thing is, is, I've got ideas. Big ideas about products, new revenue streams, <laughs> smarter investments. Right? No, I can't do any of that. I'm like too busy playing whack a mole all day. So it sounds like you need a platform that drastically reduces the amount of confusion caused by <laughs> zillions of analytics tools and focuses the data for you. Exactly. How do you know that? Humans and nature. We're in this together. Yet nature has given and given. It's our turn to do more. Cisco Smart Building Solutions and our partners' technology benefit both humans and nature. Catalyst switches connect securely. Delivering power over Ethernet, reducing costs and greenhouse emissions. Cisco wireless and DNA spaces use intelligent automation, creating efficiencies that help the workplace and the planet. And collaboration tools enable hybrid work, decreasing environmental impact. Sustainability is essential to powering an inclusive future for all. That's why Cisco is committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2040. Between meeting human needs and a sustainable future, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. At Cisco, we see the office as a platform to advance our strategic enterprise goals, including attracting and retaining the best talent. And accelerating our net zero journey. Our new Atlanta location is the most recent example of how we are using space to help realize our goals around people and purpose. Technology provides a new opportunity to transform your workplace into places people want to be. Visit cisco.com slash go slash hybrid workplace. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the studio. We have、uh, some very exciting、uh, s e g m e n t coming up for you now. We actually have、uh, Dave West in the studio with us. So we're going to throw right over to Emerald, who's interviewing with、uh, Dave West right now. Em, over to you. Thank you so much, Dave. Dave to another Dave. Well, welcome to Australia again. Lovely to see you. Have you had a chance to look around at Cisco Live this year? Not yet, but after this, I'm going to the world of solutions. Oh, fantastic. I've hugged a lot of people, so it's been great. Yeah, no, I just have to say, I went on a little walk earlier today, and they've really gone all out. They've actually brought out bubble tea. We've had Chili the dog on our set so far, so I think you're in for a big surprise.、Uh, I mean, I, personally, I think、uh, this is my favorite Cisco Live because、oh. it's so intimate.、Um, you know, everybody connects with everyone here. You get to meet.、Um, 
so many different people, so I love this one. Oh, that's brilliant. Actually, you were a former engineer previously before you were president of APJC. Um, what are you looking most forward to at World of Solutions, or what do you expect is the best part of coming to Cisco Live? It's my hidden secret. Don't give away my uh. superpower. <laughs> So yes, I was an engineer. I, I think I'm still an engineer in my core. Uh, I loved being an engineer. Uh, for me, I love the innovation. Uh, I love innovations that really deliver results for our customers. And so I think, you know, over the years I've sort of matured. I used to just love technology. Put a, a problem in front of me, use technology to solve the problem, it was fantastic. Um, but I think a lot of our capabilities that we're announcing today just makes businesses more productive. Uh, it helps them be successful, and that's what I love about technology, how it helps, how it makes our customers more productive, more secure, allows them to do more to support their customers and their business. No, that's great, and you obviously have the opportunity to speak to so many across the business and across all of our customers as well. You announced a, a really good set of things in our keynote as, uh, later, well, so earlier, <laughs> this morning. Um, I would love to hear your personal thoughts about the announcements that you made and then also what's a really exciting for you there. I thought the AI assistants were very uh, interesting and then to announce that with G2 and he's very excited about the AI assistant and what it can do and I'm excited about it because the security landscape is so complicated. Um, Customers are dealing with so many problems, as I talked about, devices, workloads are moving everywhere, employees are everywhere, customers are everywhere. Our, our security experts within customers, they need help. Uh, and anything that can make sort of the mundane tasks of looking at rule sets and um, exposing flaws in design that can help a customer be more secure uh, I think is absolutely fundamental and, and critical for our customer's success. I, uh, I think they're going to embrace it, uh, and I'm excited to see how they use the technology and, and our generative AI tools to help make them more productive. And, you know, we announced the AI system for WebEx, as we showed as well, uh, at WebEx One, but we, we demoed here because I think many customers probably didn't see it there. I like that as well, because I do think um, to walk away from the meeting and have somebody transcribe it for you, as I said to G2, it, maybe I don't have to go to meetings, I can put somebody in virtually and take notes for me and you know determine what the key themes were and what actions came my way, uh, I think is incredible. And the thing that I'm most proud of is you know we put the goal out in 2016 to positively impact a billion people. And to make that announcement today and have the purpose report come out tonight, uh, that's a lot to be proud of. And you know, our culture around giving back, powering an inclusive future, um, I just think it's, it's, it's an incredible thing. And I think it's a motivator to all of our employees. And people see that they go to a place uh, that's not like a good company, but that wants to make a difference in the world is not just talking about it, but really executing on it and then holding itself accountable to deliver. And so that's what excites me most. Yeah, that's great. And actually, I think that's a common theme that we've seen throughout our interviews as well, especially when it comes to, uh, we spoke to Larissa Horton earlier this morning and she focused on the fact that the user experience is really um, something that they're building into their products and that we're actually, as a company, focused on people. And you know, seeing that that purpose report is coming out this evening, I'm really excited to read that and present that back and, and talk about it a bit tomorrow as well. You spent a lot of time talking to people, and you said before you've spent a lot of your time at Cisco Live hugging people and saying hello. A lot of people wanted to chat to you. Um, but what I really admire is that you spend your time with customers. And so what's the hottest topic that you're talking about with your customers at the moment? <laughs> I mean, there's so many hot topics. I mean, if you're, if you're a customer today, all our customers are talking about AI. They're uh, trying to figure out their path to AI, where it makes sense, where it can enhance their business. But I think my most um, you know, active discussion with our customers is around cybersecurity. Um, 
It's a complicated environment, and although we, we always push them for technology and digitizing and automating, you know, all of those things expose customers if they don't have the right security architecture. And so, uh, no matter what conversation I have, I talk about sustainability, I talk about AI, I talk about automation, I talk about the future of work and redefining workspaces. At the end of the conversation, it always comes back to cybersecurity. What do we do to secure ourselves? How do we make sure that we're secure? What are the new tools? How do you deliver a platform of services? How do you give me visibility to where I'm exposed? How do I deal with attacks when they happen? How do I remediate? Um, how do I go back in time to make sure uh, that, in fact, my infrastructure, my applications, my services are secure and, and I can feel confident that they are? That's a conversation. No matter how much technology, innovation, business outcomes we talk about, if they're not secure, it's really hard to do anything and to feel comf you know, confident to do anything. Um, so I think that's a conversation that I have every time I speak with our customers. And it's regardless of the size of the customer as well, the cybersecurity pieces. Um, obviously paramount to everything that we do. Uh, so in going back to that AI piece and Again, this is a, a dollar into the jar every time we speak about artificial intelligence. I think Dave over there in the studio and I are now absolutely rich. <laughs> um, for businesses that are looking at small, whether they're mid or enterprise, where does AI fit into their strategy and how can they interact with us as Cisco? It, it, it probably fits all, I mean, all over their business. They have to be smart about where they want to use it. Uh, I'm sure you've used generative AI. Have, have you had ChatGPT write a paper for you, answer your questions, give you financial advice? You know, just imagine um, using tools with the right data platform to, um, to feed those tools um, to help answer questions for customers that, imagine you're a small business. You don't have a big, you know, back end supporting you. you don't, have a lot of employees, um, but you still need to be dynamic and responsive to your customers. So why not use AI to be that first line to your customers? What would you like to buy today? What color item would you like to buy today? What size are you? Um, you know, just being able to probe and work with an AI engine to sort of satisfy the needs, maybe even better than a first line person because um, machines can think quicker uh, and sometimes come back and show and demonstrate different things. And so I think it's going to be really important to figure out where it'll work. Uh, the human to machine interaction is going to be incredibly important here. But I do think it's going to help small businesses respond quicker, be more agile, mid market businesses, um, and all the way up to the top tier enterprises. Uh, that will use uh, these engines uh, to power how they interact maybe with their employees, how they interact with their customers, um, how they give themselves insights to how they're doing, how the business is doing, how customer success is going. Uh, I think it's going to be incredibly powerful. And do I think it will change the world? I do. And that's the most exciting part about this AI conversation. It's the fact that it's applicable to so many different organizations of any size. And I know with my customers, the best part is those use cases that you were talking about for all these different industries and actually going deeper into their environment and saying, okay, where can we actually fit this technology and how can we make your processes better? So Dave, this is my last question. Um, and is it going to be an easy one? <laughs> well, I will leave that up to you. <laughs> um, but in the keynote, you actually mentioned that APG, the APJC region um, is full of growth and opportunity. It's a, an area full of um, hungry people who are looking to actually bring that innovation. Mm. So where do you see the APC, APJC region and Cisco evolving together? Well, I think you know, a lot of our innovation, a lot of our capabilities, we talk about things like resiliency, you know, responding quickly to market transitions, I think you have a lot of hungry, growing, developing nations uh, in APJC that are very ambitious. And so um, 
and that ambition sort of breeds throughout the country. And, um, and I think what you're going to see is you're going to see these nations leapfrog others in the world. And they're going to bring solutions and capabilities that will amaze all of us. And I use the example of India all the time. And unless you've been to India, you really don't understand how far along they've come in digitization. In fact, they're one of the most digitized nations in the world. Most people don't think that about India. You can go to any street vendor anywhere in India, um, and they'll show you a QR code that links to into a master payment system and pay them right away through their banking infrastructure. It sounds simple, but there's a tremendous amount of complication and, and uniformity that need to happen across the country. And so I am incredibly excited about this region of the world, not just because I work in this region of the world, but you've seen it as well. Um, people want to aspire to greater things, greater things for themselves, their families, and the generations to come. They're hungry. They're hungry to drive success and, uh, and achieve goals. And I think that sort of breeds success. And I believe sort of that is the mantra across APJC. Yeah, and it's great that we can actually bring those conversations and connect people here at events such as Cisco Live. So thank you so much. It's always oh. a pleasure to have you on our set, Dave. I love being here. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I'll give you this opportunity. Obviously, you're going to go to the World of Solutions and see everything I'm excited there. about it. <laughs> but now we're going to go to Rebecca Stone, who's uh, currently um, talking about unified platforms at one of our iTalks. Let's go to Rebecca Stone. In the network. Uh, those, put, those security threats are expanding. We heard from Ambika on stage just shortly before about some of the things that we have to think about. Uh, and it's really, it's really about how complex you all are having to manage your networks. In fact, by next, this time next year, 40% of CIOs are going to fail to evolve their IT capabilities to deliver the modern digital infrastructure that we need to deliver those unified experiences that we just talked about. So how do we fix this? Well, there are a few things that we heard pretty consistently from many of our customers and partners as we started to think through how Cisco can help play a role in simplifying the network. The first thing was simplicity. Just we need to make things more automated. We need to make things easier to use and easier to manage, easier to alert. The second thing is predictability. And that's predictability a little bit, again, what Lawrence and Vakas were talking about on stage at the keynote earlier about licensing and buying uh, models for our products. The licensing models have become complex with Cisco. We need to simplify them. We are starting the work on that. We've started, we've announced it at Cisco Live US this year for Catalyst Center, and we'll continue to work on those licensing models. We'll also be working on things like as a service and as a subscription models to allow you to choose the consumption models that you really want that work for your business in addition to the traditional models that you're used to today. The last thing is making sure that we are thinking about the outcomes when we are delivering our solutions to you. Whether you are a hotel that is trying to provide wireless globally to all of your guests um, or a com company that is trying to deliver an, like a very security conscious R&D environment, those are very different needs with very different complex requirements and we need to think about those as we're developing the networks. Regardless of those three needs, uh, or consistently, I guess, across those three needs, we also heard some consistency about the needs of your business from a management perspective. When we think about the controllers that you are using today, many of you are on-prem, and that will continue to be a commitment of Cisco because we know that there are companies who can't be cloud managed. There are regulations, there are requirements like that R&D environment that I talked about that will prevent you from moving away from what you are being managed by today. There's also cloud managed companies who are more distributed and have already moved to fully cloud managed because they, they need to. And then of course there's in the middle, those hybrid environments where maybe some of your branches are cloud managed for simplicity reasons, while your core is, is more focused on the on-prem. 
Cisco remains committed to all these models as we start to move in this journey towards simplicity and, uh, and commitment to operational support. How are we going to do that? There are three things that we're going to focus on as we think of bringing uh, all of these together. The first is your management and your automation platforms. Those are going to start to merge together. We'll see the slide in a, in a few minutes. The second is the unified hardware portfolio. We announced this last year uh, with the access uh, the, the APs and the, and the switches. And uh, those will start to come together so that the Catalyst and Meraki devices will be managed one device with the, the management platform that you choose. And the last is the operating systems. As the operating systems start to come together across switching, routing, and wireless, it will start to simplify the other two as well. So... Fewer platforms for greater simplicity. This is a really good example to go back to the earlier one about the cash versus the, the wristwatch. Um, it is great to deliver that simplicity to our customers and to our employees on the networks that you build. It is Cisco's responsibility to help deliver that to you as well. We want to make sure that the network management that you are using is as easy and as simple to use as a rich swatch to swipe and pay for something. And our journey towards that is going to be uh, across simplifying the platforms that you are using to manage. You saw this again in the, in the keynote a little bit earlier. We have, I think, 12 to 13 different plat management platforms today that we are looking to simplify. We've started that journey. We've reduced the number of platforms already. We're starting to look at how we unify the on-prem and cloud platforms going forward, not just in a way that, um, that simplifies the number, but if we have multiple platforms, they will start to look and feel and act similarly so that you don't have to keep uh, learning new tools as we introduce new features. We'll end with a single cloud platform and a single on-prem platform. The single cloud platform will be based on what you know as Meraki today. The single on-prem platform will be based on what you know as Catalyst Center today. I think what's important to think about as we think about this vision is that it is a vision. It is not a net new product that we are going to be introducing. Cisco Networking Cloud is the vision of how we bring our platforms together, make it easier for you to use the tools. It's not something that we're going to manage on top of the existing tools that you have today. A few of the capabilities of the vision as we move forward is that end-to-end -end assurance, what you might know as Thousand Eyes if you're using that today, will start to propagate across the entire portfolio of networking products. That end-to-end -end assurance is going to be built on the 10 plus years of AI and ML capabilities that Cisco already has under its belt. We are going to be making sure that that is incredibly deeply embedded in a lot of the different tools that we have. That can include what we announced ag again this year with the uh, integration of Thousand Eyes into the MX. It also includes the integration of Thousand Eyes into collaboration, which we saw in the keynote earlier today, as well as with our FSO products, our uh, S Catalyst SD-WAN products, and uh, further and further on as you get uh, across the next few years. The second thing is multi-domain topologies and workflows. We've already started with the visibility of multi-domain topologies with the introduction of cloud monitoring and management for Catalyst, which Kartika is going to have a, up on stage in a few minutes. Um, and we're going to uh, continue that, not just with our switches, not, which, not just with our access points, but across routing and into the data center uh, as we move forward. It will also include workflows, that cross-domain automation that you saw in the slide previously. Cross-domain automation is going to ensure that if you build a workflow in your on-prem environment, it will port over into your cloud environment and vice versa. The unified design system is going to help, again, with no more swivel chair of you only have a network engineer who understands Catalyst uh, Center or you only have an engineer who understands Meraki. That's going to start to simplify so that one person can build rules and simplify that. It also is going to help in terms of managing your upgrades and, uh, and your day-to-day -day workflows. 
The last thing is bringing together more closely and unifying security and networking. Uh, the first thing that we're starting with is making sure that security policies that are set in Cisco Security Cloud are going to be propagated across the networking environments. Uh, but there's a number of deep integrations that we are looking at across both Security Cloud and Networking Cloud to make sure that as the two areas converge, we are focused on how we can help to make it easier to work with your counterparts, whether they be in security or networking. Those things are going to include ensuring open and consistent APIs, that unified UX. It's not just going to be across the network, it's also going to be across the security portfolio. There will be unified policies, like I just talked about, and of course, telemetry. So the data that's coming from the network is going to be increasingly important to help the security cloud understand what's going on and how they can help to prevent those threats. And so that shared telemetry and that deep sharing of telemetry is going to be increasingly important. Really, what Cisco Networking Cloud and Security Cloud are about is that simplification, trying to deliver more of the automation to all of you to be able to redirect your efforts to other areas. In order to show that, Kartika is now going to join me on stage to give some demos, because it's never a great iTalk without some demos, right, Kartika? Please join me. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, of course, we always have to show a demo. So I hope the demo gods are kind to me today. But uh, for all of those of you sitting on the sofas, it's easy to fall asleep. I was just sitting down there. So, <laughs> are you so, telling me I was boring, Karnika? <laughs> uh, bear with me a little bit. Uh, I need to log in. All right. So as Rebecca mentioned, uh, we know our customers have really diverse operating models today. And they may have a combination of really on-prem or hybrid or cloud managed, right? And so, so we have invested heavily, as Rebecca mentioned, in really developing the cloud monitoring capabilities for our Catalyst portfolio. And this is really in line with the Cisco Networking Cloud vision because we want to meet our customers wherever they may be. Now, when I say cloud monitoring, some, some of you may think, is it just monitoring or just a central, centralized view of the dashboard? But no, actually, uh, at Cisco Live, I think Rebecca, uh, you, you launch new capabilities. We basically uh, release enhancements to cloud monitoring for our 9300, 9500 uh, Catalyst family, Catalyst switching family. Uh, and they, those include, for example, a troubleshooting uh, CLI console, includes config history and changes, uh, packet history, uh, packet capture, as well as uh, alerts. So today I'm going to show what those new additions look like and also give you a preview of what some what's coming up in the future. So, so we're, we're really, what, what is happening is that we're moving beyond monitoring for those switches and allowing for some light management even yeah. is essentially what's happening. Correct, right? it really to help our customers really get started on the cloud, get comfortable, you know, you can try that out as well as basically help you in your troubleshooting, right? It's just not a view, it's not just visibility, there's some, uh, you know, troubleshooting elements that you can use. So here, we, what we have uh, up here is, uh, Meraki, uh, the dashboard from, from Meraki that shows a hybrid network, actually. So you have at the head end here, for example, you have uh, our uh, MX1000 at the head end, uh, and then it connects to, of course, a, the Catalyst switches that you know and love, the 9500 here. And here, the Catalyst switch is actually on monitored mode, so there is actually a view that can tell you whether it's on monitor-only mode or management mode. Uh, then it connects to a 9300 stack, which is actually in management mode, because we do now have 9300s that can be also natively managed by, by the cloud management dashboard. And then they are, of course, connected to, hopefully, <laughs> Cisco <laughs> Wireless, <laughs> as well as other Meraki things or cameras, right? And in this case, if you can see here, the wireless actually is one of our unified APs. They can be in Meraki mode or uh, capitalist mode. Basically. So which one is this? Which this mode? is the 9166. So CW916X, they're all basically dual mode APs. And this it is, is operating in capitalist this is, mode. This is, this is actually operating in Meraki, okay, Meraki mode. Okay, great. So, so you have that option. So can you future-proof your investment? So you have the head end as Meraki, the wireless as Meraki, and everything in between as catalyst switches. Correct. So now let me then click 
into the course switch. So I cheated a little bit. I have the screen up here uh, to show you what it will look like if you click on the switch itself, right? And obviously, you can see the ports here uh, and, and information about the switch itself in terms of the IP address, obviously, whether they are uh, in, this is actually in cloud, uh, Catalyst Cloud Monitor mode, as well as the serial numbers, the Meraki serial number and the Catalyst serial number. So, of course, let me click on one of the ports. You can see here the uplink port. Uh, and, of course, there's not much data. This is obviously a <laughs> demo environment, but you can see the traffic uh, going through the switch, and you will find, basically, additional configuration details. And so one of the new things that we've added is says additional capabilities to troubleshoot and tools for you, for the network operator, to be able to really operate uh, the network efficiently. And here, for example, as you scroll down, you can see a troubleshooting uh, console part of that where you can do packet capture, so you can do cycle the ports. Now, what are, Can yeah. I ask you a question? Sure, What's the benefit of, of uh, having that available for Catalyst within the Meraki Yeah, dashboard? so you don't have to go to the CLI. You have a lot of this information up there on the dashboard. Uh, One of the things that I've heard pretty consistently from, co from customers is in a hybrid environment, it's helping really reduce the amount of um, escalations to Tier 3 support that yeah. to have that visibility in the dashboard, which is a little bit easier for a Tier 1 or Tier 2 support to yeah. use to be able to, to use it in this mode. Yes, and so that one additional tools that, that, that is new now that gives you actually additional information, this is a troubleshooting uh, a console that you will get, basically a CLI, a read-only CLI, so I can launch that terminal, uh, and basically you get basically a CLI uh, in the dashboard. And of course, you can use your favorite show commands here. I'm just going to do a show config, and they will show you basically, you get all the configuration details that you need from that show command. So this is the, one of the new features that we have added recently. Now, so this hopefully will help your network operators in your day-to-day -day operations. We have one additional feature that was announced at uh, Cisco Live US, and this is something that I think a lot of people uh, are asking for, which is config history and change, right? Of course, you have lots of configurations on, on your network uh, or in this particular switch. So what this provides you is a chrono uh, chronological history uh, of what changes that were made on your configurations, for example, here. Uh, and you can also compare changes. So, for example, we have a modification on 2nd of December, uh, and let me compare it to a modification that was made uh, in November. By the way, this is American uh, <laughs> month uh, d uh, date, so sometimes it gets confusing Ignore for some. Ignore the fact that it's, <laughs> yes, that it's uh, backwards. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so what we have here is then it will show you basically the areas where that was changed, right? Uh, so where this basically, uh, this bands here, the red and the green, shows you the changes that were made. In this case, obviously, the IP address was changed. So this is one new, uh, uh, one new area that you can probably leverage in managing your network. Awesome. Thank okay. you, Kartika. So now let's show you some of the newer, even newer things and give you a preview of something else here. So if you go up, Basically, if you go to organization, uh, you can go to basically alerts. This is uh, something that's new. Again, I cheated a little bit. I brought up this screen. Uh, so if you click on alerts, you'll get to this screen. And basically, as you know, Meraki things and cameras there and the network has a lot of alerts capabilities, right? Uh, and so this is also now extended to the Catalyst switches that you have. So you can see here, uh, you can pick what kind of device there is. Here I pick a Catalyst switch. Now, this is a working network, so actually there are no problems. <laughs> but That's just probably imagine, a good thing. <laughs> we <laughs> just, can imagine. <laughs> you just imagine if you had some issues or you had set some, some alerts, basically it will pop up as an alert. And what you can do is you can double click on it, obviously. And it will also give you guidance on what documentation on potentially what that issue may be. Right? And you can, you can remedy it. Right? So this is one new thing. And then uh, the last thing which I'm going to cover here is then basically one of the previews of the latest feature, which is most man uh, IT managers or network managers hate basically firmware upgrades or you know, software image management, basically. So here, again, what you can do is you can go to uh, the firmware status of your networks, and you can pick, basically, uh, the, these, these switches, uh, the cloud monitor.
switches, and you can pick the, you can understand what firmware it has today and whether you need to upgrade that. So that's really it. And we continue to build these capabilities. And you can get started quite easily today by connecting your Cat9 keys as long as they have a DNA license, basically. And you will hear a rolling thunder of new announcements. I think Rebecca mentioned uh, new AP, uh, uh, more APs and, mm -hmm. and controllers on the dashboard. So that's awesome. it. Thank you so much, Kartika. I appreciate you joining me on the stage. Right. And just to, just to reiterate what Kartika said, um, if you have a DNA or Catalyst Center license today, you actually have access to cloud monitoring immediately. So you can go home and get started. Uh, with that, I want to make sure that we bring Daniel Hughes up on stage, who is, our, is the CIO for the Department for Education in South Australia, to tell us a little bit more about his experience. Dan, please join us. Hello. Thank you so much. Dan, thank you so much for joining us. Why don't you give us a little bit of a background about uh, your role uh, with the Department for Education? Yeah, sure. So thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, so Dan Hughes, I'm the Chief Information Officer for the Department for Education in South Australia. Um, so what does that mean? We look after about 950 sites um, across the breadth of our, our state. Um, so that includes preschools, high schools, primary schools. Um, we provide central platforms for schools' consumption, um, but we also provide the connectivity they need to ensure they can have access to digital resources online. Um, so we've had a bit of a journey, Rebecca, uh, over the past number of years. I was probably one of those CIOs that was staring down the barrel of if I didn't make some change, if we didn't make some change. With, um, with, during the pandemic correct, and COVID. We, we, we would have been sort of behind the eight ball. So, we had to partner up fairly quickly um, with a number of providers to help us solve a couple of things. So the first thing was internet connectivity across our state. Um, just a quick stat for you, we had about 7% of our schools connected to what we would consider enterprise grade um, internet um, back in 2018. In that same year, um, the department was staring down the face of having to, to shift schools into NAPLAN online testing. Right, so this is fundamentally taking schools away from paper-based testing um, to purely online. Um, so with that sort of stat in mind, 7% of our schools um, would have absolutely struggled um, to have access to, to that mode of testing. So we, we did two things, as I said before. We, we explored how could we rapidly fix the internet issue, but also we went down a path of how do we make sure that for the first time, given we're a, a decentralised environment, how could we get line of sight to all of our schools, all of our preschools, to ensure that we could build a level of comfort, um, that A, we could support them from the centre, um, but also how do we make sure that um, we can provide a level of simplicity um, for our schools as they've tried to manage these environments in themselves. So, and so just to level set, you yep. were um, on Catalyst at, at that point? You had Catalyst access points in all of the schools? No, or no? no, it was okay. a, an absolute mixed bag. Okay. <laughs> right, so I think that some of the larger, um, you know, more affluent schools were absolutely using enterprise grade um, infrastructure, but some of the small regional primary schools, for example, um, they'd been in a JB Hi-Fi, they'd got themselves some D-Link and, and helped their own internet yeah. um, and their own their net networks together um, themselves. So, so they might not even have an IT person on site and correct. it's just correct. an admin who's, it, who's it, trying to set things up. For it, it, it was the Wild West. Yeah. Right? So, so, so essentially that was the other problem. So just to fast forward to, to now with, um, with the, the assistance of Cisco, with the assistance of Telstra, Palo Alto and Sassian, we've solved the internet problems. That 7% stat that I gave before, we're now 99.6% of our sites are now connected up to dark fiber. But beyond that, there's no point having a big fat internet pipe coming into a school if you're dealing with schools that are using 15 year old you know, networks um, yep. and we, there was no consistency there. So we then made a, a, an active choice to, to work out how do we solve that problem. We um, established an enterprise agreement with Cisco to deploy the Meraki suite of products um, through our schools and preschools. Um, and we did that, to your point before, through the pandemic, um, and we did that um, at a, a rate of knots because we had to make sure that schools could get access to the not only the digital online resources they needed, but when we're looking at how do we shift schools to hybrid learning and those sorts of things, um, that was a fundamental piece we had to solve. And can you maybe give people a sense of how far away are your sites? That You said you have 900 different sites. How far away are they from each other? Is it 
a couple of hours? Is it a day? What, what, yeah, what do so, you think? so it's a mixed bag. So if you look at, we've got 16 schools, Indigenous schools in the, the far northwest of our state. Um, so to get there, you actually have to fly into Northern Territory first and then drive back into South Australia to get to some of these schools. So in, in that instance, we're talking two days travel um, for some of our staff to go out to support those schools. Yeah. So to have then, um, uh, the, through the Meraki products, that, that, that ability for our central staff to, through the foundation of work we've done, manage and access the, the APs, the switches, the entire environment and manage that on behalf of the schools uh, was a, a massive game changer. But certainly for us in the centre, um, us ha then having a level of confidence that those schools were going to be OK yeah. um, just absolutely meant that you know, we had that level of confidence that you know, we, we yeah. could move forward. Yeah. And so what has that level of confidence of just you, you have consistent and reliable internet, you now have consistent and reliable uh, delivery of internet to all of your schools. What has that allowed you to do over the pandemic and now even beyond? Yeah, so, so with the foundations now in place for most of our schools, in, in fact, as I said, 99% of them, um, not only has our confidence shifted, all right, the, the ability for teachers now to, to, to know they don't have to spend the first sort of 15, 20 minutes of each class trying to navigate right. setting up the tech to actually deliver curriculum, right? Yeah. Um, the fact that that now works means that they're, they're doing things that, um, you know, are moving their thinking forward, um, but also engaging kids in different ways. So, so for us, you know, that, that the digital foundational layer has been a game changer because we're now seeing schools in whether it be in regional areas, um, in metro areas, starting to explore, given they're all very creative, they're all very innovative, they're looking at, okay, what does artificial intelligence then look like um, for the delivery of curriculum? How, how could artificial intelligence assist? H how can we use Internet of Things to, to gather data more effectively and what can we do with that data to drive um, better pedagogy outcomes, mm -hmm. um, certainly for our kids who are attending schools? Um, and then, you know, even some more basic things where... Um, Across Australia, we, we have a, a, an issue trying to attract and retain teachers into schools, period. Right? So in regional areas, um, we can't get teachers into some of those schools, which means that some of those kids don't have access to some of the subjects that otherwise would do. So I'll give you an example. So Junior Area School, which is in the, um, the northwestern corner of, of our state, um, you can't get, despite the fact there might be four or five kids wanting to do Year 12 chemistry, we can't get a Year 12 chemistry teacher into that school. So with the foundations now set, and to answer your question, the fact that technology is there, um, we're now beaming in teachers from yeah. Metro Adelaide to then teach those subjects. And they're subjects. digitally teaching the classes. Correct, correct. So, so therefore, those kids aren't being left yeah. behind. Um, so without, as I said, the digital foundational layer, um, we would have struggled to, to achieve that. Okay. Well, we are out of time. I wish we could, I could probably talk to you for another 10 minutes, but I appreciate it. Um, for all of those in the room and online, if you'd like to continue the conversation, please feel free to scan the QR code. There are a number of sessions to go into detail of some of the things that we've discussed. Thank you all. Have a great day. from the Innovation Theater where we heard from Rebecca Stone and Karthika around the unified experience with all the Cisco platforms. So as we were talking about earlier, how Cisco is trying to integrate and unify all the experiences to make it easier for our customers, which kind of ties in well we, with our next guest. So CX has been an integral part of Cisco, and Cisco has invested a lot of time into customer experience to improve the life cycle of a customer. So we have over Jackie G, who is the Senior Vice President of Asia Pacific Japan and Greater China, over in stage B with Dave, who we, who's going to tell us how customer experience has revolutionized our customer's journey, life cycle, all throughout. So over to you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Sheikha. Yes, here I am with, uh, with Jackie G. Jackie, uh, Jackie helps customers uh, transform 
transform their businesses through Cisco's broad portfolio of their hardware, software and services from her um, strong operational background. Jackie, thank you for joining us. How has your Cisco Live been? Oh, my God. It's been amazing. I, I am so pumped. Um, I just spent um, a little bit of time with Chrissy Chu on stage at the Exec Symposium talking about how she's working with CX to modernize her Wi-Fi across 1,400 stores. And I had no idea. She's got 21 million customers per week oh, wow. checking out groceries. And now she's got this bottom of the trolley innovation going on that can scan what's at the bottom of the trolley. Anyway, I, think, uh, I love it because those examples for me is what brings customer experience to life. We are helping her get, do that. Um, I think that was a, what was incredible was your uh, when you had the on your keynote and talking about those custom actual customer the, the experience the hero the customer heroes. Uh, those customer heroes were just something, yeah, absolutely outstanding to see for, hear from. So, um, so you please. Okay. So one of, one of those customers, um, hello, can you hear me? We got you. We got this here, yeah. All right, hi, hi. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Fabulous. I love a mic. <laughs> um, so one of those customers uh, who, was, uh, who I talked about, the customer hero, uh, when I was on stage today, they, they actually engaged the CX team last year at this event. Oh, wow. And in one year, they've actually driven a business outcome that they didn't think was possible in that time frame. It's the, just amazing. The power of Cisco Live. Um, so so you've, had, um, you've had a lot of extensive roles across your career, you know, um, led an IT team in the banking industry, uh, former CIO, and now leading ABJC uh, customer, customer experiences. What do you think you see as an ideal customer experience for IT engineers? I think that's a great question. Um, so, you know, you've, there's so many ways to think about experience, right? There is the engineering experience. There's the customer experience. You know, there's the customer experience, you know, of, of the end customer. But if you just, if we talk about engineers for a second, they use tools and software to do their job every day. Just like our customers buy software from us to actually run coals or run a bank. So the tools that the engineers use, whether it's monitoring tools to monitor the network, a network engineer monitoring the network, or um, if an engineer is using a security tool to make sure that we can respond to any security attack might, that might be happening, the easier you make it for engineers to be able to, to use the most modern engineering tools available, by the way, Splunk, mm. I was a customer of Splunk before we acquired Splunk, they, like engineers love Splunk because it's a tool that helps them do their job and they can actually get access to insights to help them do their job more effectively and more efficiently with the data that, you know, software like Splunk provides. So I think, you know, for, engineer, for engineers, they need that access to tools to be the best, to be at the top of their game, to do the best job they can, for, by the way, for the customers that we support. So it's super, super important to make sure engineers are happy with the tools that we give them. It's not an easy job, by the way. I could, I could attest They're to that. They're not always sure. happy. <laughs> Keep engineers happy. I know working with our, our, our system engineers as well, from my particular role, it's, they are. Keep them happy for sure. They are everything. They are everything to us. So speaking of customers and partners, how, how do you think Cisco's uh, revolutionized the customer experience for both, both of those partner side and for the customer side as well? Yeah. Well, look, um, you know, in talking to customers this week, and I've spent most of yesterday meeting customers, many conversations today, more tomorrow, I can tell you that our customers, look, they are very loyal to Cisco. They love our products. But the one message I keep getting from them is, stop selling me more, show me the value of what I've bought, and when, I, and when you get me humming on the value of the software hardware I've already got from you, help me through that journey because in most cases I haven't fully adopted it or haven't fully got the value of my investment. Then, of course, once you make me more successful, we can expand to other things. But, the, you know, the key message for me is customer experience. The revolution is we are here for our customers. Yes, we are a hardware software company. But if we don't leverage CX to help drive software adoption, get hardware humming, just like what we did at the FIFA World Cup. Yeah. Our engineers laid the cables in the stadiums. 
we used our hardware and software, and it was the CX services teams that ran that project that got it all up and running, that orchestrated it all, so that we could we could broadcast, Jane Fernandez, CEO of FIFA, could broadcast to millions of people all, ra- all around the world. If we just handed over the hardware and software, we probably wouldn't have got that experience, but it's bringing it all together and making it work seamlessly. That's what our customers are looking for. So I keep saying to my team, it's really simple. We need less outages. We have to support our customers with our critical infrastructure. Let's make sure they're using it effectively, observability, network security, whatever it is. And if they have projects that they need to implement, be it moving to a smart building or be it moving to a zero trust security uh, architecture, we can help them execute those projects. Either we do it for them or we provide them with some of our 8,000 engineers to plug into their teams. They can lead it and we can support them. So I'm trying to keep the language simple. But the revolution is we must drive value I like that. Yes. I like it. And it, 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 it's so true, I think, for the customers that I deal with. They're so quick to... We're going on these big journeys, and I know we, we've got... The, we, we're going through some bits, pieces of software, and we're very quick to jump to the... All right, let's go to the next. Let's go to the next project. But hang on, let's make sure we fully, they've fully adopted that project first. So, no, it's, uh, it's very true. The value, value first. Yeah. And look, uh, there are always opportunities for our customers to uh, leverage more of our software and hardware that they may not have. So, of, of course, we should show them what they don't have and what opportunities they have from things they haven't used. All I'm saying is where we have our hardware and software out there with customers, let's make sure they're getting value because that makes the second conversation so much easier. And in, in tying this back, in, uh, back, to, back to engineering, why, why do you think engineering is so critical for a secure network and customer experience? Um, that takes me to my personal experience uh, where on a number of occasions in different companies when I was leading technology, I had an outage on the network. So it is true that you can have outages on the network. It's not good when the network goes down for multiple hours and you're trying to understand what's happened and get it back up and running. Um, The good news is 99.999% of the time, it's not the network. But everyone always blames yeah, the network. Right. So I was a network operator. I was a network, network engineer many, many years ago. It's always the network. Um, but look, I think, um, you know, in terms of engineering, engineer, what I call engineering excellence, the network is crucial. The secure network even more crucial for every single company in the world, not just APJC. If you do not have a secure network that's engineered with excellence you are likely to have outages. Now, I make it sound very simple because networks have so many, so many, there's so much software in the network. You've got routers, you've got switches, you've got Wi-Fi. It's, it's complicated. So you need to be able to see it. And then, you know, engineering excellence and standards and driving automation or using AI to help you predict things before they happen, it all becomes critical in order to just make sure your network stays up and running. Mm. But I think sometimes we underestimate how much of the network keeps countries running. I mean, networks keep countries, infrastructures running, and the engineers that sit behind the network, they need to be paraded through the streets of every single city in the world because they do what no one sees them do. They keep us up and running in the world. So, yeah, excellence around engineering matters, and they do an amazing job, honestly, amazing job. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, have, you had, have you had time at the moment to ch- yet to check out the World of Solutions? I know you made a comment oh, yeah. that it's the, the, biggest, the biggest stand yet. Or yes, biggest, yeah. I was there. I was there last night, actually, handing out awards to, um, you know, all the customer heroes that you uh. heard me talk about today on stage, and then I, I got them to stand up. But, yeah, I spent time with them, took photos with them, talked to the teams, you know, not just the leaders of those technical teams, but the teams on the ground who are working with our teams and, and driving like amazing innovation around observability, you know, really um, optimizing their networks, using our success tracks offer. Um, I always say to the team, try and use English because I know we use success tracks and we use CX and we use different offers that we have in Cisco. But essentially, it's we can help you run your 24 by 7 operation. We can help you execute projects. And uh, yeah, yesterday was fantastic for me in the world solutions because you know not only did we did we have some awards to give out but we really saw teams coming together and being really proud of what they've done in one year alone yeah that's it's it's incredible to see so um 
I will just ask uh, just uh, just one last question for you, just to finish sure. up. So you you were describing how you you know and you've had so many roles and you've been all all across the world. Yes. How how do you do you notice any cultural difference in expectations when it comes into customer experience? Definitely. I can tell you that Aussies are very direct. <laughs> I can tell you the Germans are very direct. I can tell you the English, very polite. So you should probably ask three times before they tell you, because <laughs> they probably won't tell you direct. Um, you know, um, yeah, co- I love cultures. I mean, I born in Uruguay, grew up in Australia. I've lived in Germany, London, New York, San Francisco. Now I'm in Asia. I love Asia. China, you know, Greater China, I've been there. It's amazing. ASEAN, um, Japan, India, ANZ. Like, we, we have such a rich region of culture. And, and the nuances matter. You know, the way that you are speaking to Japanese culture is very, very important. The exchange of the business card is a ceremony. You need to take time to do it with, you know, genuine, be authentic. It's not just a process. It's actually, it's, it's real for them and it matters. And, like, when I go there, it, ma- like it matters. It matters that they're here. Um, you know, with India, I love their curries. India, I love Indians. They get really passionate. They get really passionate. Um, I was recently in Indonesia. The CEO of in, uh, IOH there is driving some incredible transformation. And, and his culture is all about, you know, making sure that we have quality time over a game of golf. Um, I'm back into golf, thank God. Oh. I didn't do too bad considering I haven't played for two and a half years. But, um, yeah, look, culture matters. Culture matters. I could go on about culture, but the point is understand who you're talking to. And I'm always someone that puts myself in the shoes of the other person. Whatever role they're in and whatever country they come from, it matters. It matters. Yep. So you talk... Aussie culture, very direct, very direct. You say, well, what about what about the Aussie uh, the Aussie food, the, the the food landscape? What have you what have you experienced here? I, know I had my looking... first pie the pie. other day. I haven't had a meat pie for a long time, and I loved it. Yeah. Sauce all over it. it was a little pie. I'm trying to stay off the carbs when I'm at these conferences. Otherwise, it's not a good look. So I know we're talking about those uh, potato twists. We've got some potato oh, twists yeah. floating around. So I we'll, cannot. We'll, we'll you, you, you could probably get away with that. I can't <laughs> get away with that. No, no. So I'll stick to the salads and, you know. Give me, give, me some, give, me, give me a piece of advice. I've got some customers here. And um, what are some pieces? Where should I take them? Into the world solution? Did you, what, should, what, are we, what are they expected to say? What I do you mean, expect to I say I would there? say take them, to, take them to the innovation day. CX is a, has an innovation day. Um, and actually, I've got Ramona from Rio Tinto on stage with me. She's driving an incredible transformation at Rio Tinto. We're helping her. And at that session, actually, if you're an engineer, if, you're, if you love technology, come and listen to Pallavi talk about how she's modernizing TAC because we know they've made great progress and there's more to do. And then Jesse Reed, who's our VP um, from uh, automation uh, and lifecycle, he's going to talk about how lifecycle services, what does it look like to an engineer, a technical person, and how are we helping customers drive their DevOps implementations, really leveraging our technology to, to, to transform their operations. So, yeah, I'd say so, come to that one. So important. And World of Solutions, CX we'll Stand. Get there. Get there. Jackie, thank you so much for your time. This has been incredible. I feel so privileged to be able to speak with you. We are going to go over to an iTalk now. So right now we're going to go hear from Denise Lee talking a bit more about, tell us more. Sustain, uh, sustainability. So, over to the eye talk. Hello and welcome. Thank you for those who are here with us in the room and for those tuning in online. My name is Denise Lee and I lead our engineering sustainability office here at Cisco. It's amazing how much progress we've made just in this last year. Listening to customers and partners from around the globe, it is, you can't really go too far without hearing two words, those magic two words, sustainability and AI. We're going to talk about both today, but when we, when we really look at the sustainability focus from our customers, the drivers are clear as day. It's not only a board-level conversation and a C-suite conversation. It is first and foremost happening inside of the realms of IT decision makers, helping to drive overall business operations and business transformation. Cisco's not new at this, right? We've been at this for quite some time, and not only from a ratings and rankings perspective, right, climate 
Climate Disclosure Project, CDP, has given Cisco an A rating for many years in a row. When you look at where the money is flowing from Dow Jones and Morgan Stanley and Morningstar, you can start to see investment houses are paying attention to these ESG goals. When you look at how we're being measured, the gold standard of science-based target initiatives, SBTI, Cisco was one of the first technology companies to have our goals and our plans approved. For so many of our customers, there's, it's pretty easy to say we've got a goal and a commitment to net zero in some far off date. But having those plans and commitments that have been approved by standards and certifications like SBTI, that's not as common. We're also working in embedding sustainability across our portfolio in our own operations. In North America and Canada, Cisco's operations are actually 100% operating on renewable energy. We're building it into our products themselves, and we're looking at the circularity, leveraging our supply chain so that all the product that comes back, 99.98, nearly 100% of that product, can be responsibly recycled and re reused. Across engineering, though, we need to make sure that sustainability is being embedded into our roadmaps, embedded into the portfolio so that you, our customers, have solutions that you can actually use to help you on your journey to net zero. And we're doing that in four key focus areas. Starts first with energy management, you can't change what you can't see and what you can't measure. So what is that accurate use of energy? Second is software. How are we making sure that we're optimizing across all of our platforms for sustainability? And yes, that includes both energy management, but it also includes things like energy proportionality and generative AI. Of course, sustainable hardware. We are committing to making sure that our packaging, our transport, all the materials that go into our products themselves are more sustainable and circular designed. We're aiming for a target of 2025 to have all of our products there on after have circular design built into it. And then last but not least, as we think about the business transformations of as a service models, making sure that we're getting product back, right? Take back is coming back. Business models are starting to change. And we're making sure that across our portfolio, there's architectures that feed directly into solutions that you're familiar with today. So we start in the campus, right? We, we start in the campus because this is our core bread and butter, and we know how to do this. We've had power over Ethernet for 25 years. What's fascinating is now we have newer ecosystems with lighting manufacturers, blind solar on windows, automated desks, furniture designers. They're all now starting to build more and more in that built space on technology as its backbone. Buildings typically have over 30 different building management systems in them. Our Catalyst series is connecting them in its backbone. Our sensors and our Meraki platforms are connecting all of this so that you can have thousands of sensor readings off of one given floor. The built space represents close to 40% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. 40%. But we don't stop there. When we work with service providers around the world, all the way down to the fiber, our routed optical networks are further converging how we get internet to you with more performance and the speeds and feeds that Dave was talking about this morning, we're still at that. We're still working with the core service providers to transform those business models and making sure that we are, we are building networks that are as sustainable as possible with a lower carbon footprint. But it wouldn't be technology, it wouldn't be sustainability if we're not talking about what's the other huge offender of, of energy around the world and what's continuing to go up and to the right in terms of its energy consumption. And that's in the data centers. Last year, we were not nearly talking about AI the way we are today. And if we think sustainability is coming up fast and furious as a topic everyone's trying to learn and get their head around, well, let's apply AI to that. When we look at Cisco's core platform across the data centers, today data centers represent 2 to 4%, depending on, on you know, how you're calculating crypto. But it, let's call it you know, maybe 2 to 4, 1 to 4%, just data centers alone. That's today. When we think about what's forecasted in the not-so-distant future, Dell Oral is projecting $500 billion of data physical infrastructure to be spent by 2027. 500 billion, just in the physical infrastructure. And if we think about why and what's in that, 
I am so pleased to be able to double click into this conversation um, and bring to the stage my good friends Jeremy Foster and Yusuf Khan. All right, so Jeremy, SVP GM of our Cisco Compute, and Yusuf Khan, our VP of Cisco Data Center Networking. If we, if we start with the platforms, let's start with the actual hardware. What is, what's the latest and greatest that Cisco is offering? Where are we starting in our platform and our core infrastructure? Uh, thank you, Denise. Um, I mean, we have to be very hard at work in bringing the power efficiencies back into the data center. And for that, Nexus 9800, which is our latest and greatest family of modular switches, bring a lot of power efficiencies for the organizations into the data center. And this, this is because we pay attention to all aspects of the design that starts with silicon. We are able to tap the awesome bandwidth of Silicon One into the design, and that helped us eliminate a lot of active components on the board. But we didn't stop over there. We looked at the heat sink design to make sure that the heat is getting transferred off the ASX in a more efficient way. Similarly, the power supplies have been redesigned to operate at higher efficiencies. We eliminate the power conversion from DC to AC, AC to DC on the board, so that we can reduce the number of losses. So this power efficiencies are built in into all aspects of the hardware design. That's great, and it's great to be here. Talk about sustainability with you and Yusuf. I think it's really important key consideration for us and our customers is you know, we're looking at this holistically across the data center, both networking, compute together, and engineering these solutions for our customers. And like you said, Denise, we've been at this for a long time. And maybe it's not a big surprise that UCSX is really leading the way in terms of sustainability in that server space. And we're winning awards in the industry for just how sustainable this platform is. A recent SEAL award, which talks about being the most sustainable product in that category, as well as, and take a look if you don't believe the SEAL folks, and uh, at the ESG report, which is a third-party report that compares our solutions versus the competition and shows that we excel in this, this world of sustainability. And we can even take you through a customer example. You know, it's all about driving business outcomes here, Yusuf, and take a, a bank, this is a bank, yes. uh, 500 servers, they had to reduce that environment because a big key to data center modernization is reducing that footprint. And reducing that footprint 70%, bringing down the total power in the data center almost in half, right, 49%. And then when you factor in your networking driving 61% out of the power utilization, these are all big metrics. But I think what really gets exciting for the business is the numbers you see on the right-hand side of the slide, right? How do we drive that sa energy savings into business savings, reduce the hardware costs, reduce the recurring costs to support and maintain all that hardware in the data center? That's absolutely right, Jeremy. A lot of these numbers sort of debunk the, um, it's, it's too much, it costs too much to refresh earlier, but we're actually seeing customers hit the let's go faster now because of these numbers and these savings, the ROI comes a bit faster. Absolutely. And you know, we can't stop there. We're always going to be delivering the latest and greatest technology. And you, you use less of the newest technology, which is why you get those savings in these physical reductions in footprint. And of course, we're always happy to deliver the latest and greatest with Intel and their roadmap, but we're also really excited to talk about our new AMD portfolio, where we will be delivering a full complement of rack mount servers, as well as the industry's first blade server as well. That's really awesome. Jeremy, talk to me a little bit about, you know, as, we, as we're looking and peeking into all of these other vendors and planning these roadmaps for ahead, we can't just look inside of our own boxes anymore. We have to look at the kind of greater inter integrated ecosystem and how all these different systems work together. So it's not just networking and compute anymore. We also have to be looking at some other things. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I think you know, AMD is a great example in terms of bringing out new technology into the stack. Uh, there's a lot of things that I know Yusuf's working on in terms of uh, new innovations in the network and, and some of the kit that you want to talk about there as well. Absolutely. Look, I mean, as you are coming up with the new servers and new form factors, we are also helping our customers migrate from 25 gig attached servers into the 50 gig attached servers. And this is one example that you see 
on the screen, which is our newest one of the 9300 switches that helps customer migrate from 25 gig to 50 gig densities in, in the data center. And not only, I mean, this is just an enterprise use case, but it has Class C timing devices on it also that helps customer for our service provider customers to uh, utilize it for the use cases when it comes to ORAN front hall services also. So again, one switch, very power efficient, supported by uh, uh, very power efficient optical transceivers also, um, so that we can, we can help our enterprise customers as well as service provide provider customers to do this migration, the service that uh, Jeremy and his team is building. In fact. That's great. You know, across the hardware platform, there's so much new things coming, coming, coming out to help us with that performance. But software, or hardware is just part of that story, right? When we think about energy management, we think about that software layer, what does it look like and how are we further building on top of this hardware stack within the software space? You're absolutely right, Denise. I mean, I think we focus on three things. One is hardware, other, um, other is so, uh, software and uh, manage tool, management tool chain. But the third thing is also the network design, and we're going to talk about it a little bit later. From an energy management perspective, we have built in these capabilities into our premier unified management software, which is called Nexus Dashboard, and it is, relies on the capability on the hardware and the software for have streaming telemetry so that we can get all these uh, telemetry into the Nexus dashboard and we can show the power footprint of the devices and we can show it based on the devices, based on the fabric, based on the side, and we can show customers that how much power is being consumed, what are the sources of the power that is being utilized, what is the carbon footprint and the emission footprint that shows up as the result. So customers have complete visibility into the trending information also and it all culminates into a sustainability report that customer can uh, generate on demand or on a monthly basis. Yeah, that's right. And you nailed it, Denise. I mean, it starts off with innovation in that hardware platform, but customers really experience using the technology from a day two operational perspective with the software across Nexus dashboard yes. and Intersight. And with Intersight, we've recently introduced an energy and power management dashboard, which allows customers to track how are they doing towards those sustainability goals over time. How can they identify anomalies in the environment so that they can go remediate those or understand things that Perhaps they have areas in the data center where they're not using a ton of power. They can redistribute their virtual environment and turn servers off, which is a great way to take back Huge. some of that power utilization. And also, I think communicating this information back to the lines of business is really important. So that reporting piece you mentioned, Yusuf, is, is really key to getting this information out of the data center into the hands of the line of business so they can together understand how are they tracking towards those sustainability goals. I actually had a customer tell me, across his, his management chain by site, he gave them a bogey and said, if you don't hit 20% reduction in your overall energy efficiency, you're not getting your bonus. So these tools are really helpful for his team. Yeah, that's really important. It's really important. That's really important um, and that that's context. actually starting to become more and more common in some of these metrics. Um, Yusuf, can you tell us how we're making it easier for our customers to consume and to use some of these features? You're right. I mean, I think uh, we talked about sustainability report earlier on the previous slide, and that is a very, very important tool for our customers to understand the power footprint of their data center devices. And that capability was available through our day to ops or premier license. Uh, but we realized that customers with a smaller network which may not have the premier license may also require that feature set. So we have been working very hard listening to the feedback from our customers and retooling our licensing scheme so that these features are available at advantage tier also as well as essential tiers. For example, customers running essential tiers will have full coverage on the certs so that they can run their uh, environment securely and they will also have access into the hardware and the software compliance information. Customers running Advantage tier will have the access to the sustainability report we just talked about on the previous um, slide and as well as anomalies and um, uh, advisories. But the customers running the premier tier will have access to all day two ops and all uh, features uh, for management without any, any control. So Yusuf, these are great changes, but how does a customer who already has purchase this software, take advantage of some of these new features and capabilities? They don't have to do anything, right? I mean, it is already done. It has already been shipping. So customers can continue to take advantage of all these features even today. So With if I had it, if I didn't have that feature yesterday, I just I have it today and I don't have to pay yeah. anything additional. That's a great way to get started. That is absolutely right. More value. Uh, what about as these ecosystems get more convoluted with other vendors coming into the space? Again, like power is so, you know, the connectivity, even how we, how we distribute air cooling, potentially one, one day in the future, hopefully liquid cooling. How are, we, how are we working with other vendors in this space 
integrated into energy management? It's a very good question, Denise. We totally realize that Cisco is not only the only vendor within the data center, right, and within a rack. So that's why we wanted to bring the benefits of this solution to the customers uh, through our partners, and we want to expand these benefits. So anything that is plugged in into a PDU that is developed by either Panduit or Vertiv, through the integration that we have developed with them, the power footprint is going to be available to the customer. So, I mean, you may have any storage devices, you may have any non-Cisco compute or a non-Cisco networking devices plugged into a PDU powered by either Panduit or Vertiv. We will be reporting on the power usage and the carbon footprint of those devices through the sustainability report also, right? That's great. What about the partner landscape in the compute space, Jeremy? Yeah, I mean, it's really all about bringing solutions together. And I think, I don't know how many people in the audience out there are familiar with Cisco validated designs or what we like to call CVDs, but we take USIS stack on the networking side, the computing pieces, and the rest of the data center architecture and put it together with our partners that you see here. And we do those to deliver value along those use cases you see at the bottom of the slide, whether that's infrastructure modernization, application modernization, Cyber resiliency, you know, hybrid cloud, you know, we've extended all of our CVDs to have that hybrid cloud context into them. So if you aren't just focused on the four walls of the data center, but how do you leverage that infrastructure you're going to buy with AWS, Azure, and the other folks in that cloud space? And then, of course, AI, which I know we're going to talk a little bit about in a minute. Yeah. But we do have one new big partnership yep. uh, that you see mentioned several times on the previous slide in each one of those use cases, and that's Nutanix. Yep. And I think we have a very great technological fit with them in terms of bringing Intersight, which is our SaaS-based management platform, to help customers see and understand what's happening with their Nutanix clusters, not only in the data center, but across their edge. Yeah. which is really big for you know, AI transition as well as you know, where those hyper-converged solutions often play. Now, it's also great from a scale perspective because we give them the visibility and control with Intersight across that entire compute estate. And from an alignment perspective between the two companies, we have a very unique business relationship where we can make it a one-stop shop for customers to get an entire end-to-end -end Nutanix solution on UCS through Cisco, and then also have an industry-first type support experience across the two companies. That's great. It's, it's so great to hear that we're, we're not working all these in different silos, that bringing together the hardware, the software, and these, these validated designs in an easier way to consume through licensing. Like That's really helpful for the customer. But of course, we can't go too far. We know AI is changing the landscape. We've had so many conversations. Uh, I know I've had a number of industry conversations where they close the door, there's everyone's in the room, there's no competitors. This is an industry problem. Data centers are out of power. We have an energy problem. We don't have a space problem. We don't even have a performance problem. We have an energy problem. And so when we think about how we are solving this, specifically for what's coming with AI, we know that these growth numbers are kind of blowing, mind-boggling when you think of it. Gartner has recently come out with a study and said in 2023, less than 5% of data center enterprise said they were going to re-look at their strategy. Less than 5%. Right? No, we're good. Less than 5%. By 2028, now over 70% in this last year are saying, yep, we need to re-look at this. Right? And uh, Cisco recently put out their AI readiness survey and index, and the number of people who said, big problem, don't have a plan. Right? The numbers are just staggering. Yeah. And so when we think about how Cisco needs to come together, specifically in the data center, the number of times I've heard from customers in multiple continents around the world saying, hey, you guys are in a unique situation. What is Cisco doing? That's part of the reason why all three of us are up here today. How is Cisco looking at sustainable AI infrastructure. So how are we pushing for these infrastructure requirements? Yusuf, do you want to start? No, absolutely. I think you gave a very good example in terms of how data centers are power hungry, right? And this is, again, uh, everybody needs more computing power, but they cannot get more power into the data center. So how energy efficient we become from an infrastructure perspective means more power can be dedicated for computing. Right? And that is where customer focus is because they, I mean, one of the conversations I was having with a customer and customer told me that, look, I mean, if you can give me uh, a more efficient infrastructure, I can, and replace my existing and aging modular chassis, I can save up to one megawatt of power in the data center yeah. that I can use it to roll in additional 64 compute racks. And that's going to be a big, big boon for my business. And how can you help me? And again, this was happened to be an AI and ML workload conversation because customer was bringing more and more dense infrastructure 
um, uh, GPU clustered into into uh, into the data center, and they wanted more and more compute power, and they wanted more and more uh, power to to uh, power those compute racks, right? So this is why we built like I mean and. Uh, Cisco networking blueprint for AI and ML fabric so that we can help customer and give them a prescriptive way is how to configure the fabric using Nexus 9000 switches, which uses underlying Ethernet Rocky V2 uh, fabric. And the capabilities that we provide are high throughput, low latency, as well as lossless fabric for our customers. Not only we give them the hardware, the software, the optical transformers, uh, uh, transceivers, but we also give them a prescriptive way of building that fabric, how to tune there. And there is a complete automation through Nexus dashboard. I mean, they have these fabric templates that they can use to, to build those AI ML fabrics in a, in a matter of minutes. Um, and then we don't stop over there, just like you mentioned, uh, Jeremy, on the CBD side, but we also give them an automation playbook through Ansible that is highly customizable, and they can use that automation playbook to configure that also, right? Yeah, that's right. We take those CVDs that we talked about putting network and compute together, yes. and then we rolled out a couple of FlexPod flash stack for AI inference just back at Partner Summit, which gives customers the ability to get those solutions, which these are new design patterns, right? Yep. That require a lot of power and uh, certainly are things that customers want to be able to make sure that they get the most out of their investment. So having the best practices configuration guides basically inside of these CVDs is very helpful. That way they have the most performance out of their network, yes. the right configurations for compute yeah. across those areas, and then have the opportunity to be able to leverage our CVD playbooks, which are Ansible playbooks, that will allow them to take those industry standard models and put them on top of that flex, uh, flex pod or flash stack to get started. The Cisco validated design have been around for a long time, and that community is so strong when we think about how we can move very quickly with the infrastructure we already have available on the truck today. Yeah. When I think about the customers coming up, okay, we've got a refresh coming up, do I do a one-to-one -one box replacement? The answer is... Nope, we don't have to do that anymore. Yusuf, can you walk us through an example of what you know, an AIML cluster looks like for a modernized data center? Yes, and um, as I mentioned earlier in the beginning, right, that, I mean, we look at all three things. We look at the hardware, we look at the software, and we look at the network design. And power efficiencies can be driven out of the network design and by making some of the very obvious choices. For example, whenever it is time to for server connectivity, mm -hmm. you can use passive copper cables instead of the optical transceivers, and that saves you a lot of power. I mean, if you look at it, this slide, on the left-hand side, there's a traditional design which is in place with a lot of customers where you have modular spines and that are like front-ended with the fixed leaf switches. Um, and in, in this particular scenario, these are the 25-gig server-facing ports and roughly about 3,000 ports on the server side. The reason we chose the number 3,000 ports because this is... Uh, it, this is very similar to some of the high-density GPU cluster that we see in production in customer environments. But you can have a similar design with fixed chassis, both for leaf as well as the spine. The benefit of that is now suddenly, instead of 25 gig attached to the server, you can have 100 gig attached to the server. Instead of 100 gig going from leaf to spine, you have 400 gig from leaf to spine. So your I.O. bandwidth is almost four times now. At the same time, you are saving power 61%, and you are saving space as 71%. So that is the example, because all this power savings, all this space saving, can be utilized for compute racks that you can bring it without adding any additional power to your data center. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's wild to think at how all of these things can, can so quickly come together for a topic that we were barely scratching the surface on you know, even a year ago. When we think about Cisco building this overall AI-ready infrastructure all the way down, it really started with our Silicon One chip years ago and making sure that that was power ready. Cisco recently founded the Ultra Ethernet Consortium. Um, we also are working with a lot of other standard bodies and boards making sure that it's not just Cisco trying to out their lead because we have to work with so many other vendors in this space. Things like the Emerge Alliance, Analytics Foundation project called uh, scalable, sustainable infrastructure. There's all of these works um, that we're doing with other vendors in the industry to help move standards along. And AI-ready infrastructure is, is one of those, was one of those places. 
What else are you sort of excited about um, no, for Cisco You're space? absolutely right. I mean, the reason we are able to bring these power efficiencies is because we have complete focus towards sustainability. And Silicon One is a huge piece of that, uh, that strategy, but at the same time, we are paying attention to all the other aspects also. I mean, I talked about the system design. I talked about the uh, heat sink design, power supply designs, cooling technologies that we are researching at the same time. Uh, you're very right that we are a founding member of the Ultra Ethernet Consortium because we firmly believe that Ethernet is the right connectivity technology. I mean, any time that we have bet, anybody who has bet against Ethernet has never won, right? So, I mean, we have seen these transformations happen time and again in the industry, whether it is voice over IP, whether it is video technology, whether it is distributed databases. I mean, Ethernet has pro basically proven to be the right technology. And we believe that we can further enhance Ethernet to bring more performance and more resiliency that is suitable for AI workloads. Yeah. And I mean, I think the key here is there's a tremendous amount of new technology that wasn't here a year ago. And when you think about data center consolidation and even consolidating your data center to make room for AI, yeah. it's really about helping customers reduce that physical footprint, reduce the number of components that they use, yeah. reduce the amount of power that those components need, right. and then drive costs out of the business, both from a capital and operational perspective, so that they can do the new things and innovate with AI. And if we do that, it's just a really big win for our customers and it's a really big win for the environment. It is. And we want all the old gear back because we can responsibly recycle and remanufacture it. We can. All right. Well, thank you both. Thank you. Thank yep. you very much. Thank you. We are not stopping there. Cisco, across our end-to-end -end life cycle value chain, is looking at, are looking at programs and additional incentives. So not only will we take your, your product back for free, yes, we'll come pick it up directly from your, your, your front door, but we'll also give discounts to make sure that we're getting that useful equipment back in a time frame that we can do something with it. So Green Pay is a, is a program that is available globally that will literally give customers and partners additional discount, ensuring that we're going to get that product back in the right time frame. We're also expanding our partner community. I think we have over 400 partners now who have done the partner specialization around sustainability. And we've done the count. We have global funding offices around the world. Governments to the tune of $11 trillion across 15 countries, we have counted, are putting money in for the next handful of years to further accelerate the acceleration of digital infrastructure, AI and energy efficiency, whether it's in the campus environment, the built space, data centers, and new technologies. There is so much money out there that is helping to further accelerate all of us on that journey. CX has talked about the sustainability services. So if you as a customer aren't quite sure where to start, we have advisory services now that are working hand in hand with all the right partners inside of every part, place in network as well as the, re, uh, the local regions. So I really encourage you to take advantage um, of, of, those, of those programs. We also launched, launched recently a sustainability estimator. So if you further have questions on where do I start, we know that most Cisco customers have an existing install base. And if you want to ask yourself the question, what can I do inside of what I already have? What can I do with what's coming up for my natural refresh cycle? These tools will help us answer those questions. And when we think about where we are starting this journey together today and where we're going in the future, wherever you are in this journey, I hope that some of this conversation has just opened your mind a little bit to doesn't matter where you start. We've got things that can get you started today in the visibility and the measurement of the energy usage you have and what those targets look like and what capacity needs to look like for you as you grow in the future, whether it's in the campus or in the data center. And as you're going through the rest of Cisco Live and you're listening to these different sessions, you know, taking actions and, and taking advantage of the resources that are at your fingertips, so much of it starts with making sure you have a baseline of observability and those metrics. And those insights will allow you to make tangible goals and credible, measurable goals for your goals and commitments around sustainability and getting to net zero. And as you think about what's coming in the future, you can know that you have a trusted partner and advisor in Cisco because we're out there working on standard bodies and working with other vendors on what the roadmaps look like 18, 24, 36 months out. 
Later this evening, Cisco's 2023 purpose report will become available. And if this isn't enough information, you really want to dive into all the nuts and bolts of how we count carbon across scopes one, two, and three, and all the various categories of how we need to work together. This purpose report has that and so much more about how Cisco is, is impacting people around the world and truly empowering our purpose to power an inclusive future for all. Thank you so much for being here uh, and have a great rest of your Cisco life. From the Innovation Theater where we heard from Denise Lee around sustainable solutions and asked Cisco is, what is she doing? What, is, what are we doing to empower an inclusive future? So now we have another interview coming up in, on stage B, but before that, I just want to do some housekeeping again, which is you can watch today's broadcast in seven different languages, go on to the translations page, and join the conversation on X, Facebook, Instagram, and use the hashtag, hashtag Cisco Live APJC. So next we have uh, Adam Rice, who is the CISO advisor for Cisco. And over to you, Em, and let's see what we have to hear from him. Thank you so much, Sheikha. Adam, how are you going? I am doing great. Loving it here at Live. Fantastic. I think this is your first Cisco Live as a Cisco employee, is that I correct? I am a newbie at Cisco. I've only been here, I think, six or seven months. Fantastic. So quite, a, quite fresh then. Quite fresh. <laughs> Have you had a walk around the world of solutions yet? I, you know, I stand, I'm a, I'm a stand watcher in the world of solutions. So if you ever swing by the Tallow stand, that's where I'll be uh, telling you about a breach response. Ah, oh, brilliant. Yes. Talos is a fantastic product that we have. I am impressed with it. That's brilliant. So tell us, um, Adam, what is a CISO advisor? So, um, well, a little bit about me. I came up through IT technologies about 30 years ago, because I'm old. <laughs> and uh, and uh, worked my way up to a uh, distinguished engineering role at Lucent in cyber engineering and then moved into management and for 16 years I was the chief information security officer at a number of companies. And so when uh, Cisco hired me, my job is to act as a resource to our customer CISOs or their cyber leadership teams. And this is strategic uh, advising everywhere from uh, preparing board presentations to risk management strategies and so on. Just leveraging my experience uh, when I was a chief information security officer. That's great, and I think that's a valuable role to a lot of organizations who may be needing that expertise and the experience that you've had as well. Are you industry specific or do you look at all industries across? Um... So in my career, I worked at, well, I did some consulting, so that was uh, across a lot of industries, but as a CISO, uh, big telecom, tier one telecom, uh, the defense industrial base in the US, hospitality, Hilton, uh, and mining at Rio Cinto. So cybersecurity is, uh, is a skill and, and a uh, trade that kind of lends itself across industry. There's a little learning curve when you come into a new uh, industry, but uh, at the end, it all runs on uh, IP-based networking, mm -hmm. usually. And I guess I was about to say, those industries are quite different if you're moving from the hospitality industry and then into mining. I guess they don't have a lot of similarities, but perhaps in the cyberspace, they do? In many ways, they do, right? You're protecting what's precious, and you're following industry standards. You're doing what's reasonable to protect the enterprise. You're watching for trouble, and you're responding to trouble. and, and that. Those things that uh, need to be done by a corporate cyber team kind of are the same across a lot of industries. Obviously, Financial Services Institute put a lot of money into cyber because they got money, people try to steal it. Um, but it is pretty much the same job. Now, there are people who say, oh, wait, nuance, there are a lot of differences. But yes, it, it works well across industries, absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. So picking into your experience a little bit, uh, what's your most exciting job that you've had? So for about uh, 10 years, I worked in the defense industrial base in the United States. And I worked at two companies that did uh, like top secret and secret program work for the U.S. Department of Defense. And so from the time I started in those companies to the time I left, it was every day bar fighting, fist fighting, scrapping <laughs> with all the usual suspects. 
uh, that were coming in, nation state cyber espionage crews, Chinese, Russians, Iranians, all those people were trying to come into our uh, networks and steal our stuff. And uh, it was in some ways very pure because if you made a mistake, you knew about it right away because they would see it and they would come in. And uh, it, was, it was truly uh, about 10 years of every day you woke up and it was, you, you had to be on point because if, if you let something slip or something happen on, it, on the enterprise, uh, they would be in. They were very good, very capable adversaries. I had a lot of fun doing that. That was yeah. a good time. Was it like the movies? Well, I imagine it's like the movies. But <laughs> the movies where the big screens and the dark rooms with people guessing passwords in two seconds. No. Uh, but it, it, I mean, we would sit there and watch on the screen while the adversaries coming from wherever were in our network actually stealing credentials and trying to steal things. And we worked a lot with the U.S. government, uh, the FBI's National uh, Security Cyber Squad, and we got a lot of threat intelligence that way. And, um, and it was good because when you worked for the uh, defense industrial base, if you did have a problem, it wasn't reportable because you're doing the work on behalf of the U.S. government, and they don't want it in the newspapers either. So uh, in some ways, not as regulated as privacy data, but certainly very exciting times. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I can, I can imagine. Uh, I liked it. That's great, and that would have been 365 days a year. You know, the bad guys always came at us during the holidays, so when I did this job at this one company, every Christmas for three years, we got hacked. Oh, on Christmas, Christmas Day. Day. <laughs> you have to say, sorry, family, I've got to go. <laughs> I actually was visiting Sydney. I was in the States. I was visiting family in Sydney, and I got the phone call in Sydney. at a $5,000 phone bill, because I oh. was on the phone back to the States for, I think, like 15 hours. I was going to get on a plane and go home, and uh, my team was like, no, no, you know, we got it. But yeah, Christmas Day, every every Christmas for three years, we got breached. Oh, man, and that's why you need a robust security strategy. You know, you don't want to be woken up. It would be great yeah. if they could work between the hours of 9 to 5. They don't. <laughs> they don't. Well, they don't work U.S. hours, or yeah. well, maybe Australian hours, closer. Potentially. I mean, because the adversaries literally go to work every day. They work 9 to 5. They're in a building. They leave, they go home, they take vacation. It's all, it's all the same. But they got a bigger budget than I did. <laughs> the bad guys had a lot bigger budget than I had. Yeah. Actually, so you mentioned that you were an engineer previously to becoming, before becoming a CISO. Yep. What was that transition like for you? I, uh, I resisted getting into management because, I, I don't know, I really enjoyed my job as an uh, engineer. I did kind of top out, and uh, a couple things happened. Mm -hmm. The internet bubble burst, and there was that huge correction in the market in the early 2000s. Um, and I took that opportunity to get, I, I was talking to my mentor and to just put in my uh, hat in the ring for a couple of management jobs, and a chief was becoming a thing. So I got my first uh, chief security officer job at Tata Communications and actually moved to India for a couple of years. And I also built their managed security services. But it is a different job, right? If you come up through the engineering ranks and you think that your future is uh, CISO or another cyber leadership job, it's, it's great when you have CISOs that do come up through technology and have that background. It just makes the job easier. But it's not the same job. Mm -hmm. If you're a great cyber technologist, it does not mean you're going to be a great CISO. CISO, the role of CISO has evolved from being what used to be just a cybersecurity technology leader, project, firewall, stuff like that, to really managing corporate risk. So the largest non-financial risk that many organizations face is cyber risk, right? Like hurricanes or earthquakes or whatever, right? Non-financial risk. So to be an effective CISO, you're not going to talk to the board or the CEO about technology. You're going to have to qualify it as a business risk, and you're going to have to demonstrate strategies to either reduce the risk at a cost and balance cost over usability and a number of other things. But if you go to uh, the board and talk technology, everyone's eyes will glass over. They're not going to really care what you have to say. So you've got to learn that coming out of technology. 
uh, you have to learn to be a risk manager and manage risk as well as uh, the new regulations. Make sure that you're, the organization you're working for uh, doesn't get in trouble with privacy regulations. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess there's an entire new set of influences that you're talking to as a CISO versus Absolutely. when you're an as an engineer. Yeah, it used to be uh, really, you stayed in your lane within technology and now a modern CISO is dealing with the uh, legal team all the time, the corporate risk team all the time, compliance team, all of those people, and business continuity, right? Mm. So uh, within that transition as well, were there particular skills or knowledge that you think transferred really well between that role? Or I assume you don't necessarily need to be a principal like a security architect to become a CISO in that space or right. vice versa. I, I think that the thing that I had to do was learn governance, risk, and compliance, GRC, which is a, is a typical part of a cyber organization now has a GRC element. But those people are usually hired out of things like financial audit. <laughs> Right, pre-law, completely different set than your, you know, your sec ops people who are engineers. And if you're a technologist, nobody wants to do GRC. It was boring, and uh, so I went in hard with GRC and learned the ropes there, and that helped me an awful lot in taking the message that this isn't just a technology weakness we have. This is an existential risk to the organization that will cost us money, time, reputation and making that translation for uh, the business leaders to be able to balance usability, cost, and risk, because it's their decision to accept the risk or not, not mine. I never said no. I said, sure, but here's the risk. And uh, if you do that well, I think that's 80% of the job. So in, in a sense, almost, that say so is if there was a Venn diagram would be sitting in between the GRC organization and then the technology part of the organization to make sure that they connect at least yeah, I mean, within cyber, there's a GRC group. Okay. Absolutely. Dedicated, and they tie into corporate risk. Of course, if you balance this out, the difference between a small business and a super large enterprise, there's a lot of difference where smaller businesses, one person does five things, and the larger the organization, then you have dedicated staff. But the role is pretty much the same. You've got to measure risk. It's about risk management. And to do that, it's technology. It's people and it's process. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Actually, so I'm really, really curious. You spend a lot of time talking to CISOs who are working in other industries. What are the greatest challenges um, that you see there? Or what are you talking to them about in that cybersecurity space? So I think uh, the challenges that CISOs have now, and it's just all the usual stuff, is there's not enough qualified people who do the work. So the people who do do the work are expensive. Retaining good staff is always a challenge. Um, I think that a lot of CISOs struggle to get the message out and kind of pivot into a pure risk, be able to describe what they're doing in terms of business risk. Um, I help CISOs with that. Uh, I think that uh, the thing that they are looking at now, coming over the future, uh, Horizon, and everybody's talking about it everywhere. I'll just say it, it's AI. We almost got through everyone's the Everyone's got to say AI. I mean, it's not, everyone's <laughs> saying AI. And the reason why I think AI is going to be something that people have to pay attention to is not, it's just because it's such a question mark. Nobody knows where it's going to go. Everybody who knows a lot about AI and AGI know that it's going to be revolutionary. And, uh, a lot of the things people talk about AI doing, code writing, da, 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 all this stuff, easily translates into much faster and more precise pinpointed attacks. If somebody leverages AI, they're going to get to the they're going to get to the root of the problem to exploit your network very quickly, where it took time and resources before, because there used to be an ad you needed to make your network just strong enough that the bad guys would go to your competitor and hack them because they didn't want to spend the resources to get into your network. But now that cost of, of, of doing business for the bad guys leveraging AI will come way down. Uh, spear phishing emails. You're, you're not going to see the uh, Nigerian prince asking you to send him a thousand bucks so he can give you the 20 million that's just <laughs> laid around for you. These spear phishing emails are going to be point on. Deep fakes. Uh, recordings of the CEO's voice, pictures, all this stuff is going to be, uh, you're not going to know if it's real or not, right? 
And the bad guys, if they can find a way to leverage that to do their evil deeds, they're going to do it probably better than the people will be Give doing to protect for. against it, right? Yeah. No, thank you. It's been really insightful to hear about your role as a CISO advisor. Yep. And I think if you want to hear more, we've got lots of conversations around security at the moment. But at this point, we're going to go back into the studio and we're going to move towards to an iTalk. So yep. thank you so much, Adam, yep. and uh, pleasure you. to talk to you. Thank you for having me. All right, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm sure some of you heard me talk about full stack observability and how we can help deliver that flawless digital experience in the morning keynote session. But for those of you who didn't get a chance, so we'll cover some of those and then we have some fantastic demo, uh, which you will be delighted to see it. So let's just double click on it. We live in a digital world. Digitization is not a new thing at this point. Every industry and vertical, you see it, is on this journey. And I'm sure you all are sort of trying to drive this across your business. Whether it's your retail store, a point of sale, right? people are monitoring the campaigns they run from a point of sale through the digitization journey. Whether you're trying to do your laundry or you're running an e-commerce retail site, all of those entities are super focused on how do we make sure that we deliver that flawless digital experience. But we wouldn't be here if we didn't have challenges, right? This is where, if you look at it, we did the survey of users who use, your users as well, who use some of the applications which we built it. And it was interesting to notice that 62% said that they expect exceptional experience. I would say it's probably 90% plus, all of us, right? This is, this is, we have come to expect that at 2 a.m., if I'm going to do a transaction on my bank, I want to make sure that it works. There is no downtime, there's no maintenance window, right? The users are expecting us to deliver something which is always on and always works and always flawless. They get the job done. In fact, 88% unfortunately reported that they were experiencing some sort of problem with the application they were using it. And the last stat, which is very interesting, 68% <clears throat> actually said they wouldn't hesitate to remove the application, whether it's on their mobile phone, or switch the vendor if it didn't meet that digital experience they were expecting. And I know you all also from um, supporting this application for your enterprises, understand this very well. 80% of you participated in the survey, uh, which said, you know what, we do struggle. We do have a challenges here in terms of delivering that experience. And we talk about 56%, and I talk about this morning, 56% of the uh, participants said they have 10 or more tools. Actually, the surprising stat was there were 10% of the participants who said they have anywhere more than 100 plus tools. Just think about it. Take a minute and think about it, 100 plus observability tool, right? Even if your scenario, you don't have 100, even if you have 10 or more, and when you have outages, and we have seen some big outages around the world, not having the right set of insight really puts you all in a really difficult position because your CIO and your executive leadership team is trying to figure it out what is going on. They go to the network team, they go to the security team, they go to the application team, they go to the infrastructure team. Everybody has their own dashboard, which looks green. But at the end of the day, still, the customer is seeing a problem, right? And this is where we really need to do better as an industry. In fact, 71% of you already figured this out, saying, hey, you know what? We really need to think about bringing this data together. Because when you bring the data together from different tools, magic happens. You start to get the insights, which you wouldn't have got it if you had all those four or five or 10 tools deployed in an environment. It's just when we start to put the data together, suddenly a lot of possibility opens up. A lot of possibility in terms of being predictive and proactive opens it up. This is where we've been working on it, what we call it full stack observability. So we're really looking at 
every domain and every component your application depends upon. You know, when, when we started looking at application performance monitoring 10 years back, it was all about APM tool. It's all about looking at the business transaction of your applications, looking at the database monitoring, looking at the end user monitoring. Those are extremely important, and that's where we believe the full stack observatory journey starts. But what has happened is your applications have started getting deployed across public cloud, private cloud, colos, multiple data centers, multiple different public clouds. And now your users are coming from all over the world. So if you just think about that distributed system, it's quite complex, right? You really need to think about all the components. And we, when we think about all the components where your application depends upon, is the networking, security, multi-cloud infrastructure, virtual, or Kubernetes, right? So we are looking at full stack observability from all the dependent components, really trying to bring the right side of telemetry in a common data lake so that we can start to do those insights. The traditional approach, if you look at it, a lot of uh, vendors have done it. Bring all the data in one data lake, and we'll figure it out, the insights. At Cisco, we've taken that approach really differently. Because when you start to bring all unnecessary data, it's going to cost you a lot of money. So we are actually very intentional about what data we bring whether it's your digital experience monitoring or a business observability, we're bringing that right set of telemetry so that we can correlate and give you that insight. More importantly, the place where I feel we really differentiate well compared to anybody else out there is our ability to tie performance with a business outcome. And the classic example I like to give it is, if you're a retailer, if you're an e-commerce site, and you have a checkout cart, and let's say your checkout transaction is failing. Now, there are a lot of tools out there which will tell you, saying, hey, you know what? They have a performance issue on the checkout card. There are very few tools who actually can tell you, because it's a Black Friday or it's a big sales event, you have a million dollar worth of inventory sitting in the checkout card, which your customers are not able to uh, check it out right, and order it. Versus it's a regular day, and it's only going to affect $10,000. Understanding that business KPI is where we are able to really differentiate, right? So this is where unlocks your possibility to have that conversation with your business partners in terms of how full stack observability and why this matters. Really to double click in terms of what are those set of use cases, I'd like to invite Ananda Rajgopal, who runs all the product for App Dynamics and full stack observability on the stage so that we can get into the details and get to see some demos. Ananda, welcome. Thank you, Ronak. <clears throat> so let's dive a little bit deeper into what exactly full stack observability is. So to make it simple for you, we have broken it down into seven key use cases. And we have categorized these into four key themes, observe, secure, optimize, and also extend the value with partner developed modules. So if you look at observe, you have the ability to observe your applications that could run on hybrid infrastructure or perhaps on cloud infrastructure. We typically call these as backend applications. You could also be observing the experience that your end users are facing for the applications that you're offering through perhaps mobile phones or what they're accessing through the browser. You could also uh, have an application's dependency monitoring that's being observed. You could also secure these applications, so it's not just sufficient to look at vulnerabilities, for example, in isolation, but kind of look at them in the context of business risk. And from a point of view of optimization, today cost is important. Cost is oftentimes also used as a proxy for sustainability. You could also optimize the resources. So those are two different use cases that we can solve with full stack observability. And as I mentioned, these serve the needs of different personas. They could be in network operations, they could be application operations, they could be security operations, and many more. The context that we provide from a business perspective can be layered on top of this, which is kind of the unique value that we surface. And last but not the least, the extension with the ecosystem modules. Now, maybe some of you are customers from an app dynamics perspective, or perhaps been using it for five or 10 years, or just started the journey recently. Perhaps you're not a customer at all. That's totally okay for now. But we help you 
to start the journey to full stack observability, regardless of where you are. You could either start with monitoring your hybrid applications, or perhaps your modern applications with Cisco AppDynamics or with the Cisco observability platform. And those seven use cases enable you to start by optimizing your journey for that specific use case that is most important for your organization. So let's look at Cisco observability platform and double click a little bit on what we mean by extensibility. You notice that there are certain modules that you see here that are represented in blue and a few that are represented in gold. The beauty of the Cisco observability platform, it's a platform that is purpose built for full stack observability that is based on open telemetry. Cisco, along with Splunk, happens to be two of the three uh, primary contributors, along with Amazon, to the standard for open telemetry. And we take in metrics, events, logs, and traces, have built a highly scalable model that enables us to innovate with modules and applications that we deliver on part of Cisco and are also able to extend this with partner developed innovations. Last month in November, we had our partner summit and we announced key innovations that were extended and developed by our partners. For example, service level observability that you see there or machine learning ops that you see there. And those were areas where our partners extended the value. So that's one of the key attributes that we offer with the Cisco observability platform. Now these extensions could also uh, obviously come from Cisco itself. What you see here is innovations at various layers of the stack. Could be applications, database, Kubernetes, cloud services that we could be using. And every one of these data sources are represented as entities that are modeled inside the platform that enables you to get deep visibility up and down the stack. And remember, it is married with the business context. Let's look at one of the specific use cases. Ronak spoke about this earlier in the morning, and we'll actually see a demo of this shortly. So if you look at an application that is being used by one of your, uh, by, by your end users, they may be accessing it from a mobile application. They could be perhaps ac accessing it through a browser. But when you think about it, it's not as if the mobile application is directly interacting with the backend. There's this little thing called the internet in between the two. And moreover, the application could also be having certain backend services that are being accessed, perhaps other SaaS services is being called. Maybe there is a multi-cloud architecture, perhaps a hybrid architecture that's being used. So there's actually some fairly elaborate um, uh, invocations that are happening across this entire path. One of our customers actually noticed that it took up to five hours for them to triage and find out what exactly was the cause of the problem because they were using different tools for each of these. You know, uh, a tool for end user monitoring, one for mobile, one for browser, one for synthetics for the API endpoint, one for the internet, um, and something different for the backend application. And this kind of a fragmented tool sprawl is simply not efficient when um, something doesn't work. And with full stack observability, they were able to cut that down from something which was almost five hours down to less than 15 minutes. The way we do this is by having data-driven bi-directional integration using Cisco Thousand Eyes and the solutions that we have with Cisco App Dynamics and full stack observability. And what you see here is both application dependency mapping being exported from, um, fr from the users and devices to Thousand Eyes, and likewise the network telemetry information being ingested. So this enables the observability and network intelligence to come together. It, but it's not just about internet monitoring. We are really redefining the category of digital experience monitoring by also adding session replay capability to it. So sometimes there is this long tail of problems that perhaps is affecting only a certain class of customers that is very difficult to troubleshoot. So your application developers need to really know what is actually happening there. And you want to kind of understand those clicks that are happening in terms of the user journey. Um, the way I'd like to explain session replays, this is the equivalent of packet capture in the network world, right? And you want to kind of really replay the entire sequence of operations that happens for a customer from a user session perspective. And this level of insight that you get from a video analytics perspective is super powerful. Now, I know that a demo is worth a thousand slides. So to help us do an actual demo, I'd like to invite Renato Kedas on stage, who is a director of engineering. Come on up. 
Hi, Jim, man. Thank you, Renato, for joining. So, is all this real? It is real. Okay. Right. Let's take a look at our real scenario then. Can put the screen on. All right. So, as you can see here, when I land on the application, I immediately caught that there are alerts going on. I'm in the DEM space, so we're talking about how do we evaluate the user experience across browser and mobile. This is consolidating all the alerts that I have, and the application does a pretty good job of looking at those and just filtering out the ones that really matter. And let's take a look at those alerts. So when I land here, I can see alerts of different types, and at the top of them, there was one saying Core Web Vitals. Core Web Vitals is a very important measurement in this day and age, like Ronak was referring for people taking their applications out. Google came up with a set of metrics to help people understand when something is doing well or not, and actually that impacts how the application is searched, how it's ranked on Google search pages, and things like that. So it's something that you as an application provider has to pay attention a lot. So let's take a look at that one because it's impacting us. Let's take a look at that one. So when I land here, now I got details of the particular alert that we got, and as you can see, the users that are take, being impacted by this alert are distributed across Australia. Right? There's about 777 users being impacted, and our system has captured that impact live with our session replay. So what I'm going to do here is, let me see, I got my, lose my, oh, can you guys hear me now? Most likely. It's good. It's okay. The beauty of being bald. So now when you're here, you can basically look at the sessions. So these are all those sessions that were recorded that got impacted. So if I open a session, I will see live exactly what that user went through. And of course, you can see that it's slowing when it loads, and that's not good. So that's probably what's going on with my core web vital. You can also see that with PII, we do redaction on the screen, so you can see what is particular PII driven. So I scroll down here because I want to find out what's going on. So I can see which metric was violated. It's the largest content pane. It's taking too long for render. And when I go into the breakdown, I can see all the metrics related to my application, but I can see that it was a call to the server. This signal here says, actually, we know more about what happened here. We're not only telling you what's going on. If I click on it, I realize, oh, wait a second. Actually, this guy experienced a networking issue. So the alert came up from the experience, and now it's saying, we know something about what happened with the networking that might be impacting you. So let's take a look at that alert. Now I'm looking at a thousand eyes alert. So we capture, like Ananda was explaining, we get all the data through the thousand eyes pipe, we correlate that with the user experience so we know which pages people are using, and I can see here that actually the problem is with my payment app that we use, the API that we use, the third party. If I scroll down, you will notice that the problem actually is bigger than we thought because not only my e-commerce app is being impacted, I also have all these other apps that are being impacted by the same payment API. And I can see right now, Amanda, that the e-commerce guys, we thought it was a problem. Actually, the marketing microsite is someone that we need to go talk to. Nice. So I think what you just showed here is not just internet monitoring with Thousand Eyes, not just Google Analytics with Core Web Vitals, but also the end user response times, all of them integrated into one offering that is effectively the digital experience monitoring That's offering. exactly what it is. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Renato, for joining thank us you. today. So customer digital experience monitoring is just one example of the seven use cases that we spoke about. In the interest of time, we won't be demonstrating business risk observability, but this is another case where rather than looking at vulnerability scores and threat intelligence in isolation, we're marrying that with the business context to surface a business risk score between 1 and 1,000 that kind of gives you an idea in terms of how high the business risk is. What does that mean? So if you look at a vulnerability score, let's say 9.8, you would think, oh, that's critical. But last year, 26,000 vulnerabilities were disclosed in the year 2022. That's a lot for an application developer to deal with. When you kind of marry the business context with that, there's now a differentiation between 
uh, two vulnerabilities that may have the same vulnerability score, but depending on the business risk associated with that, you have the ability to triage and understand which ones to prioritize first. I would encourage you to check out the demo for this in the world of solutions in the Cisco App Dynamics and Full Stack Observability booth, because you'll see how we help to detect vulnerabilities um, also uh, understand any API security issues that could happen with a business risk, risk observability solution. Of course, no innovation talk is complete without a reference to AI. So today, we're actually able to un uh, uncover any of the open AI calls that could be made by your applications in Java or Python agents, and that enables you to understand the cost associated with the open AI calls, the metrics that are being used, um, any kind of A-B testing that could be done with that. But that's just the beginning in terms of what we call as LLM monitoring. Pretty soon, we're also coming up with a prompt interface that enables you to converse in natural language, kind of very similar to what you saw in the keynote today for the security products. We're also bringing that to our observability products and also an AI assistant for summarization and root cause analysis, a short demo of which was done by Ronak in the morning keynote. Um, this is an example of the dashboard that you see today. Uh, it is available for all AppDynamic SaaS customers. Now, all of this is, of course, wonderful, but I'm sure many of you are wondering, how does this work in real life with the customer? So I'd love to, uh, to roll a video of how Coles has actually seen observability in action. Could you please roll the video? We never really had a lens on when there's an IT incident going on, how is it affecting the business? Together with Cisco Services Tank, we created dashboards to bring all that data together to give us the answer we were looking for. The time to resolution has gone from days, weeks, or even not knowing, to being able to identify the issue in hours. With Cisco, we're making a change, and we're actually delivering the value that the business expects. Well, thank you so much, Karen and Andrew, for joining us today mm -hmm. from, Cole, from Coles. Andrew Green is head of technology services, core technology services at Coles, and Karen is head of workplace experience and support at Coles. Thank you so much for joining today. Uh, it's actually a fantastic story that, uh, that you've shared here, but I'd love to ask you some questions to understand more for our audience. Uh, first mm -hmm. of all, uh, the customer experience is paramount to your brand and business. Karen, could you share how a focus on improving observability is helping to impact the customer experience at Coles? Yes, thanks, Ananda. Um, well, I guess, as we all know, uh, a really good customer experience is, is not made up of just one thing. It's, it's 100 different things that have to work together in harmony. Uh, and, and from our point of view, it therefore doesn't make sense to look at those 100 individual uh, things in isolation. Um, so what we're trying to do at Coles and, and have just started, I would say, is really switch our way of thinking so that we are looking at things from a more end-to-end -end services uh, perspective. So uh, bringing all of those things together and into one view. And I guess where appropriate or, or where we can, we want to move from those traditional ways of working, I guess, where we, we might have monitored sort of components or applications or infrastructure um, in isolation and then individually analyze the outputs of those to either try and, you know, process of elimination or um, to decide where tech support would be, would be best directed. Um, and that's the shift in the way that we want. We want to shift that way of working. Um, and I guess in, in that particular example, we were able to demonstrate a level of observability uh, for our, um, our Wi-Fi experience. I'll call it Wi-Fi. It ended up not being Wi-Fi. Um, uh, through the dashboards uh, of AppD. And, and we see real opportunity in, in continuing to do that um, for our, the experience for our store team members, but also ultimately our, our customers. Nice. Um, Andrew, when we were speaking a few days back, you had a, a wonderful story about collaboration um, and not looking at problems in a silo. So how did you partner with Cisco uh, to focus on the business impact and help the teams to work collaboratively across your organization? 
Uh, well, we'd already partnered with Cisco. So we'd already invested heavily as an organisation in the Cisco tool sets. And we had all, or we have all the Cisco tool sets, but we've also got other partner um, solutions as well. When we looked at a specific example um, in our store network, and if you think about Coles as an organisation, the only thing that we need to do is to help feed the nation ultimately and make sure that there's food on the shelves so when customers come in, we can provide them what they want when they need it. And part of that ecosystem, if we look at it really simply, is we need the network to work, we need the devices that the team members um, use to make sure we've got stock on the shelves to work, and we need the application at the back end to work. And what we were finding, and maybe I'm overly sensitive because I've got network within my accountability, is the network was a really simple thing to solve, uh, to, to blame. So it was always the network's fault, um, which I was reasonably upset it's always about. always the network, as I say. Always, always. <laughs> um, so what we challenged the team to do is we've invested in these tools. We've got some really smart people doing great things in isolation. So we're looking at the Wi-Fi using DNAC or Cisco Catalyst Center. We're looking at our devices with Thousand Eyes. We're looking at the application with AppD, and we're getting individual telemetry from those, but how can we extract the maximum value from all three of those? So rather than being told where the problem wasn't, it's not Wi-Fi or it's not the device or it's not the application, we were able to triangulate that data and actually work out where the problem was, because ultimately as a technology function, the team member on the floor didn't care where the problem wasn't, they just wanted it to work. And so our only measure of success was whether that team member experience was really good. Um, and through, the, through pulling our own internal teams together and partnering with Cisco and using that deep product knowledge, we were able to pull that all together, create some dashboards. So rather than waiting, or sometimes never finding out, but waiting days or weeks to see where we might have had a problem, we're now in a position where we can actually identify them really quickly and a team member may not even know about it anymore, but we can zero in as to whether it, in, in fact, is very rarely a Wi-Fi problem, yeah. or it's PDT, or it is in the application, or indeed somewhere else. And we've been starting to use that model elsewhere in our environment as well. Nice. Um, any advice for our audience based on your experiences with observability? Uh, well, f for me... You've probably got the tools already. It's actually about extracting the maximum value from those. And I would encourage you to, it sounds like a cliche, but really partner with your Cisco team because they do have that deep product knowledge. You may have that, or you will have that knowledge within your company about how your company operates and understand that really, really well, but you augment it with that deep product knowledge. And I think you'd be genuinely surprised at what you can actually achieve and extract out of things you've already got, especially at the moment. Lots of people want more for less, but I actually look at it and think, I just want more from what I've already got. So mm. it's, it's there for you. So I just encourage you to look at what you've got and extract that, that value from it. Nice. Anything from your side, Karen? You'd like to? Uh, I guess just to add to that, um, one of the the uh, really good things that came out was was how our teams work together. So, so I would be encouraging teams not to only look at their piece. So, so if Andrew only cared about the network and I only cared about AppD, we would never have solved this problem. Yeah. It was only when we actually came together and said, let's. Let's just work it out. Like, it doesn't matter. Just, yeah. just work it out. And that wasn't actually that easy to do. Um, yeah, it is a, a different way of working. But, yeah, persist and you'll get there. Yeah, so well said. We often say that full-stack observability brings teams together. Mm. And I think you're just a fantastic case study in terms of how we've actually put this to practice in, in calls. Well, thank you so much for joining today. Thank you. Karen and Andrew, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. So let's take it to a landing here in terms of what full stack observability delivers. So as you saw, full stack observability delivers relevant, impactful, and actionable business insights for your business that you care about from a business outcomes perspective. You saw from Coles, from both Andrew and Karen, how it breaks down the silos between the teams and helps to 
uh, bring collaboration, foster collaboration between the two, because it's about having that common language, the multiple vantage points through which you could look uh, across the infrastructure. And ultimately, it's about you providing the most optimal and secure experiences to your end users. Thank you again for joining tonight, and have a great day. Hello, everyone. Welcome back from the uh, Innovation Centre there. What an uh, inspiring talk about FSO. And I think FSO really is something resonating right now with all of our customers and something that we need to be talking about more and bringing up in a, in a lot more of our conversations. Uh, it, it, don't, don't be alarmed. If you have missed anything, you can catch up. CiscoLive.com uh, slash on demand uh, will be available from the 20th of December. Catch up on all your on demand uh, learning pieces and talks that have been going on throughout the day. Now, this might be our last session of the day, but we have a lot more interviews and uh, different speakers coming up. So please make sure you stick around and stay tuned. The perfect, seg the perfect segue for me. With me, I have the he uh, Jason Warfield, the Head of Solution and Adoption at Engineering for Cisco Thousand Eyes. Jason, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about your role? Sure. Well, uh, thank you, Dave, for the warm welcome. Um, so I, I lead two teams. The solution engineering team works with customers to help understand their requirements, translate those into use cases, jointly define the success criteria, and prove the value of the platform before the customer makes the investment. And then the adoption engineering team will work with customers after they actually invest in the platform on their adoption journey to make sure they see the value and deliver the value back to the business. Sounds, um, it sounds incredible. But why don't you just tell us all and tell us uh, the viewers as well, what, what is Cisco Thousand Eyes? <laughs> well, uh, that's a great question. We probably <laughs> should have started there. Yeah. Uh, so Thousand Eyes is a digital experience platform that really was born out of a research project by our co-founders, Mohit Ladd and Ricardo uh, Oliveira, uh, where they were researching the internet and they had the foresight to see the importance the internet was gonna play both for businesses and really in people's lives. And what they set out to do was basically be able to provide visibility across the internet as if it was a network that businesses own themselves and really to simplify the complexity of the internet. And uh, we started with one use case around DNS and have since expanded to uh, many others uh, around customer digital experience, for example, uh, where we help customers with everything from moving applications and infrastructure into the cloud to assuring citizen experience uh, for our um, public sector customers, as well as things like assuring the performance of APIs that are critical to a supply chain or e-commerce or uh, a healthcare system. Uh, we also help in the area of hybrid work. So if you look at many, over half, depending on what survey you look at, uh, of people are working at least one day uh, a week remote, uh, now it's critical really to assure that um, we're able to be productive where we choose to work. And that could be in an office with enterprise-grade equipment and highly skilled engineers. It could be at home with a whole host of different provider equipment. Uh, but the important thing is um, being able to extend visibility into the last mile wherever people choose to work to make sure that they can get to the applications and services that drive their productivity. Yeah, a, a, ma a map of the entire internet sounds, uh, sounds like something out of a movie. But uh, <laughs> I think we actually, to help explain a little bit more, I think we actually might have a video. So we're going to go have a, look at the, uh, have a look at the video and a little bit of a demo with that as well. The internet is vast, unpredictable, and far too large for you to monitor on your own. Every year, thousands of outages can impact your customer and employee digital experiences in ways that are often painfully felt, but not clearly seen. Internet Insights is the industry's first internet-wide view of business impacting network and application outages. It's based on Thousand Eyes Global Collective Intelligence data set. Real data, not crowdsourced sentiment. Thousand Eyes monitoring vantage points send probes across the internet to business critical websites, apps, and API endpoints. Billions of measurements every day. 
Together, these billions of daily probes cross thousands of service provider networks and application servers to produce a living map of the internet and application health. With Internet Insights, you get a dashboard view of outages happening across the world, and you can quickly see the location, service or app provider, and scope of the outage. You can even cross-reference it to see if your own monitored applications and websites are affected. For each outage, a topological visualization shows you the network or the application at the center of an outage, the locations of impacted users, and the services and applications that have been affected. You can even drill down to understand the exact parts of the network or app impacted and the locations of the users or destinations impacted. Critical data when you need to escalate to the network or app provider. You can filter outages based on provider, scope, location, impacted applications and users, and more. And a rich alerting engine helps you to stay on top of the portion of the internet that matters to you and your business and share this data quickly and easily with your vendors, customers, and internal stakeholders. Now you can communicate proactively with your customers and employees and escalate issues more effectively with your providers using an authoritative, collectively powered global view of internet health. Internet Insights also helps you address outages more proactively by giving you insight into provider behavior over time. A timeline view charts outage events across an annual window so you can track the reliability of your providers and peers, compare them to one another, and more effectively collaborate with your external providers. With Internet Insights, you can finally manage digital experience at internet scale. How about that? What a, uh, what a great video, great insights for us as well. So now um, let's, uh, let's just go talk a little bit more about how Thousand Eyes and how does Thousand Eyes fit into the Cisco portfolio? Let's look at everything. Yeah, so uh, one of the great things about the Cisco acquisition, so I've been with Thousand Eyes five years. So I joined November 2018. And uh, prior to the acquisition, Cisco was actually a customer. Uh, so... Um, they were using Thousand Eyes, or we, I should say now, were using Thousand Eyes uh, across a number of different use cases. Uh, and we had also done some work jointly around, you know, how can we potentially leverage the hardware uh, to gain, you know, as a vantage point to gain visibility. Uh, so coming in, we already had uh, some idea of how we could actually complement the Cisco portfolio. Uh, but I don't think we fully realized the, the potential that was there really across the broader set of portfolios. So... Um, initially, you know, we did a lot of work around embedding the Thousand Eyes uh, technology into some of the Cisco hardware platforms, starting with the Catalyst 9300, 9400 platforms, uh, then moving to the SD routing platforms with the CAT 8K, uh, and then more recently making the uh, technology available embedded in things like uh, Meraki MX devices as well as WebEx devices. The whole concept there is to be able to help customers get more value out of their investment in Cisco hardware, which is already plugged in and running on the network, to be able to use those as vantage points to gain access to visibility for the services. Uh, but since then, we've actually really worked across the portfolio. Um, so we're doing a lot of work with the security portfolio to uh, provide visibility into uh, hybrid work use cases as well as our upcoming um, SSE launch. Uh, and it's just been exciting to be able to work um, with so many different teams. You mentioned full stack observability, being able to really extend the visibility of our FSO platform to include the user journey to the actual services themselves and be able to answer a, a much broader set of uh, questions for our customers in terms of how do they assure consistently great digital experience for their users, whether those are external customers or internal employees. I was... Uh that, that, that's great. And I was going to touch on some of the, what are some of the advantages of uh, having Thousand Eyes running on some of the Cisco hardware. But I feel like you've touched on all of that already, and it just seems like the, the advantages seem to be endless at the moment. So, Although I will <laughs> say, you know, the question's still valid in that. We do get the question around, um, you know, some of the Cisco uh, platforms already have uh, visibility um, natively embedded in them. So in a lot of ways it's still very complimentary. So if you think about our network assurance strategy more broadly, uh, what we're looking to do for customers is to provide that end-to-end -end visibility. So wherever the service is being hosted, whether it's internal to a customer network, it's being delivered by a SaaS provider, it's hosted in a cloud environment, being able to help assure that end-to-end -end experience for the user, uh, and then being able to identify any kind of problem in the ecosystem delivering that service, 
Um, but then it's important to also have the visibility provided by the, the domain and the Cisco network and cloud solutions because if, if there's an issue internal to the network that our customers own and control, it's important that they could actually deep dive into that and have context around the problem and be able to take the appropriate um, remediation action quickly and effectively. So uh, it, the two do complement each other, so it's still a valid question. So sort of time, time efficiency there as well, time saving Absolutely. as well. So the, what, what are some of the, um, what's some of the additional visibility a user, uh, user can expect when using Thousand Eyes with on their Catalyst or Meraki products? So the additional visibility is really, um, a lot of times, like I mentioned, the services have external dependencies. Uh, and if you think about, you know, once you leave a customer's network, um, even as you traverse a network, you're critically dependent on the internet. Um, the applications that customers host in the cloud, a lot of times are front-ended by uh, content delivery network providers. Uh, customers often have multiple service providers in the mix. Uh, then you factor in the performance of the, the cloud providers themselves. So when you look at um, the, you know, all the different technologies that go into delivering a digital experience, Thousand Eyes really extends that visibility um, end to end. As we mentioned, from a customer perspective, being able to leverage 800 points of presence around the world so that you know what the customer's actual experience is in a given city. If it's an employee, being able to understand their performance wherever they choose to work or roam, uh, and then being able to extend that visibility all the way into where the applications may sit. And if it's a SaaS application, uh, you know, the only visibility you're going to really be able to have is from a platform like Thousand Eyes. But the importance is, you know, the kind of the so what is we be able to, we help um, companies answer the question around, um, what's my experience overall? And if there's an issue, is it application or network related? Is it a problem that I own control and can fix myself? Or do I need to work with one of my partners and providers? And then we provide context around the problem. So we essentially eliminate the need to have those large, triage calls, uh, we help you know, minimize or eliminate the finger pointing, and then we really provide the information that's needed to collaboratively resolve the issue, whether it's an internal or external issue. And um, more importantly, we also give customers information in, that has historical context they can use to continually deliver a better experience to their users as well. So there's a proactive component that they can take advantage of. Finding, finding these issues within sort of minutes rather than hours, I think is sort of a exactly. thing you, you, you run by. So, no, that's, um, that's fantastic. So, let's talk a little bit about acquisitions. Now, we've, uh, Cisco's made uh, several acquisitions over the time. How are these boosting uh, Thousand Eyes capabilities? Sure, um, so uh, we are super excited to have recently made a number of acquisitions. Um, one of which is Sam Knows. So if you look at, well, I guess we've been talking about hybrid work you know, yeah. in, in this session. Uh, so what, the, the great thing with Sam Knows is it really will provide enhanced visibility into the performance of SaaS applications across uh, provider and broadband networks. Uh, and, and that you know, can be a challenging thing to understand. Uh, so being able to actually have visibility in, uh, across provider networks around the world into the most common SaaS applications that we can use to enrich that collective data set in uh, Internet Insights from the video you saw. Uh, we're super excited about that and really deepen our partnership with those providers. Um, in addition, we announced the Acedian acquisition. Mm -hmm. And Acedian has uh, really been very focused on uh, providers as well. Uh, being able to help them provide visibility into the performance of their um, their backbone networks, which are, are critical to de delivering services for customers, and now being able to take that capability and have a much more comprehensive offer for our service providers is something that we're really excited about. Um, and then the other acquisition we made recently is Code BGP, where that's going to allow us to deliver even more value uh, to our customers within the Thousand Eyes platform. Uh, as it relates to BGP-related use cases, which uh, BGP issues can have a major impact on a lot of services and, uh, and a lot of networks. So being able to have more granular visibility and context around any BGP-related changes, that could impact a company's business. Now, Jason, just, uh, we'll finish, just one, one last question about uh, all this as well. And so how do you find that these acquisitions are going to, what are they going to do for our customers from a customer standpoint? Yeah, so I, I think you know, the really nice thing is 
Uh, from a customer standpoint, we're looking at this as a holistic network assurance solution. In fact, just yesterday, I, I was speaking at the Network uh, Innovation Summit about um, you know, Cisco's network assurance solution and how we're looking to bring together the acquisitions we've recently made as well as the capability we already had in the portfolio to deliver more visibility and more value to our customers. And, and I think you know, the simplest way to think about it is, as I, I mentioned earlier, where um, ultimately from a digital experience perspective, it's important to understand the end-to-end the -end performance, but when there's an issue to be able to understand who you need to work with to address that issue. And if it's internal, we'll give you that visibility within our platform. If it's external, we'll give you the, what we call evidence that you can escalate to the provider to resolve those issues in a much more collaborative manner. Jason, thank you so much for your time. We are going to stick around with you. I'm going to ask how I get one of those shirts. But <laughs> we do have another interview in, uh, in our studio as well. So we're going to uh, head over to uh, Sheikah, who's with Jerry Lin, our principal security architect. So Sheikah, I know you're there. Over to you. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Dave, and thanks, Jason. That was amazing. So today I have with me Jerry Lin, who is a principal security architect and a Cisco di Distinguished Live Cisco Live Distinguished Speaker, and he has over 20 plus years of experience in the field. And yeah, he's here with me to talk about security. Welcome, Jason, uh, Jerry, how are you? Hey, Shika, thanks for having me here. I'm happy to be here. Welcome, so let's get right into it. I know a lot of us, our viewers, want to know a lot about security, and it's been top of mind forever. And it's with our ever sort of evolving technologies, I, I see customers are migrating their applications and their data to multi-cloud vendors. So AWS, Google Cloud, Azure. So what sort of complexities does that bring to this scenario? Ooh, that's a good question. So we've been talking to, working with thousands of customers and many of them have started transitioning to cloud, moving their application and data into the cloud. And what we're hearing from customers that they invested in it, however, as they migrate application to cloud, there's a lot of complexity in terms of skill sets, as an example of, for example, if you move stuff or data into AWS, there's one set of configuration, uh, CLI, command set, it requires a specific skill set. And then as you say, okay, I'm gonna go and expand into a second cloud for redundancy sake, now I go into Azure. Now, if you try to configure a firewall, as an example, it's the same protection, but then again, your skill sets are different. It's a whole new look and feel, a whole different command set. Now things get really complex. And now if you start adding on a third cloud, you can imagine a third cloud or a fourth cloud, or just mixing, max, ma matching different things, you have so many different controls, and, and the skill set required to maintain that, it, it's difficult. So, and I always think of it like a, uh, we all have the remote control at home for our TV. We have a remote control for the Xbox. We have a remote control for the cable TV. And my wife always says, geez, uh, which control do I use, right? They all have an on button. Which on button do I push? Yeah, That's the complexity yeah. we're facing today that customers are thinking, this is too hard to do, and, and hopefully Cisco can help us. And fortunately yeah. for us, Cisco does have a solution for that. Like yeah. we, we announced our security vision by G2 uh, two years ago, and we're starting to fill that security vision. And we recently announced the cloud protection suite, as an example. And cloud, within the cloud protection suite, there is a piece called the multi-cloud defense, which comes from um, an acquisition called vault -Tex, and is designed to help our customers solve the complexity problem across multi-cloud. That's what, I think that does make Cisco stand out in so many ways in terms of our security, and I think that's something our customers do want to hear for sure. So from what I'm hearing, it seems like this could be a very complex problem that and a big challenge for our customers. So would it be right to assume that there is a talent shortage considering you would need different sort of skill set for, let's say, Google Cloud or Azure or AWS? So how are customers coping, and again, what's Cisco doing uh, to help that? Yeah, you really touch on a sore spot of talent shortage in the cybersecurity industry. Yeah. Uh, our customers, including Cisco, were finding hard to find the right talent. And especially as we migrate into multi-cloud, we just talked about the different complexities, right? If I configure a firewall in Azure, it's slightly different than a firewall in AWS. And so the learning curve is hard. And yet, even learning, if you learn it now, what do I have to do? I have to continue to train 
uh, to not train myself but other uh, staff members to learn all of these. So it's being very difficult. So what is Cisco doing? Uh, we're trying to abstract the complexity across multiple clouds. I don't want to ask you to install, install a bunch of firewalls in different clouds and manually tune everything. We were providing a unified solution, and that's the multi-cloud defense that I was telling you about that. Our multi-cloud defense was designed just for that. We are abstracting the complexity, meaning that we're providing one unified policy, one unified console for our customer to manage a policy across all different clouds. So that means I configure one policy, I make a change, and I hit configure and deploy, and it gets deployed down to three clouds, if you do have three clouds, all from it. And just think of it as, um, you know, I, I used to do some web development as well. Like when I try to develop a web page, I had, when I first learning, I had to learn the HTML commands of here's the header, here's the bold, here's the font, uh, lots of low level details. But today, how do I do coding for a web page? I don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. I have tools, yeah. I have set that says, I drag and drop, configure, I want this page to look really nicely, push a button and it pushes it down for me. Yeah. It really simplifies it yeah. using our multi-cloud defense solution. Yeah, definitely, and we've come a long way in terms of manually doing things and now like yeah. a lot of, and we had so much talk about AI as well earlier. Yeah. So you mentioned and you touched on the multi-cloud defense solution that Cisco is offered, and it does sound very new, but how can customers scale with this solution and mm -hmm. how can they get started and get implemented? I'm sure a lot of us want to hear about that. Yeah, so we're making it easy and that means our customers simply log into the multi-cloud defense portal, right? It's a cloud portal, it's all cloud-based. You log into the portal in three simple steps. The first step is just to uh, onboard, create a tenant for yourself or our customers. And then the second step is go ahead and give us read or write access into your tenant so we can gain visibility. That's the key piece. You can't protect what you can't see. So we want to gain visibility and we can simply enable read access capability. We see what you have and analyze your traffic, give you visibility of your data to see if that looks normal or not. And then the third step is once you're comfortable, we can enable read write, give us read write access. Now we can enable a policy, okay? And again, enable a policy meaning that I configure a policy based on traffic analysis and I push and it gets pushed to, into three different clouds or four different clouds all automatically. And, and performance is an example, right? We know about auto scaling in cloud. When you exceed a certain bandwidth, your web server gets filled. What do you have yeah. to do? You have to create another one. You have to create another one to scale as customers demand. Well, all that requires a whole lot of plumbing behind the scenes like load balancers. You have to configure load balancers. Well, how do you load balance across multiple servers or, or, or appliances and scale down when you don't need it? What about routing? All those things re require a lot of tuning and configuring, but we don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. But the uh, multi-cloud defense automate and orchestrate that solution for you all from a single UI. You don't have to worry about the low level details. That's you the do, beauty of it. You do make it sound easy, but also you have you are a principal architect, so I think but I think that's really incredible. And again, I think what we were talking about earlier is how we're trying to automate most mm, of the yes. work. Because obviously I'm an engineer as well in collaboration space and there was so much stuff and a lot of things were on prem and we had to manually do things, but a lot of we've come a long way, we automated so much, and I think that's what Cisco is doing in the security yeah. space as well. And that does get the customers excited. Um, um, let's shift gears a bit and let's talk about XDR a bit. Um, mm -hmm. So Cisco has been in the XDR space for quite some time now. What's new, what's happening? Tell us everything. Oh, goodness, yeah. So Cisco made an entry into the XDR space two years ago. Um, there was an initial version. We have thousands of customers adopted. And so in the last two years, we've taken a lot of feedback from customers and have built up on it. So what's new is that we added a lot of uh, endpoint a solution as an example. XDR by itself, meaning that we're ingesting network detection, in network information. We're also ingesting uh, endpoint information. We're also ingesting email solutions. Lots of data feed into it to help the security analysts. So what we've done is added a bunch of new capabilities based on what customers wanted to do, right? Uh, for example, customers wanted to add Microsoft Defender Endpoint as mm -hmm. their primary element on the, uh, on the EDR side. We added that customer wanted to add a CrowdStrike. We, we, we added that as well. So based on customer needs, we started adding more things to it. And it's really all about helping the SOC analysts solve a problem. Meaning that 
um, it's not about just looking at a bunch of logs, right? Everybody says, I can send a lot of logs to XDR, like a traditional SIM as an example, but that's not the case, right? If you send a lot of data to it, you get a lot of priority one alerts, you get a bunch of false positives. Yeah. Like, oh, these are a bunch of number one alerts. I don't really, it means nothing because yeah. it was a false alarm. But XDR works in a fine line, right? Balance of looking at false positive and false negative. We don't want to um, miss an alert. We call it false negative because something happened on your network, but your system didn't pick it up. That yeah. We want to avoid that. So we strike a good balance in the middle of looking at incidents, correlating it for the SOC analysts, and enriching the data to help them pinpoint what they need to work on at that time. So we don't want to miss anything. So that's yeah. been a lot of focus on that. And I think with customers having so many like alerting, monitoring tools, and then I think you mentioned about false positives, and I think that's one we, I think a lot of customers have, because when you have so many alerts coming in, you're like, oh, these are just the same, I want to ignore yep. it. Just like the thousand emails we have in, oh, our, yeah, email, yeah, uh, in, yeah. in our inbox. So um, I think I also wanted to talk about our um, acquisitions. Recently we have mm. talked about like Oat and like Splunk now. So customers are really interested to know how does that fit into our experience our strategy and mm. how would it benefit Cisco and also Splunk in the process? Oh, that's a great question, right? So our vision is about helping the SOC analysts, an example from the XDR perspective, helping um, the tier one analyst to become a tier two. You want to get everybody up to an expert level so they can detect and respond. So looking at Splunk, um, we announced the intent to acquire Splunk, so I can't really say exactly what we're building because it's all yeah. still in the works. But I'll tell you that in the last year and a half or so, we've already added integration with Splunk before we announced the intent to acquire. And we were already realizing value that any systems, endpoint systems that cannot have, that does not have an API, that can send telemetry to us or any XDR, yeah. they're really lost on their own. So they've been sending logs and data to Splunk. So Splunk, we saw that so, give us additional gateway visibility into so many more endpoint systems for us to do correlation, okay? So once we, uh, so in the last two, uh, year and a half, we built an integration in Splunk, and as I conduct my investigation, ingesting more Splunk signals, even before the acquisition, I was already seeing, wow, there's so much more data about these solutions that never integrated, that we couldn't integrate before. So it was a great acquisition, in my opinion. It's only gonna open up the world for, for yeah. us here. Now, from an ORT that you talked about, ORT is about identity protection, identity threat detection and response. Now, our customers deal with uh, Microsoft Intra or Azure, Ad, uh, Active Directory, they deal with other uh, single sign-on solutions, they have Duo, they have GitHub, so many different Bunch IDPs. Of, yeah. The problem is, how do you make sure that you have the right policy enforced across all your IDPs? And this is where uh, or it comes in, or it's going to help our customers maintain policy compliance. Like, how do you know that your multi-factor authentication requirement is enforced across all the IDPs? Mm -hmm. How do you know that a user or excessive account has been configured for a user, or we call it dormant account? We have lots of contractors that come into a customer's network. You set up accounts for them, but half of them never get used. Those are just more attack surfaces for our customers. So we want to make sure any dormant accounts or, or untouched guest accounts, those get eliminated, right? Yeah. We want to alert where the problems are yeah. and get rid of them before it really becomes a problem. So or is really adding a lot of policy compliance on top of uh, XDR. Yeah. Yep. And I think, again, you talk about dormant accounts, and I think that's a problem everywhere. You have a contractor come in, you give them an account for a month, and oh, yeah. that it's, it's there forever, and you still to look at their accounts, and yeah, yeah. they exist. Um, I think we're going to close with la one last question, okay. which I think a lot of customers want to hear the answer to, that how can, how can XDR help to respond to threats faster? Because obviously you need to act as soon as there's a threat. So how can XDR help customers respond to threats faster? Ooh, great question. So XDR is mentioned about all about elevating the level one analyst to a level two. We want to make them experts. So that means the automation, the tool has to be there. So instead of getting a bunch of false positives, we will correlate the events for the customer, looking at events and, and bubble up the critical one. This is the one you need to look at. So out of a thousand alerts, these are the top 10 you need to focus on. We will do auto enrichment. We, we build an auto uh, incident build event, we also enrich them to help them that, hey, look at email, 
look at the domain, look at umbrella. Mm. Uh, these are additional sources that relevant to the incident at the time to help the analysts make the investigation faster and be able to respond using workflows. And, and workflows is what we built into uh, XDR to help them if I need to kick somebody off the network, I need to quarantine them, I simply right click on yeah. that workflow and then move them. And, and again, orchestration and automation is key here. The workflow will configure what needs to be done across multi-platforms to make it happen, right? So the analyst is just right click. Yeah. It's all about making it easy. Yeah, and I think that's what Cisco does best. Listen to our customers, what they want, and then yeah, try to simplify and automate as much as we can. Well, with that, thank you so much, Jerry. I know we could like talk about this forever, but again, I think we're going to hand over to Richard in World of Solutions, where we are talking about reimagining applications. Over to you, Richard. Welcome back everybody, and uh, changing gears completely from looking at the traditional Cisco infrastructure uh, solution set to focus now on how Cisco is looking at reimagining applications. So I'm delighted to be joined by Dave Morgese from the mm -hmm. AppDynamics team. Dave, welcome thank, to the broadcast. Thank you, Richard. Good yeah, to be here. So, excellent. So Cisco has recently got into this sort of area, this full stack observability area. You know, kind of new to Cisco, yep. kind of new for our customers, I guess, who have being, being traditional Cisco um, clients. So perhaps we could start out with, you know, what is full stack observability? Mm -hmm. And really what problem is Cisco trying to solve yeah. with FSO? Yeah, so what what we find talking to our customers is there's, there's more and more of a trend. Uh, it's obviously migrating to the cloud. Cloud is a huge enabler for our customers uh, to be able to be responsive to their customers, to be agile, to actually, you know, really have an underpinning of technology where, custom, where they can really meet where the, their customers are at. Problem is that creates enormous complexity. The technology complexity in that, in that world uh, is just beyond human scale. So for our customers, they're asking us, look, how do I, I, I don't want to just ma manage in silos anymore. I can't just manage the application. I can't just manage my security. I can't just manage the network. I need to see everything. So that's where real full stack observability really comes into this is what's a full end to end view. I'm going to see where my transactions are going. What's the performance? If there's an issue, where do I see that? But perhaps more importantly, just beyond just visibility, it's actually we see this in what we refer to as business context. It's really important to understand hey, not just is my technology running, but is it actually serving my business? Like, is it actually doing what I need it to do? Yeah, you know? so business context, uh, probably a term not many of us yeah. have sort of heard of or used before. So perhaps you could sort of expand on that a bit and, and why that's important. Yeah, so look, it's critically important. It's where you have to start with this conversation. So when we talk about business context, it's, well, what's my end user trying to achieve? Uh, quite simply, my user is, on my website trying to buy a can of baked beans, right? Or trying to um, trade some shares, right? When they press that button on their app, that, that triggers a cascade of technology, right? That touches a hundred things, a thousand components in your environment. So everything that supports that one button click is what we refer to as business context. Now with that, if I place all of my technology in business context, I, I can do a number of things now. I can say, which problem do I solve first? Which problem is costing me money? Uh, where do I need to invest next, right? Uh, the, the business context is where we start this conversation. So it's a very important concept to understand. Glad you asked. Yeah. No problem. And so the other, the other bit here is really, you know, we've got a huge stand here this year focusing on full stack observability. I know there's some demos out the back in the rest of the world of solutions, six or seven as well. Sort of, can you maybe take us through what we're showing on the stand and, and what demos were? Absolutely. So, yes, this is by far the biggest presence we've had in Cisco, Cisco Live Melbourne. Um, this has been a huge catalyst year for us, really important year for full stack observability within, within Cisco. Probably the biggest element is we launched a, a new technology called Cisco Observability Platform. This was announced at Cisco Live um, in the US. Really important, uh, this underpins a lot of that full stack discussion that I was, I was talking about. Um, but this is a purpose-built, extensible 
observability platform, meaning that we can build all kinds of solutions on top of this data platform that is purpose-built for, uh, for observability. So the stands that you'll see, um, there's um, a, a range of solutions there, some of our partner solutions uh, that are built on top of this platform, um, as well as the deep application visibility that we'll get with, uh, uh, with AppDynamics. Okay, fantastic. So you mentioned partner integration, so I'm assuming that's some external partners that are doing work with us. So it sounds to me like potentially there's an opportunity for more of Cisco to integrate with AppDynamics to sort of build on that business context that you spoke about earlier. There, there is. So the, the Cisco observability platform, that is extensible. So that means our engineering teams can start building into this and start integrating their solutions and their technology, their IP, into this to include it into that end-to-end -end view. So yes, we've got partners building a lot of solutions. We've got partners building solutions, for example, for DevOps work, work um, loads, for SAP, um, uh, for things like um, uh, uh, you know carbon footprint, like how much my application, how much carbon footprint does that one application or that one transaction or my, that one product, how, what's the carbon footprint of that? But you are also pulling in across the Cisco portfolio. So uh, the, the security is a very important part of FSO. So for example, we're pulling in feeds from uh, you know, uh, assets like um, a Talos, so are there any known bad actors work, you know, having a look at your network and, and, um, and starting to scope it out? Kenna, Panoptica, all of these other types of um, uh, Cisco products. Um, we also have a use case that we talk about with digital experience management, which is, hey, how does uh, my, you know, the, my customer that's trying to buy those baked beans, right? What's the experience on the mobile device across the network with Thousand Eyes? So we're seeing is the public network, is that impacting my business? And then deeply into the, into the application with, with AppDynamics. So it really is pulling together across the portfolio. In fact, um, more, around half of the acquisitions that Cisco has made in the last three years all contribute to the, to the observability story. It is a huge pillar for Cisco. So Dave, thanks very much for taking us through what it really means to understand full stack observability. And um, you know, I'm sure there's a lot more that we can all learn about that important part of the, the new Cisco world. Yep. Great. Okay. All right, with that, let's go find Lindsay from Thousand Eyes and see how Thousand Eyes is working in this space as well. Well, here we are in the Thousand Eyes stand and I'm joined by Lindsay Carroll. Lindsay, welcome to the broadcast. Thanks for having me, Richard. So it's great to have you here. We've just been over speaking with Dave around uh, AppDynamics mm -hmm. and what AppDynamics are doing around reimagining applications. And so he suggested we come and talk to you about what's happening with Thousand Eyes Sounds and the good. work that you're doing around reimagining application and user experience. Okay. So perhaps the first question to kick off thing off with is, what do you think is top, top of mind for organizations when they think about their users and the experiences they get these days? Yeah, good question. I, I feel that over the last few years, what's really changed is that experience has moved from an optional or a nice to have component for organizations to a must have. So not only are we seeing with our customers that, uh, you know, down in the trenches, people are being mandated to deliver good user experience, mm -hmm. but it's also up at the CISO level, uh, the, the CXO level. It's, it's a part of people's remits, it's a part of their mandates, essentially to make sure that they deliver optimal user experience. And this includes applications that you know, that organization owns and controls, but it also includes applications that they consume as a service. Um, and this is really becoming quite a common thing with our, our customers these days. I completely agree. I mean, the advent of SaaS, especially during COVID, was, you know, it was a huge boon and many customers moved from their on-prem apps to taking services from the cloud. Yep. So perhaps you could outline some of the challenges that yep. you've seen people experience as part of that move to SaaS-based solutions. Yeah, it's a very long list. I would say that, uh, you know, back in the good old days when I, when I started my career, the, the enterprise boundary was very clearly defined. You know, generally a hub and spoke architecture, you had your data center, you had your branch sites, all your applications were within that data center. You owned and controlled the circuits and all the switches and routers. Now that Haystack is much larger, it's much more complicated, and often what you have is multiple haystacks. So when you're trying to find that needle and you're actually trying to identify what's the fault domain, what's causing this problem, that I think is one of the key challenges. 
for customers today. Not only do they have to contend with you know, black box environments or as a service models, but the connectivity from that user, whether the user be sitting at home or sitting in the branch, that's owned by many disparate parties. So you've got your service providers uh, for the customer, you've got your transit providers, there's things like DNS, there's, there's content delivery networks, there's cloud, and then there's interconnectivity through microservices and APIs. And all of those different factors can affect that user experience. So really that's a key challenge for customers today and really they need a new breed uh, of, of solution to be able to identify and get that end-to-end -end picture. Yeah, so you spoke a little bit about the, that fluidity of the boundaries of the enterprise, especially as we spoke about the advent of SaaS. Yep. So, and, I, and I'm sure that brings risk and uncertainty as part of that. So are there any things that we can recommend around managing that risk that, that this fluidity of the boundary brings uh, as part of looking at this? Yeah, ab absolutely. I think that it goes without saying all of these as a service solutions and you know the proliferation of cloud and all those things, it, it delivers customers a myriad of benefits. There's no doubt about that. But to actually mitigate and handle the risk that that introduces, I think some key things to think about are to make sure that you have uh, you know observability or a monitoring solution that provides a 24 by 7 perspective. So. It's an active solution. It gives you an understanding of what's your baseline or basically what's your normal. Mm -hmm. So that will allow you to mitigate the risk of change in the environment. It allows you to identify intermittent or difficult to catch issues. Um, and it also allows you to understand what is the goal that we're trying to achieve. You know, what, what is good user experience within the context of our organization? Then some other things to consider is that you really need a uh, multi-vendor solution to deal with that end-to-end -end picture because there's so many different parties across that space. Um, a synthetic solution will also give you the ability to look outside of aspects or uh, you know um, aspects that you don't own and control, and then it will help you identify really when you've got a problem, which party within this complicated mess of different people um, is is actually causing the issue. Yeah, so I think what I've taken away with sort of the what it is, how it is, some of the complications there. Yep. You don't happen to have a demo that we could look at just to sort of put all this together and, yes, and give people a really actually, good view. Yes, I do actually, now that you mention it. How so that works. Fantastic. Let's get into that. All right. So in this example here, we're actually looking at connectivity of users sitting within a branch connecting through to SharePoint. And what we really need to be able to understand is what is the user seeing when they're using the application? And are they able to do their day-to-day -day activities as normal? So you can see here, we can confirm the user can authenticate. We're able to confirm that they can browse uh, applications with the, uh, pages within the application. And then we're also able to understand as we work our way down the tech stack, what about other elements like the web server response for that application, even if it's on a web server that we own? Then, obviously, what's key to that is understanding what the network, how the network is performing. So we'll pick one of those branches. Let's look at Auckland in New Zealand. We see that you know, traffic passes through that service provider, goes through this transit network, and then it arrives in Microsoft's data center in Auckland over here. So at this point, this is, we've got a really clear idea of what, it, what is our normal, what is our baseline. Then what we can see is that at a certain point, that baseline is deviated from. Uh, it's starting to time out. And what we can see is that even though the user can authenticate whilst it takes twice the amount of time, what they're actually seeing within the application is this. They just get a white screen. The application is just hanging. So the next thing to understand is what's actually causing that problem. So we can start to build and get a couple of clues by looking at the waterfall metrics. One of the things is we're seeing that receive time or time to last by is starting to spike. And then if we work our way down into the network again, what we can look at is that previously our normal was basically sub millisecond latencies, which is what we would expect. Then we see it spiking over here. So if we focus on that particular branch again, what we'll see is that network path looks very different to what we saw before. So same ISP, 
same transit. But this time, instead of coming into the provider's network in Auckland, it's actually being attracted across to Sydney in Australia. Then it goes through uh, MPLS link and it actually comes out over here in Georgia. Um, and we see that 200 milliseconds of response time being introduced. So in this particular issue, even though the application is technically available, we know that the users are experiencing poor or having a poor experience and we're able to build that end-to-end -end picture and then identify what's actually causing the problem. This data can then be shared with that provider so everybody's looking at the same view um, and we have an understanding from the application down into the network um, of that particular issue. Thank you, Lindsay. No worries. That's been, that's been excellent. Thank you so much. Cheers. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the uh, reimagining application section and also the end for today. So please join us tomorrow when we delve deeply into hybrid work and what's happening around the workplace. Until then, enjoy your evening. Welcome back to the studio. I think I've learnt so much today. So much. I mean, let's go. <laughs> I knew we were just talking <laughs> about the fact that we needed to put more of the theme into the day. And I have to say, our engineers have definitely taken that theme all the way. You know, the one thing that I really love about the world of solutions is actually the demonstrations. Because I'm, I'm more of a, you know, see, not tell kind of person. Absolutely. These, uh, these demos and these little, like, demo labs that they're running, and uh, it's just super helpful. And, uh, yeah, exactly what we need. Yeah, and in particular, that Thousand Eyes demonstration. I think those is one of the things where you try to explain it at a concept level, but as soon as you see what the actual dashboard looks like, and this is for a lot of my customers as well, and actually Lindsay's been a part of um, presenting those demos in my day-to-day, -day, um, you actually get to see, you know, that particular track of where the um, activity is going, and it just, something clicks. It's simple. It simplifies it. It just makes it so simple, and the, I think the, the messaging around the, the time-saving component of when they can actually find issue to resolution is just remarkable. Yeah, and I, I definitely think we have some celebrities in there as well, like a couple of our engineers based in um, the Sydney office had videos. And I have to say, they look really comfortable on camera, so I think it's, you know, everyone's got a two-time job. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be up next, yeah, that's it. <laughs> no, but are there any particular... Um, particular products that you were looking forward to. If, uh, we've got an entire other day tomorrow, so there must be something on your uh, uh, mind. I think, for me, I'm just hearing cons everyone I'm speaking to, all my customers here today, coming back out saying, oh, world of solutions, I s I've seen this, world of solutions, we're going to, I just, it, I do want to get in there and I can't wait to see it. I'm also hearing about some, all this merch going around that everyone's getting and uh, I'd love to get my hands on some of that as well. But yeah. uh, <laughs> no, I think the, the messaging for me, uh, it's, Security is big for me at the moment, and that's that's really where a lot of our the conversations have been going. And, and cybersecurity in general is something that I can't wait to hear more about. Yeah, no, absolutely. And for me, it's still around the networking piece as well. And actually, we've got Shika who will be interviewing Mark, and they'll be talking about wireless, wireless technology. So rather than us talking about it, let's hear from Shika and Mark. Thank you, Dave and M and Richard from earlier. So yes, uh, from one architect to the other, I am with Mark, who is a uh, principal wireless architect in Cisco, and he joined Cisco with the Radiata uh, acquisition back in 2001, which was the first Australian startup to, to develop 802.11a chipsets. So I have Mark here with me. Welcome, Mark. Hi there, great to be here. Yeah, welcome. So I think we'll just right, get right into it. So there's been a lot of excitement mm. around Wi-Fi 6E yeah. and, um, and the expansion of, uh, expansion of Wi-Fi into 6 gigahertz. Yeah. What can you tell us about that? Uh, so it is really exciting, and you know, particularly for me, coming from Radiata, 802.11a was all about Wi-Fi moving into the 5 gigahertz band. Here we are now 20 years later, and we're finally getting brand new spectrum. Uh, 6 gigahertz is a potential for up to 1,200 megahertz of available spectrum there. Uh, here in our part of the world, uh, South Korea was actually the first uh, country to open up the band, third in the world after the US and the UK. Uh, and then things kind of slowed down because of COVID. Uh, but then in January last year, uh, things wrapped up really quickly. So we had uh, Malaysia, followed by Australia, Japan, uh, Hong Kong, uh, and New Zealand. Uh, and then this year, we've had uh, Thailand, Singapore, and Taiwan. Now, all of these countries after South Korea, they basically opened up, a, we're doing a two-phase approach. So they've opened up the bottom 500 megahertz, 
uh, which is going to limit us a little bit in terms of the, the channels that we can uh, make use of. But the good news is uh, the ACMA, that's the regulator here in Australia, uh, they've already announced that next year they're going to look at extending that uh, to the upper uh, 700. Uh, and Japan has also started looking at it already as well. Um, and I think what you mentioned earlier, for, uh, so you were working when the mm. Wi-Fi in, went, went into the five gigahertz yep. and like six gigahertz now, that must have been an incredible journey, experiencing all of the changes. Yep. So thanks for that. But, so Cisco has released new uh, mm. Wi-Fi 6E access point yes. recently. So what can you tell us about them? Uh, so we've now actually pretty much rounded out our entire Wi-Fi 6E portfolio. Um, but two of the new uh, APs coming out are pretty exciting. So uh, the first one is a variant of uh, one of the APs that we've already had, the Catalyst 9166. This is the 9166D, and, and the D is for directional. Uh, and the reason this is important um, is the 6 gig band hasn't been lying empty, right? There's been incumbents in there. And uh, here in Australia, that's typically microwave and satellite links. So what the regulators are focused on is how do we allow Wi-Fi and other wireless technologies to use the band without impacting those incumbents. And so one of the rules is what we call low power indoor. So the idea is you can only use the access point indoor and you have to have integrated antennas. You can't have external antennas. Now if we look at you know, where we are here in the convention center, really high ceilings, um, I typically would use external antennas to provide coverage in this area. Uh, so that's why the new model of the 9166 is so important, because it has a directional antenna allowing me to cover these more complex environments while still meeting the restrictions of low power uh, indoor. Now the second AP that we uh, just announced here this week at Cisco Live is the 9163E. So this is our first outdoor uh, access point with external antennas. Now I just told you you can't use that. So the next device class is what we call standard power. Okay? And that's going to require this new capability called AFC, or Automated Frequency Coordination. Now, in the U.S., the FCC has started trialing this already, mm -hmm. uh, and we expect them to actually go live with standard power sometime next year. So that's why we're now releasing uh, these APs that we're going to be able to take advantage of that. We can still use it here in Australia and other regions, you just won't be able to take advantage of the 6 gig radio. Mm -hmm. Now again, the ACMA here in Australia in the five-year spectrum outlook has indicated they will also look at bringing AFC out and what it would take uh, sometime next year. So hopefully, you know, in Australia, we're going to get access both to the, the full 1200 megahertz and have access to standard power as well. Yeah. I think that sounds incredible. So there's like a lot coming in the Wi-Fi space as well, and I, I'm sure a lot of our customers are getting excited <laughs> as you speak. So a bit early, but we're hearing things about Wi-Fi 7, yeah. and I, again, as I said, it's a bit early, but do we know what's coming and yeah. what's new in that space? So, uh, so my number one message on Wi-Fi 7 is, despite what we keep hearing and seeing, and if you go down to JB Hi-Fi and you look at what you can buy, uh, at the end of the day, Wi-Fi 7 does not exist yet. And the reason I say that is because Wi-Fi 7 is going to be defined by the Wi-Fi Alliance interoperability testbed. And that testbed doesn't exist yet. We're not expecting it until the first half of next year sometime. Now, Wi-Fi 7 is also going to be based on the next generation IEEE 802.11BE standard. Mm -hmm. That's not going to ratify until the tail end of next year. So, you know, from a Cisco perspective, when we look at bringing out enterprise-grade products, these are the things that, we, that we're looking at, right? We also want to look at the chipsets, the maturity, the software, because we need to bring out an enterprise-grade uh, product. Now, kind of my evidence for this is if we look at some of the top-end consumer products that have been released, like we just got the new uh, iPhone 15 Pro, some of the new iPad Pros, uh, the new MacBook Pros, Microsoft has their Surface Pro, everyone's using the word Pro. <laughs> um, the Meta Quest Pro is the new VR uh, headset, the Vision Pro from, from Apple. All of those are Wi-Fi 6E devices. They're not Wi-Fi 7. Uh, so from a high-end device perspective, everyone is still focused on 6E. Now, if I look at what's coming with Wi-Fi 7, a lot of the benefits are actually based on the fact that we're now having access to 6 gigahertz, things like multi-link operation. And so the point here, what I really want people to take away is 
because Wi-Fi 6E provides access to that 6 gig radio, what that basically means is uh, the customers have confidence that if they go with the Catalyst 9160 series access points today with support for Wi-Fi 6E, access to that 6 gig radio, they're basically creating a network that's going to be ready for those Wi-Fi 7 devices you know, when they start coming out next year. Yep, and I think uh, probably we'll be here in a few more years. We'll be interviewing mm. you, and maybe <laughs> at that time you'll, you'll have more about Wi-Fi next 7. Next year I'm going to tell you all Everything. the reasons why so, everyone needs so Wi-Fi 7. So you need to 7. tune in next year as well. <laughs> so we're both going to be here doing this interview again. Um, so another thing which everyone's been talking mm. about today and in yeah. the industry and our customers, not just in terms of wireless, but mm. generically in terms of yeah. IT is artificial intelligence, yeah. machine learning. So. Is there, like, can you touch on how that can be incorporated into the wireless technology yeah. and in our products? So, um, so I just finished talking about, you know, how we're extending Wi-Fi into the six gig band, 1200 megahertz. Uh, and so obviously that's going to create challenges in terms of how am I going to manage this RF environment, now 2.4, 5, and now 6. Uh, so Cisco pioneered what we call radio resource management, automating that RF management. In fact, it was very early days of artificial intelligence, algorithms that could understand the environment and optimize things like channels and transmit power. Uh, we were always kind of limited, though, because we're doing that on our wireless LAN controller, where I'm limited by CPU, memory, and storage. And so over the last few years, what we've started doing is looking at how the, the power of the cloud allows us to expand that, because the cloud is giving me effectively unlimited CPU, memory, and storage. The other thing is, with my controller environment, I'm limited to visibility of my actual wireless network alone. With the cloud, I have access now to every Cisco wireless network. So what that's allowing us to do is now I can create my artificial intelligence algorithms, use machine learning from all this information in my data lake of all that visibility of those networks to tune those AI algorithms. And so this is what we call AI-enhanced radio resource management. And so this is now giving us much better ability to really zero in and understand how do we optimize the network I, particularly as I now, as I said, extend it into the six gig band. Yep, yep. And I think, uh, again, AI has been thrown out a yep. lot. And I, I love it how, because every interview I had have, has had something to mention about yep. AI. And I love how Cisco incorporates that in sort of every part of yep. the portfolio and the products that we put out there. Um, let's move on to secure networking. Mm -hmm. So how can wireless play a part yeah. in the secure networking yep. space? Um, so here I'm going to give a plug for my session uh, tomorrow afternoon here at Cisco Live Melbourne. Uh, my whole focus is going to be on, uh, on wireless security. And one of the things that we'll talk about is uh, the implications now of Wi-Fi 6E uh, and security. So mm -hmm. Wi-Fi 6E is based on the Wi-Fi 6 standard. Uh, and what the, uh, what the Wi-Fi Alliance did as part of the Wi-Fi 6 certification is they mandated that we also have to do uh, WPA3, which is the brand new wireless security standard. So if mm -hmm. I have Wi-Fi 6, I must have uh, WPA3. Now, Wi-Fi 6E, 6 gigahertz, Wi-Fi starts with Wi-Fi 6 in the 6 gig band, which means it starts with WPA3. There's no legacy. Yeah. Uh, and so there's going to be implications of that you know, in terms of how I'm going to have my network work and the security work, allowing me to move between 6 gig and 5 gig and even 2.4. Yeah. That's been incredible. That's been so much information. And I'm sure a lot of our wireless engineers out there have loved this conversation. <laughs> but thank you so much, thank Mark. Thank you. And uh, over to you, Em. Uh, what do we have next? Thank you so much, Shaker and Mark. Before we go into our next piece, I do have to say I'm sending that particular interview to pretty much all of my customers, especially around that Wi-Fi 6 piece. I'm sure they're really, really excited to see that we actually have just released the new antenna, uh, sorry, the new IP with antennas for outdoors. A lot of my customers have a very good use case for that in particular. But we'll keep an eye out for Wi-Fi 7. Is there any commentary from that, Dave? I know. No, I think I think I think it's Wi-Fi seven. Let's go. Um, <laughs> maybe uh, avoiding the use of overuse of uh, let's go. But I think I'm I'm actually looking forward to tuning into the uh, yeah to tuning into the session later on uh, or tomorrow around the wireless security piece as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be that's what's going to resonate really well um, my customers. So that's what I'll be tuning in for. But I think the uh, the, the piece around uh, the directional antennas as well is quite a, is quite useful in a lot of my customers' unique environments. So. 
And I that think, piece was a, I tuned in nicely and I will be sending that on as well. Yeah. yeah, I think it was only about three months into my role when I realised all of the letters that the, each of our APs all had a meaning. So D means that it's directional and I think that, <laughs> you know, that's something that you think about um, that's, you know, very simple but completely goes over your head sometimes as well. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of skews and uh, different pieces that we need to remember here. So yeah. no, I, I'll give you a pass on that, that's fine. Yeah. No, so we're actually um, coming towards the end of our day, but we've had so many great speakers and so many great content. Um, if you've just joined us for the first time or if there's something that you'd like to revisit, um, where would we go and see that, Dave? You can head to ciscolive.com slash APJC. Um, if you want to catch up on anything, uh, ciscolive.com uh, slash on demand will be all the on demand uh, videos and innovation talks will be available from the 20th of December. Yeah, no, it's, it's great because I think I'll be definitely going to that on demand website as well. In particular, I think having that deep, in depth discussion around the product that's what really excited me about getting into the technology space in the, in the first place. It's um, seeing what, you know, uh, how engineers talk, all the, the feeds and speeds is not something. Not necessarily something that I've always been, you know, natural to me, but <laughs> I've got my note paper and I've got my pen and I'm ready to, to go into it. Well, you can always uh, you can always check out on our socials as well. Um, hashtag uh, Cisco uh, Cisco Live Quick Bites. Um, so for those quick six, uh, sixty seconds uh, sn uh, snippets around built by our Cisco engineers um, for engineers on how to best use our technologies. Yeah, no, no, it's great, and it's kind of like a. I would, I would, I would consider it a mini world of solutions, almost. For those, uh, if you're sitting on the train, flicking through something, it's a great way to replace uh, potentially reels or just surfing the internet. <laughs> <laughs> you can learn something at the same time. Yeah. So I know we're, um, we've got lots of other interviews to come up in the future as well. But who are you most excited for for coming up into tomorrow? So tomorrow I've got uh, a couple of a couple of good interviews. So I've got our um, actual sis. Uh, Eilina, our um, Cisco, our, our head of Cisco IT, so it's going to be um, a super exciting talk for me. And also from an engineering standpoint, I have uh, Rob DiNicolo as well, who will be joining me to talk about, uh, specifically to our yeah, director of engineering, to talk about more specifically to our engineers. Yeah. yeah, no, that's great. And I think we've got actually a pretty packed day for engineers tomorrow as well. I'm talking to Tim, and um, he's a very esteemed principal engineer here at Cisco. So I'm really excited to pick his brains, and I've got to look up the glossary for all of the terms in particular as well. So. Get, the, uh, get the acronym bot working and uh, yeah, pick up all the, all the acronyms to, to use. Yeah, no, I think that's something that we struggle with internally sometimes is the fact that, you know, especially everything seems to be shortened. You've got AP shortened, but we've got our own Cisco language internally. So, you know, using maybe that's something a new AI thing should do as well. Uh, well, we do you. have a particular bot, but... Maybe we can extend that further so we're all speaking the same language. And I'm so glad you used AI again. There's just another, <laughs> another dollar in my jar, so thank you for that. I really think we should actually get a physical jar <laughs> yeah, for this. I think we need it. Or, or we need one of those charts where you can actually colour in all the yeah. way up, like, you know, the temperature charts yeah, in particular. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, so this might be a good opportunity as well to, to get comfortable, make sure that your water bottle's refilled. I've definitely been using my sustainable water bottle. And I think the best part, and I don't know if the cameras can pick this up, is that they actually all have our names on them, or at least our initials, and mine are EW, so I've not included that for reasons when you say out loud. But um, I think, Dave, you've got yours as well. Yes, I've got, uh, I've got uh, my bottle, got my initials on it as well, so that way could differ differentiate over between our bottles so we don't get confused, but uh, it's, it, was a great little, it was a great little touch that they uh, put on this year. Yeah. yeah, so while we go and fill up our bottles and um, you make sure that you have something to drink so that you stay hydrated, we'll just cut over to a commercial break now. スタートアップ系シスコの로망이죠 여러 개발자가 동시에 테스트를 하다 보니 네트워크의 과부하가 걸리거나 인터넷이 끊기는 일이 잦았습니다. 모든 스타트업이 그렇겠지만 저희 또한 고성능 네트워크 장비와 전문 인력을 갖추기가 어려웠습니다. 
하지만 메가존 클라우드를 통해 시스코 머라키 기반의 네트워크 구독 서비스 핏을 알게 되고 고민 없이 바로 구독을 신청했습니다. 초기 투자 비용 없이 시스코의 풀스택 네트워크 서비스를 갖출 수 있으니까 일석이조죠. 핏을 구독하면서 무선 서비스 장애로부터 완전히 해방됐습니다. 많은 디바이스가 동시에 접속하고 개발 테스트를 해도 전혀 문제없이 진행 가능했습니다. 어디서나 사용자 트래픽과 무선 상태를 상시 점검할 수 있도록 기능이 제공되고 VPN 설정도 쉽게 할수 있도록 제공이 됐습니다. 특히 핏 코디네이터를 통해 전문 네트워크 인력 없이도 24시간 내내 최상위 네트워크 상태로 사용될 수 있도록 관리받는 것도 장점이었습니다. 네트워크 환경이 안정되면서 그 어느 때보다 수월하게 협업하고 테스트를 빠르게 수용하면서 서비스 출시 속도까지 단축할 수 있게 되었는데요. 시장 경쟁력은 물론 비즈니스 수익까지 향상이 됐습니다. 이 모든 것이 시스코 머라키를 통해 가능했습니다. 만약 네트워크 문제와 관리 서비스까지 한 번에 해결하고 싶다면 시스코 머라키 기반의 네트워크 구독 서비스 핏을 추천합니다. 파이터즈는 <목소리도> The fighters join forces with Cisco to create an elevated experience for the fans, staff, and stadium partners. But the raving fans will never know all that's being done for them behind the scenes at Escon Field, including data traffic coming from all over the baseball stadium, supporting requests from broadcasting, guest Wi-Fi connections, payment transactions, signage, and network-connected digital touch points. Cisco provides the network infrastructure and secure firewall to provide the visibility and context needed to make quick and decisive actions and protect the fans and the game. If it's connected, it's protected. Cisco. Now that I've had a drink from my water bottle, I can truly say, what a day. What a day. Yeah, what a day. Yeah. So much content. I'm just, I feel so, I don't know, like I'm oozing with like information and I'm like, I want to talk to my customers and just take all that in. Yeah, and no, I have to say, what, what are your highlights from the day? I think we, it feels like we've had about three or four days in one. So I to know. pick one thing will be really difficult. But oh. Dave, what do you reckon that thing is? My, my one thing was my interview uh, with uh, Jason, uh, Jason Warfield, talking about uh, Thousand Eyes and the, uh, the capabilities of that, um, that platform and mapping the internet and solving, solving customers' uh, issues and time to resolution. That's, uh, that's probably the key for me. So that was, that was a great interview and probably one of my key highlights that I'll take with me and be using utilizing a lot of uh, what was said in that to uh, uh, pass over to my customers, as well as might get a sneaky T-shirt out of it as well. So. Yeah, I was about to say, we, we shouldn't even limit to one thing. We, can, we could talk about two or three, because, you know, we've got the interviews as one thing, but yeah. we've actually had all of these activities throughout the day and then all of these iTalks as well. Yeah. What do you think are your highlights, Shika? Uh, again, as you said, that there's been so many, and especially the iTalk from Denise, I think that stood out. Again, dollar into the sustainability <laughs> word job, but um, her talk was incredible, and I'm sure our customers took a lot out of that, and how Cisco is dedicated to let our customers reach their net zero goals. Um, and I think for me, because I, ha I also had like three interviews today, and last two were with like the architects, one security and one uh, wireless. So a lot of information coming out of those, and obviously, like even though I'm a collab engineer, but seeing how much we're advancing in other fields and other technologies is just incredible and just passion that these architects and our engineers have is just it's just uh, contagious and you I just got so excited even though that was last day last interview for the day but yeah it was amazing what about you what were your highlights oh it's Again, I think so much. <laughs> it's, it's so much. Um, you know, it, I would be have to say it's definitely my interviews, Denise and Adam in particular, and I can't forget about Dave West, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that, yeah, no, yeah. No, no, no. I think it would be upset if I didn't mention. But it's, it's I have to say they're all they're all on par, but all about different things. Yeah. Um, you know, for Denise, uh, the amount of um, progress she's made 
between last year when we had that interview and then this year, the fact that sustainability is such a key pillar of what we're doing as a company. Um, and we're actually using that AI capability. And I think I'm really excited to see how, you know, that hybrid work experience is actually going to be helping the environment how we're using office spaces and starting to track the energy efficiency of, of our technology, of our buildings. Um, I think we've got so much to go there. And for me, the future of what that holds is the most exciting part. I think and it's I been, uh, it, this whole experience of what, we, what we're doing now, being selected on here, is what's been fantastic as well. Yeah. Having this opportunity to speak to, as you say, you got to speak to Dave West, I got to speak to Jackie G. Yeah. It's yeah. really, really cool to hear from these She's amazing. really high-profile people within, uh, within Cisco. And I know we have some... More, sp more guests that we'll speak to tomorrow. But I think that, in terms of what it was most exciting, it's probably been, that's been summed up the day. Yeah. It's been, the, the, what we've had access to is incredible. Yeah, and I think the keynote as well, there was so much to take out, especially the security AI assistant. That oh. was something new. I think that was because that was at the start of the day. We we're, were probably like, it just it's one of the most important ones that came out of the keynote. And I went G to explain and did that demo, thanks to the demo gods, it worked. But that was incredible. and that, I think a lot of our customers who are listening in remotely and who were there in the keynote, the keynote was packed. There were people outside. It was full. It was amazing. It was just, I think, the keynote from, and then when Jackie G spoke at the keynote as well about customer experience, I think that was another important one. There was so much, and I'm just so excited for tomorrow. I can't believe the whole day is over. Oh. Yeah, well, it's not necessarily over yet. I think um, even after we'll go home tonight, I th they're releasing the progress report. Oh, yes. um, and, you know, G2 said in the keynote that we've positively impacted one billion people with Cisco. And so to see actually, you know, what those particular metrics are, mm. how we've contributed back to communities, how we've contributed back to the environment is something that I really want to dive head first into and something that I'm really proud to talk about because, you know, it's not only the technology piece that we talk about with our customers, you know, our customers are actually working within their organization to make sure that they're also contributing back to their community and their environment. And if we can partner with them on, you know, a more strategic level, then I think that's something that's fantastic. So I'll be definitely reading through that uh, quick as yeah. a book. Trying it, to it, it makes you really proud to be working at a company like this that's, uh, to, when you hear things like that, one billion people impact. It's, in, it's one billion. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, another highlight right here, Kevin, Kevin the Koala, Kevin, Kevin the Koala. <laughs> our fourth host right here. He's back. He's just stuck with me throughout the interviews, and I think he's all very engineered up by now. But yeah, um, again, the charity partnership that we have done, and I think, again, as you said, it's just it makes us feel proud to be partnering with such big organizations, not only our customers, but the impact that we're making in the community, not just to our customers and up through our products, but also like our messaging. And that's why I love Cisco. Like we have 10 days time to give every year. That just kind of shows how much Cisco is invested in to the community and giving back. And I think I love that. And I'm inc incredibly proud to be working here. Yeah, some of my team actually partner with the uh, customers that they work with to organize those give back days. So not only are we looking at their technology strategy, we actually bring the entire team on board and go out to site and help out. So there's been some really great initiatives that way. So I encourage, you know, if you're working with Cisco to have a chat about, you know, where we can partner in more ways than just your technology space because, you know, we've got a lot of love to give yes. and I think that's somewhere that we can actually help out with. Yeah. So we're wrapping up towards the end of the day and but before we go, I want to hear what are you most excited for to tomorrow? What should we be keeping an eye out for? Shika, maybe you want to start. Uh, come back. We're excited to have you back tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. But I'm really excited about the Women of Cisco event that's happening tomorrow and the Pride event. So really, really excited for that, Dave. Yeah, uh, excited for my interviews, but excited to get back and uh, have a look at the World of Solutions, actually, uh, again. So uh, hearing everything that goes on in there is just incredible. I want to get back in there, immerse myself in the experience. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. So stay on to watch the highlight reel, but we'll see you all tomorrow. Make sure you have a good rest. And in particular, so three, two, one. Let's, let's go! go! Good night and see you tomorrow.